I'd like to call to order this meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors for Thursday, September 10th, 2020. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll and establish a quorum? Yes. Good morning. Supervisors Frost? Here. Kennedy? Here. Natoli? Here. Peters? Here. Cerna? Here. And you have a quorum. Thank you. This meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel, on the Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T U-verse cable systems. The meeting is closed captioned and is webcast at sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will be repeated Sunday, September 13th at 6 p.m. on Channel 14. This meeting is also broadcast live on KUBU Radio on 96.5 FM, and a DVD copy is available for checkout from any local library branch. Thank you. If you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, another announcement here. <clears throat> in compliance with the directives of the County, State, and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, this meeting is live stream and closed to the public. Temporary procedures are subject to change pursuant to guidelines related to social distancing and minimizing person-to-person -person contact. Of course, we do welcome verbal comment by phone. Uh, to make a verbal comment on any item on the agenda or an off-agenda item, uh, you can dial 916-875. 2500 and follow the prompts to be placed in queue for a specific agenda item or off agenda matter. Please refer to the agenda and or watch the meeting to follow along to determine when is the best time to call and to be placed in queue to make your public comment. You may be on hold for up to an extended period of time and your patience is greatly appreciated. When I open public comment for a specific ag agenda item or an off agenda matter, the clerk staff will begin transferring you into the meeting. Each agenda item queue will remain open until the public comment period is closed for that specific item. Again, we thank you for your patience. In addition to verbal comments, we also welcome, of course, written comments. You can uh, submit those by email at boardclerk at sacccounty.net. That's sacccounty, S-A-C-C-O-U-N-T-Y. Your comment will be routed to the board and filed in the record. And then a little bit uh, further housekeeping. Uh, so of course, uh, we concluded uh, yesterday's last evening's uh, hearing at midnight on the budget after taking uh, considerable public comment. I think we probably had, what, probably close to 120 folks that called? I'm guessing. Somewhere around that 100 number, yes. So um, just I coordinated briefly with uh, our CEO this morning before the meeting. Just uh, in all fairness to staff to give them uh, all the time that they uh, need to respond to some of the questions and suggestions that were made by board members uh, late last night. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, take up the IHSS uh, budget item this morning as well as the CIP before we return back to our uh, uh, deliberations on the budget. So this morning we will start with uh, IHSS. And again, as a reminder, we did close the public hearing on the budget uh, last night. So of course, uh, people are welcome to uh, call in relative to the uh, two uh, agenda items we have today, um, as well as off agenda matters. So we will begin with IHSS. Item, uh, so we're starting with your um, IHSS. So you are acting as the in-home supportive services public authority. Approve the in-home supportive services public authority fiscal year 2020-21 revised recommended budget. Good morning. Good morning. Hey. Uh, my name is John Kozitsa. I'm the executive director for the Sacramento County In-Home Supportive Services Public Authority. And I'm here this morning to um, present for your approval the fiscal year 2021 um, budget in the amount of $2,730,249 um, as it's included on your attachment A on the packet. Um, it's worthy to note that this budget is fully funded by the state and federal funds, so there is no local um, funding needed. Um, absent any questions that you have, I would like to request that your board adopt the recommended budget as it's presented on attachment A. Um, and if there are any questions? Okay, very good. Thank you. Supervisor Antoli? <coughs> yeah, good morning, John. Good morning. <coughs> just, 
<coughs> excuse me, um, when we adopt this budget, this is for the uh, the authority uh, that provides obviously the training and um, in some of the uh, screening classifications for those folks that are qualified providers. But I just <coughs> thought it'd be helpful to note that actually with the provider payments then, what, what's what's the total? Do, do we have like a 20 or $30 million budget then for provider payments, which is separate from the authority's budget? Um, Correct, the provider payments are um, within the DCFAS budget. Right. Um, and they're not included in this particular. Right, and, and do you know what the number is? Um, off the top of my head, I want to say it's hovering around 40 million, and I believe it's reimbursed by the the state and or federal. Well, not all of it. We have a local match, and that is my correct. Other question. Correct. What is the what's the local match on that? We're looking at that. We'll look it up. Because I, you know, obviously the number of providers obviously has grown. I think obviously it reflects some of the. Um, you know, aging uh, elements in our community, but also I think keeping people at a lower level of care within their home, remaining independent with yep. folks that can provide uh, both family members as well as others. Supervisor, we're working to get that number for you right now. Okay, and, and that is a general fund contribution, is it not? The that, our that is correct. We have exceeded the MOE for the last five, six years, and number escapes me, but we'll find the number. It's okay. in the budget. We budgeted that number. No, I, I know you have. I just, again, I just wanted to get kind of the reflection. If we talk about this item, we, we're going to pass on it. We pass on it very quickly most years and will now. I just wanted to point out that there's a, you know, a component, companion component to this that is actually the provider payments in which we participate significantly for those dollars. So, okay, that's all I comment. Thanks. Okay. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone signed up to uh, speak on this? No, we don't. Okay. Any other questions by board members? Supervisor Peters? Oh, no, I'll turn my microphone on to okay. make the motion to approve the budget as presented. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Yeah. Just waiting on an answer here for Supervisor and Tony. Go. go ahead. So with regard to the IHS provider payments budget, which is in the county's uh, general fund, total appropriations uh, for this fiscal year will be 121 million 322 thousand. It's funded with 67 million dollars in realignment revenue. Uh, and uh, this year uh, we were able to not use net county costs because we use realignment revenue and the rest is um, uh, uh, federal or state funds. So, so there's a significant amount of money every month. You know, basically, we, we, we're the payroll agent for uh, all the providers. Is that correct? That's, that's correct. A, and that's now 121 million dollars annually. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. We have a motion by Supervisor Peters, a second by Supervisor Frost. Please vote. Unanimous vote. All right. Very good. Okay, so uh, for item two, you're acting as the Board of Supervisors, and this is for your fiscal year 2020-21 five-year capital improvement plan adoption. Good morning, Chair Serna and members of the Board. My name is Colin Bettis and I am the County Debt Officer. The item before you is the revised 2021 Capital Improvement Plan. The CIP includes revisions primarily to take into consideration project funding that shifted from the last fiscal year to the current fiscal year for project spending that was originally projected to be completed by the end of fiscal year 1920. The presentation of the numbers will compare the fiscal year 2021 CIP that was presented in April as a projected CIP that was then submitted to the Planning Commission for review. The Planning Commission has found that the projects are consistent with the general plan and now we are asking you to approve the CIP as revised. Um, section by section I'll go through a little bit. The airports has an overall decrease of 20.8 20 million due to projects being, primarily due to projects being deferred to future years. County Buildings and Capital Construction has an increase of 26.6 million, um, primarily due to 
uh, reprogramming of funding to various projects that did not get completed in the 1920 year, and an additional seven new projects that totaled $2.9 million. For the libraries, there is a $2.6 million increase, again, primarily due to reprogramming of funds for various projects that did not get completed in the prior fiscal year. This year, new to the CIP book, we've added a section for the Mather Community Campus. Um, there are currently no projects listed under this section um, at this time, but upon completion of the facilities condition assessment, projects will be identified for future inclusion, and that may come in uh, either um, the uh, CIP amendments throughout the year or in the next fiscal year CIP book. Um, for the next section, we have regional parks. This one is a $761,000 increase, primarily due to, due to receiving increase of funds um, through the Gulf Fund grants and Measure A. Transportation is a decrease of $12.5 million, uh, primarily due to reprogramming of funding for various projects that are deferred to later years. Waste management and recycling, a decrease of 441000 primarily due to deferring projects. Um, water resources and drainage, an increase of 504000 again, primarily due to reprogramming of funds for various projects that were not completed in the prior fiscal year. Water resources and water supply, uh, uh, an increase of $4.7 million due to reprogramming of various funding for projects that did not get completed in the prior fiscal year. Um, the recommendations are to accept the Planning Commission's resolution of finding that the CIP is consistent with the general plan and adopt the fiscal year 2020-21 five-year CIP. Department directors and representatives are here to answer any questions for uh, related to any specific projects if you have them. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, any questions by members of the board? Supervisor Tully. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A column maybe for you, I do have some specific in the categories. The, I want to first say thank you at least to have a page that says Mather Community Campus in it. Um, but we had a <coughs> facilities assessment, I know the, the Jacobs report that was done, I guess there was an updated report. I think we were promised that last year. So what is the status of that report? And I just, I make the point because that campus continues to age. We've, you know, continued to program into it and, um, there, there, there's some serious needs out there uh, at the campus. I know obviously we're going to you know, struggle to, to find funds, but um, nonetheless, we haven't put very much money at all in that facility over time. And uh, you know, we occupied it more than 20 years ago now with the community campus programs, the upgrade to the dining hall and such. And I guess I'm curious as you know, where are we then with the assessment, the facilities assessment? That doesn't, that doesn't produce the money, but I... My under... Oh, Jeff. Could There's speak. Jeff. Actually. Chair Cern, a member of the board, Jeff Gasway with General Jeff. Services. Um, to answer your question, Supervisor Natoli, we have one piece of the uh, facility assessment um, draft right now. I had some comments on it. We sent it back to the um, consultant to address those comments. We're waiting for two other pieces of it, which is the ADA assessment and the um, assessment um, for hazardous materials, lead paint, asbestos, and things like that, um, before we can start including some of those projects in the CIP. In both of those things you mentioned, you're still waiting for pieces, Jeff, but what about um, some of the major systems? The, you know, again, those were older buildings to begin with. Um, uh, they're you know, a lot of wear and tear, uh, they're occupied, and so what about with your HVAC uh, and your roof systems, uh, even the aesthetics, uh, obviously that's not as critical from the standpoint of the integrity of the building, but <clears throat> I'm, I'm, you know, where are we with some of those things? And I, I agree, lead paint when you have children on, on the campus or families, you know, uh, ADA compliance, obviously you have two and three story, um, or at least two story buildings. Um, so, so a lot of the mechanical systems and the roofing systems are in the facility assessment portion of the CIP, which is a draft at this point, and I just received it um, two weeks ago. So it, I, I couldn't include any of those items in the CIP because we didn't know what those were. 
we have, my staff has been out there um, over the past couple of months repairing some of the HVAC systems and getting those up and running due to heat. Um, and um, we were more efficient and less expensive than some of the um, bids we received for replacing compressors and things like that. Good. So we have been out there doing some work. Um, it's just a matter of being able to have an accurate facility assessment to be able to include some of those things and get those into the CIP. And in, in Colin made the point, uh, and I'm, I guess this is a question, so as you're waiting for those pieces, some of those very recent, I appreciate the work that's been done uh, to at least maintain some of the, the, the systems and keep, the, you know, keep it livable and, and certainly serviceable. Then would you anticipate, bef and we're not gonna have to wait till the CIP draft next June, you would could be back to us sooner than that, uh, uh, if I heard correctly, uh, as to what it looks like? That doesn't mean, again, I don't know what the funding source is gonna be, but. Uh, I mean, the big piece of this is the funding source and what how we would fund those projects. We can put a list in the CIP for um, on the unfunded tab for projects. We could probably have that. Um, hopefully sometime after the first of the year um, to be on the unfunded tab um, but it's a matter of finding the funding for those projects to give you an order of magnitude in the draft you're looking in 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 the 12 million dollar um, order of magnitude for some of those projects i think surprisingly totally we do plan on bringing whatever that what the needs are as we're starting to put the cip together for next fiscal year we do want to have that discussion on what the needs are and what does it look like? Yeah, because we house several hundred people there, uh, you know, both you know single persons as well as the uh, families, and then we have the transitional youth across the street through the Adolfo campus, and and you know we had a pretty good income stream for a while with the Veterans Administration and the parking. We were probably drawing a million dollars a year, and I guess a lot of that's gone away, but. Um, I think we need to have a plan for Mather campus because it's, uh, you know, the, the just, you know, it's occupied. It's not, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, a facility that may, you know, parts occupy with offices. We have people living there and it's, you know, there's a daily life that goes on there. And when I see the Veterans Village, you know, obviously brand new and the infirmary has been redone, it, you know, we, we pale kind of in comparison because we have an older facility. It's not because it's necessarily it's not in, un, in, un, inhabitable. but. Okay, I guess I would just say I look forward to having that. I know that we, you know, it's been a work in progress. I think we had a similar report that we were doing that assessment, and and uh, I guess I look forward to it on on, on the community campus. So, thanks, Jeff. If, if I could, Mr. Chair, a couple of the other categories here. Um, I'd like to ask about libraries. Um, we were told a year ago we were going to do a, we need to do a master plan before we could do. Consider, and of course, budgets are tightening up. Um, and I know we were challenged because of the COVID and getting some of the outreach done. But um, you know, we put 240,000 or something amount of money towards doing a, a master plan. I guess is going to tell us that some of the needs are on this list or there, but also to look at new construction. So, can you tell me where we're at with that? So, um, so uh, due to COVID, some things slowed down a little bit with the master plan. Right now, we're in the process of. Um, online public outreach um, mm -hmm. and we wanted to let that it, that kind of slowed the process down going from public meetings to an online process because getting the uh, survey converted over to different languages so that's posted it's been up for i'm going to say two weeks now three weeks and they wanted to let that run for about a month um, and then we'll assemble that data. And I think we have a charrette um, with, the, or the core group has, has a meeting here within the next few weeks. Um, so I'm anticipating coming back to the board. Um, the schedule slipped and I'm, it's, it's slipping my mind right now, but um, either um, December or January timeframe with a plan. So are they working with the friends at the library? I mean, I, you know, I, I know the only thing I saw was that you had a schedule and that it had, there had been some slippage and understandably so, but it, so how are we doing the outreach online, reaching you know, library users and patrons and, and other interested parties? How are we doing? Um, uh, it's, um, again, it's online and then um, the, we've been working closely with the library staff and they've been putting it on all of their Facebook pages and their, their um, social media outlets to, to get that out to the, to the public. And I believe they've also have, uh, we, we plant, posted signs in the, in the library branches that are open or on the outside of the branches. 
um, to, to advertise that as well. Yeah, it's less than optimal, but obviously under the circumstances yeah. where, we're, <clears throat> where we're at with it. And then, so with that in mind, what's the anticipated date recognizing, obviously you want to make sure there's a sufficient amount of outreach and feedback in order to, you know, accomplish, uh, you know, the, the goals of bringing forward a plan that reflects, obviously, that community input and then recommendations. What's the time frame, Jeff, roughly? I believe it's December, January time frame. It's kind of, it's the schedule slipped. Yeah. But, um, okay. so. All Most right. likely it's after the beginning. After of the first of the year. year. Okay. All right. Well, that's all I had on libraries. I'm going to go to parks next if I could. <laughs> um, on parks, I had a couple of specifics, but I know Navi and I and our briefing talked about this, and I know you and Britt worked on it, but I'm still very concerned that with a nearly $80 million backlog and capital improvement program, we don't have any capital uh, CIP that's beyond grants and uh, uh, maybe some monies that come in from time to time from other sources, I, you know, the American River Conservancy and, and such to help us with some of the, the efforts. Um, that backlog continues to grow. There are things on that list, I think, that are of interest to, to all of us. Obviously, those parks are throughout this county. They're regional in nature in a lot of cases. Some are smaller that are <clears throat> under our jurisdiction. And I guess I, my question, general question is, without getting into some, some, a couple of specifics here, is that what's the plan? I know there are, you know, it, it, it's a dollar challenge, but if we're going to have more challenging budgets, how do we ever get to a CIP that actually has some dollars in it that they can be, you know, because there's no programming except for those grants uh, uh, for anything in the next five years. And I guess that's not my question. And again, if we as a board need to deliberate that in a separate setting, I mean in this setting, but in a separate, I, I'm fine with that. But I just think we, we have to find a way in a county this size with a park system that we can be proud of relative to the acreage, but to the facilities offered to have some ability to do a capital improvement beyond just hit and miss on grants, and we do well. I'm getting on to credit to our staff, so I guess my, that's my question. <clears throat> we, were rec we were planning on recommending some money before the economic crisis we're in. We're gonna continue looking at that. This is a long-term plan. It's five years out after this budget is voted on. We're gonna go back to the drawing board, see what we need to do with the parks. Uh, Liz did tell me that we are pretty competitive on the grant side. She's gotten mm -hmm. some pretty good grants. I believe it's a $2 million number that she's been able to get that should keep some of the backlog. It's not going to knock all the $80 million out. But as we keep looking at that, see what else we can do about it. Okay. Um, and I just specifically, I, I brought this up last year, and I know there's been some work on it. I've talked to you and Bruce as recently in our briefing last week. Um, but one facility in, in particular in, in Walnut Grove, the Gene Harvey School, which is a historical building, uh, we've been looking at block grant, that's yet to come to us, but uh, you know, the report was done in 2016, Jacob's report, did a lot of facility assessment. Liz had some folks do some minor repairs to the roof last year, but it needs a roof replacement, and we've got dry rot in the windows, and we've got termites. Um, and I don't want to make it sound more onerous than it is, but there's, I don't know what the plan is to address that, and the roof costs have obviously got up. I talked to Liz, Liz this morning, so um, I certainly appreciate hearing, but that, those types of things are urgent, and yet that gets into CIP, and so I don't know, maybe it's operations and maintenance, and you do some maintenance on our facilities. Obviously, that's built into your budget. But those types of things, and I use that as an example, but there may be others on the list where you have maintenance, but it gets into CIP because it's a $400,000 cost for a roof replacement, and then that, doesn't, that gets beyond normal maintenance maybe some assessment in the overall facilities plan um, <clears throat> that relates to those things that are most critical. And again, I trust certainly uh, department head and, and, and you folks to look at that, but it's still matter money, but those critical needs, and it, you know, if you go too long on some of those things, then you're gonna, you're, you're gonna pay uh, in multiples uh, to actually do the repairs if you don't, in some cases, lose facilities uh, because of that. So. Um, I guess I'd be interested, Liz, I know you've got some opportunities and now kind of touched on it, but that doesn't cover the full cost of some of those repairs, so. Uh, that is correct. So your <laughs> unfunded uh, project list for Gene Harvey uh, School is about a little over a million dollars. Uh, we do have 2.5 in per capita grant funds from Prop 68 that we are in the process of going out and doing public outreach on how we will spend those funds. And our recommendation is to spend $400,000 of those funds um, on the Gene Harvey roof repair. 
Okay. <clears throat> could, could we have some uh, <clears throat> updated assessment on what it, for the, for, you know, those are large casement windows, and if they've got dry rot, then you're going to have intrusion into your walls, and, and it, mm -hmm. obviously most of it's a brick facility. Uh, but if there's, if there's termite control or treatment that needs to be done, I mean, those are things that, again, maybe it falls more into being working with general services. Some of those things you might be able to do if there's major work, but you, we, we, you know, on your foundations and so forth, if your termites, you know, you, can do significant damage and we can be into you know many many hundreds of thousands of dollars and I guess I would just those are the types of things that I you know I would hope that we could build into a package here obviously the roof is is, is a key piece of that um, yes uh, absolutely I can work with general services to uh, assess okay. what termite services would uh, cost okay all right that's all I had on parks thanks mr. chair uh, Liz don't go too far <laughs> thank you um, so I had um, question about the well first of all I want to um, say that I appreciate the fact that we now have the uh, uh, picnic structure uh, in the, the current CIP for Discovery Park um, that's obviously been a facility improvement that I've uh, been paying close attention to now for a number of years uh, but we also have uh, other needs uh, at Discovery Park most notably uh, our bathrooms and so uh, I noticed uh, in the unfunded list we have a uh, an estimate of I think it's a million for and change for uh, those ba needed bathroom improvements and to Supervisor Natoli's point earlier generally about um, how we can expect to um, bolster the CIP when it comes to our parks especially I'm very interested in understanding um, how, how long do you think we can go without <laughs> you know, f functional restrooms or, or with the deficiencies in our restroom facilities out there. I know that uh, we had um, one incident um, this summer where um, the lack of bathroom facilities was in part, uh, part of a consideration in terms of the prospect of a large gathering uh, at Discovery Park. Um, and I also wanted to um, maybe hear a little from you, Liz, about um, whether or not there's been any discussion exhausted with regional SAN to see if there's any uh, assistance that could be uh, garnered from that agency relative to the to the uh, bathrooms in particular um, you're well aware that uh, over the last uh, two or three years there's kind of been a new working relationship between regional SAN the county of Sacramento uh, Parks Department as it relates to um, our parkways and using some resources that come from that agency to help us with our uh, capital facility needs as well as our, our cleanup activity. So um, I'd just like you to kind of generally respond to what you see through a somewhat perhaps foggy crystal ball uh, relative to that, that particular park facility. Well, uh, again, with the per capita dollars that we have coming, um, one of our recommendations is the replacement of the Tiscornia restroom at Discovery Park. Um, so we hope to get that project um, approved if the, the board so desires and move forward with that. Um, some of the other repairs are some ongoing maintenance repairs we have to do to our restrooms when our water lines break and go down or we have to replace the grinders on a fairly regular basis when um, items that are not appropriate to be placed in toilets are placed in toilets and clog them up. And as far as uh, regional sanitation, we do have a partnership with them. They have funded grants for us to do additional uh, cleanup repairs, as you are aware, and also uh, some of our water study um, funding. And I assume every year that goes by and we don't have um, the, the funding uh, either programmed or actually being expended to uh, complete this facility, we're we're continuing to pay for you know n a number of porta potties that have to be out there for public health reasons, obviously. Um, and what is what do you, do you have an estimate of what that is and how sustainable is that? And it, uh, especially as you know the the, the park becomes uh, even uh, more used, um, uh, especially in the, the summer months. I do not have a dollar amount off the top of my head on what we spend on porta potties, but I can get that for you. Okay, well, I, again, I just want to make this comment as a marker that that should be um, a priority. I know it, we have a lot of priorities, but uh, th th it's a public health consideration. Um, it's an ongoing uh, maintenance operational cost in the absence of, of uh, completing that project. Um, and it's, I think it's a, uh, a compliment that should be um, elevated in priority 
relative to uh, the fact that that is such a um, widely used uh, facility that's got some regional consequence, not just countywide. Okay. Thank you. Okay, any other uh, questions or comments for staff on CIP? <coughs> I know that we have at least two speakers. Uh, no, now you have uh, nine. Nine speakers mm -hmm. on CIP, okay. Caller, please start with your comments. Good morning, uh, Board of Supervisors. Very late night last night. I am calling to uh, request that you delay your action on the capital improvement plan for the jails. We need a comprehensive jail system management plan, something that looks at budget, population projections, budget considerations, building needs, the May's consent, with a process that also includes the community with stakeholders and other experts. Uh, so at this time, I think I recommend that you delay action on the capital improvement plan as it respects to the jail system improvements. Thank you. Thank you. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Sure. Pamela Eugene. Pamela Eugene. Do you know that name? Supervisors, do you know who that is? 66 million to go towards expanding jails? More corruption, really? Is this even a debate? 66 million to expand jails, as well as a proposition to inflate the sheriff's budget? Where are the numbers that show that the Sheriff's Department is helping more than hurting? Where are the numbers that show that our carceral system is a success? This is ridiculous. You want to listen to our constituents? Reach out to Pamela Eugene, and she'll tell you exactly what goes on in our jails. 70% of people in the jails are waiting trial, meaning they're innocent until proven guilty. But 100% of the inmates are treated like garbage, like less than humans, at the hands of officers in the jails. There's severe lack of health support for inmates who literally die in our jails. This is where we want our money to go? No, no it is not. How are you all not concerned with the politics of our carceral system? Where's the leadership, the compassion? Where's the understanding? Expanding jails won't solve crime. You think expanding jails will keep your neighborhood safe, but it won't keep my neighborhood safe. Expanding jails will not heal people. It dehumanizes people. It breaks them down until they die, whether that be physically or mentally. You don't need to have to wait to have a loved one in the jails to have empathy. Is there not one thing you could think of that $66 million can benefit in our community before expanding jails? You all have common sense. Don't let these corrupt people, AKA Nav Gill and Scott Jones complicate things that are very simple. We don't need bigger jails. We need healing for our community. We need support for our families and small businesses during this pandemic, during these fires. We need investing in MH first. Spend one day in that jail and tell me I'm wrong. Pamela Eugene, reach out to her. Thank you. Thank you. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes, and please silence the meeting in the background. Um, good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Felisa. I am a social worker. I have a master's in social work with an emphasis in public policy and criminal justice. The funded CIP capital project total is $104 million, $140 million, and of that, the jails get nearly 50% of that budget. I don't understand how a lawsuit against you and the county of Sacramento jail system means an increase of the jail's budget and an expansion of the jail. In the May V versus County of Sacramento, um, incarcerated community members stated that the jail lacks cleanliness, that they're kept in cells for at least 23 hours a day, 
We are often in solitary confinement for no reason, even those with intellectual disabilities. I'm reading this off of the lawsuit, by the way. And that the jail has the second highest or twice the highest or twice the average suicide rate of the national average. So what does a jail expansion have to do with any of this? The jail the project description talks about inserting new cameras and cables and miscellaneous items and all of that stuff. And what does this have to do with the lawsuit? How does this expansion address the issues covered in the lawsuit against you in the county of Sacramento? Because it does not, and it's going to lead to another lawsuit, and I'm pretty sure you do not want that. Your jail is harming people, and this is coming from a sister who was just released from a jail. And my sister is traumatized from your jail. A month after being released, she tried jumping out of the car because she is so traumatized of the conditions of confinement. Okay? So your jail expansion, this jail expansion is nothing for the lawsuit. I want you guys to wrap your heads around this and what Nav is presenting to you of what the sheriffs are doing, do not pass this budget and do not give the jails 50% of the CIP budget. Thank you. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi, 45-year resident here, lived in Citrus Heights, Rosemont, Rancho Cordova, Fulton over by Tognati. I lived in Meadowview with a friend's mom to save some money, and then in Midtown when my one bedroom was near around $500 about 20 years ago. Is that officially dog whistling enough to let you know that I'm white and old and not one of those people, you know, those bad people? Now, I recognize how many have suffered and don't have the same opportunities as me, and I'd like to see the $66 million for jails removed. I'm tired of seeing money for new jail construction when the May's consent decree made it clear and it was strongly recommended that the board reduce the jail population as one of the cheapest and most effective ways to improve conditions and avoid future losses. Advocates for jail population reduction asked earlier this year for a reduction due to COVID. Administrative, administration officials around the country ignored these pleas. This is especially prescient in California where we depend on underpaid jail labor as a way to have our fires taken care of but we couldn't because we didn't care enough for the jail population despite a pandemic. So maybe we should listen to the consent decree recommendations and when the decision before us was a purely moral issue and we could have helped ourselves now. And in the end, this comes down to the reality that a rising tide lifts all boats and invested in community that has been historically disadvantaged increases their input to the broader community. It increases inputs to other aspects of that community, resulting in more prosperity, and it results in a lower jail population and lower expenses with regards to prisons and law enforcement. We're asking for a fundamental shift, and you'd be in charge of that shift in how we treat those disadvantaged communities. Invest this money in minority and poor communities. We've tried their way for over 100 years. They continue to not be required to show efficacy and get handed more money on top of money to fix bad behavior without ever addressing lack of accountability when they screw up. Instead, officers may have to endure a couple hours long training, which changes nothing about decades of socialization to see minorities and the poor as enemies. In closing, no more money for jail. The consent decree and others agreed that reducing jail population is enough for the savings. Reroute additional resources to communities impacted by over 100 years of racism. Reroute money to health services to ensure cops have healthy adults to hand over millions to when they abuse those adults' civil rights. Help communities stop throwing away money at a broken carceral and law enforcement system. Thank you. Thank you. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi, Board of Supervisors. Uh, back at it again uh, from District 1. And yeah, I think it's pretty telling if, uh, by now over this entire buzzing process in the last few months that uh, Nav Gill, your, seat, your county CEO, is not working for you. He's not doing the things that you actually want him to do. 
uh, which includes creating a comprehensive uh, jail re uh, population reduction plan uh, that should have been done in order to comply with the consent, uh, the May's consent decree, uh, even as he continues to use that consent decree as an excuse to ex uh, to allocate uh, tens of millions of dollars in newly allocated funding for a new jail annex. When in reality, the county's approach to meeting the consent decree is not the most cost effective. And there are plenty of ways that you can meet uh, the American Disabilities Act and HIPAA requirements without a new tower uh, or any new jail expansions uh, with simply reducing the population. You have money right here and now that you are trying to put into a defunct monument to oppression and could easily be putting it into preventative services, community-based services, housing, health care, Every single uh, service that provides a human need could have this, like could make do with so much of this money, and instead you're putting it in to give it to law enforcement and the jails. That speaks volumes to this county's priorities right now. If this isn't loud and clear that Nav Gill is not working in the best interest of this board or the community of Sacramento, I don't know what to tell you. It means that both like that there is either a clear dereliction of duty by this board, or you all are just that naive and stupid to keep taking his lies like that. So I'm, ca I'm calling on you to delay this vote, make sure that there is a genuine jail population reduction strategy, and then, take and then do the right thing. Put the money where people need it most. It is not the jails, it is not the law enforcement, it is in the community. Please, do the right thing. Thank you. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi. Um, good morning, Board of Supervisors. This is Liz Blum. Um, I, I just want to start by saying that when we say jail expansion, um, we mean the expansion of general fund dollars going to jails. Uh, we know that this new jail annex doesn't technically um, plan to increase the number of jail beds, um, but it is expanding the amount of, that the county spends on incarceration by hundreds of millions of dollars over the next few decades. Um, these are the same dollars that we could use to keep people out of jail. And, that, and I also just wanted to talk briefly about transparency. Um, so I'm really confused as to why this $16 million in funding for the main jail annex um, that is coming from general fund wasn't mentioned at all on item number one. Um, I, I just want to point out that, that you know, NAV is, is not as objective as, as you think he is and that the plan for meeting the consent decree is, is everyone at the table is has their own biases. And so... You know, is they're all carceral system law enforcement um, experts, right? And so, there are ways to meet the ADA and HIPAA requirements without a new tower. We're meeting with architects. We're reading through um, these these recommendations that are included in the consent decree. And thank you so much, Natoli, for being willing to revisit this, being willing to meet with these architects. Um, we. Um, we also, I mean, would would really appreciate community just being at the table more. Community experts, people who have experienced the jail system, um, the way that you're going about meeting the consent decree, and, and the way that the county actually is not going about making a comprehensive jail reduction plan, um, we can help you with. You know, the, we're, we have a team of, of doctors, academics, um, mental health workers that are ready and willing are you know <laughs> ready and willing to um to work with you all and i just really ask that you include community in these processes and make it more transparent it's really disturbing how this this was hidden under county building costs you know this is a sheriff's building that he should be paying for the repairs for not general fund not the county um so please please slow down delay this vote, include community. Thank you. Thank you.
please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Um, this is Courtney Hansen with District 1. Hope you all got a little bit of sleep. Um, I think I'm going to lose more sleep now. I don't understand why, why we have to fight so hard for libraries. We shouldn't have to fight so hard for libraries in part. And it's a depressing conversation when we're talking about $66 million in jail construction. And we get, you know, when we hear you say, we're not trying to incarcerate more people, we get that, but we're telling you that that is what will happen. That pouring this many millions into the jail is further entrenching a system that we need to stop relying on to warehouse people with mental illness. We can talk about the well, we can talk about putting bars in the showers so disabled people don't experience additional humiliation and trauma, but can we also come up with a plan to stop incarcerating so many people with disabilities? We talk about this, there's been symbolic sign-ons to things like the Stepping Up Initiative, and I don't understand why there's no political will to make that happen when there's so many people in the community um, a woman I work with that just spent three years in the jail, she said, I'm willing to do a Q&A with the board if that would be helpful. You know, I've seen a lot. I, I've read the consent decree. I, so, you know, you can take us up on these things. There are architects that want to talk about what kind of equity centers you should be building instead of these, these buildings that house 60% of the population has mental illness. Three quarters are awaiting trial. There's no excuse for not having a plan over policing and excessive jailing does not work. It necessitates more staff, hiring more staff and requires more buildings and capital improvements. And then we sort of have this weird incentive that we've created even unintentionally to hire more and build more and spend more. Please slow down your correction spending. Bring us to the table. Let us help you. We can do this differently. Thank you. Thank you. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Hello, this is Adnan. I'm a lifetime District 2 resident. Um, and this improvement plan is nothing, there's nothing improving about this. I urge you not to pass it. Sinking money into our jail system is never going to better our community. The sheriff has over policed and over incarcerated our residents. Boosting their funding for any anything is going to lead to asking for more money. It's a never-ending cycle, which results in our community struggling without access to other services that help us, and the only alternative being jail. We need to create an alternative to incarceration. We need to not put money into jail when it's never going to help our communities. This is just an excuse to rationalize the jail expansion that we have been fighting and will continue to fight. We can meet ADA and HIPAA requirements without a new tower, without more funding to the jail. We just need to lower jail populations. We need a plan to lower jail populations. We need resources for people who get out of jail. We need resources to stop people from going into jail. Please do not let this spiral out of control any more than it already has. Sheriff Jones just wants his budget to be even more bloated. He has not helped our community, and he's not going to suddenly do that if you give him even more money. There's no plan for accountability here. There's no room for communities to help improve the system. There's, there's no system to stop these jails from being the traumatizing places that they continue to be. We can't keep sinking money into a violent and disruptive system. Please do not commit years of taxpayer dollars into the system. It will only lead to more and more demand for money. Please wait on this and do not pass this. Thank you. Thank you. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you. I'm a resident of Sacramento regarding item number two. 
something that the board fails to understand is a simple but important principle. Over the last 10 years, Sheriff Scott Jones has over-policed and over-incarcerated residents. Um, to have one of the highest rates among similarly sized counties, despite a 20-year low in nearly all, all crimes, this policy is what necessitates more staff. Hiring more staff is what requires more buildings and capital improvements. This is a cascading effect, and it creates a perverse incentive to hire more and build more and spend more to take more funding from human services. The focus, the immediate focus, should be comprehensive, comprehensive jail system management that incentivizes alternatives to incarceration, not building more jails. This is what will save money, not taking up more money for jails and uh, to continue to over police. Thank you for your time. I see the rest of it. Thank you. That, that concludes your public comments. All right, thank you. Supervisor Tully. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on the CIP, particularly on the, the focus we've heard from some of the speakers on, on, the, on the jails, I um, wanted to, to ask a couple of questions. I know that, um, that for the Rio Casimas Correctional Center, I think the 66 million is referenced to the, you know, combining the main jail, the 29 million that's in the CIP, and then the 37 million for Rio Casimas. I had a conversation with Britt and, and Nav uh, earlier in the week uh, about, uh, or with Britt anyway, about uh, one of the items that was, well, actually a couple of the items, but one of the items out at our triple C, there it was added in 2017, and I, I don't think this project is ever going to come to fruition. It's been added here, but it represents 23, nearly 24 million dollars. Somebody suggested putting a flood wall around the our triple C campus. Um, we've already expended a few thousand dollars on that, uh, but it seems to me that, again, project viability. Uh, you know, people can make suggestions, somehow it gets on the list, and then it gets put into this greater total that becomes obviously subject to question to comments, uh, certainly that we've heard here this morning. Um, that along with the water system, which we're well aware of, the water system needs upgrading, but there's a, there's a CIP item here that was like added in 2011. It talks about bringing a water line. I don't know where that comes from. Uh, the closest place is from the city of Elk Grove, I guess, uh, water agency. But then we actually have built into the plan projects um, a <clears throat> upgrade portable water system. And I thought as we were doing some of that work under the 1022 uh, proposal that we were going to put in additional tanks, new wells, and so forth. So there's a $6.2 million line item that's in on page uh, 15, or 158 of the uh, CIP. And and yet then there's this reference going back to 2011 to 8.5 million to bring a water line. So we're not gonna do both, I trust. Uh, and, and, and if we're gonna do the upgrade with the wells and storage tanks, then we ought to take the other one off the CIP. I mean, that's, that's clearly not consistent. So I think the some of the projects you're referencing are on the unfunded tab, which right. is meant to show the unmet need in the county. And I agree with you, if we're gonna do one, the other should come off. Okay. That's an oversight on my part. No problem. So, um, and realistically, um, the flood wall probably won't be done. We've been working with, um, Steve can tell me and them, th that group on some portable flood walls. So um, that will also come off. Okay. Um, we do have a water problem, as you're well aware of, over the years. We've, we've had long discussions about that. Um, we do need to add um, a well or a water line mm -hmm. Um, and we're in the process of doing some analysis um, to figure out w what would be better and how we would pay for it. Um, the water well and tanks were included in the SB 1022 project. Right. Since that project is not moving forward, it becomes an expense for the capital construction fund right. at that point. Um, and it, that's why it's it's there in the in no that's still under and that's understood yeah. Joe I was a question it's just we had both and so you're yeah. either going to do one or the other I think that's right. the practical obviously is to develop yeah. you know the domestic water well that uh, would you know uh, uh, you know serve the facility so that would be the 6.2 million so the 8.5 yeah. uh, <clears throat> would be negated it would it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a double count on that um, while you're there then um, the $29 million is in the main jail. And again, I got confirmation from BIT that of the $29 million, $16 million 
is what's plugged in on page 157. Um, it's, not, it's not a double number. The 16 million is the main jail, the annex project to design a, as described here, design a second facility downtown, provide for additional programming and medical space. So uh, there's actually $13 million in unmet needs at the main jail, roof, showers, drains. I mean, there's a, you know, so, so that's, <clears throat> those are the things that, that are within that 13 million. And up to 16 million, maybe this is for, for, for Britt or, or for you, we've already assigned $8 million in last year's budget. So this basically doubles that and puts another $8 million of general fund to bring that to 16 million, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so what we're being asked to in this year's budget to appropriate is an additional $8 million. $8 million has already been roped off. That was submitted last year. That's been carried over. And then... We encumbered um, um, about $7 million of that $8 million for a contract for a criteria architect. We'll be coming to the board um, in October for another contract for a construction management firm um, that will encumber another dollar amount, um, which so, so, the, so the knock and Lewis, the knock and Lewis is this, is, is the first eight million. So actually, there's not sixteen million dollars there. There's there's going to be only be eight eight and a half million dollars there. There's about nine million there. With with what's being recommended this year. There's about knocked and Lewis encumbered seven million of right. the, the the sixteen, or the the original eight. The original eight, yeah. Right, and then um, there's the the eight in this fiscal year is for another contract okay and a carryover of a million so we're, we're right we're, we're, we okay. put we put eight million dollars in the budget last year which was encumbered most of it and some rest will carry over and another eight million dollars is transferred this year for a total of 16 million dollars uh, the, the plan was that that money would be used for all of the the planning all of the work up to the point where we were going to issue debt for the actual construction of the facility at which point we would issue certificates of participation and then the debt service would basically instead of paying putting eight million a year into the capital construction fund we'd be paying eight to ten million a year in debt service for the actual um, construction cost of the of the annex so the October item that you referenced uh, the CIP would um, if adopted as per outlined here, we'd be adding another $8 million with a million dollar carryover, and then you would be bringing to us for consideration another contract for, for what you said, the design? It's the construction management contract. Okay, and when we did the Nocton Lewis, <coughs> we, we were going to have some junctures at which the board was going to have some chance to see what that encompassed uh, you know that's a lot of money for architects and so forth and and yet on the heels of that we haven't seen that yet i guess that work hasn't been completed uh that we're going to have another contract that will be funded through the money that's going to be included here in the cip if we adopt this uh, so is there a plan to have some discussion about what the first seven and a half million bought before we spend another or ask to approve another nine and a half or eight million ten million whatever the number is um, we're in the process of um, working with Britt and the county executive's office and Nocton Lewis to, to look at uh, population projections based on um, economics and interviewing the sheriff's office, SAC PD, all of the, the, the groups um, to be able to look at how that population is going to look like and then we'll start looking at what the design and how what the the annex needs to look like okay so let me boil this down because i mentioned last night mike on my final comments last night is that it is i assume there's the ability if, if the board was so inclined to have i say a planning session to have some discussions i mean before we embark on you know you're going to bring an item to us that's going to you know engender some obviously discussion and conversation but to get want a status update uh, and talk about some of those things, uh, certainly the carry report, the population projections, the alternative to sentencing, some of the other things we're, we're funding. We've had plenty of discussion last night about some of the things we can hopefully do to uh, you know, <laughs> redirect and, 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 and defer. Obviously, we're still going to have a jail population, but um, Again, the, the, you know, this all again, kind of falls back to the maze consent decree. I get that. There's, there's a legal parameter there. but. I guess I, for one, and I have no problem having that discussion right here in, this, you know, in, in, in these chambers to, again, because 
before we get asked to what you just said, Britt, to then, if we were to go to the next step and approve going forward and then be back here some months later with, you know, multiple millions of dollars to issue bonded indebtedness, I, I would li like to have a juncture where we can spend some time talking as a board and as a community and certainly hearing from those that are the experts and anybody else that wants to weigh in uh, about this uh, before we make this major expenditure. So, um, and I guess I just, uh, that's probably why I'll just leave it right now. If we approve the CIP with the additional eight million, we haven't expended those dollars until you bring that contract to us. And so we'll have a chance to talk about that, I trust in a few weeks. Uh, uh, but I think, again, I don't, I'm not gonna, you know, kind of beat around the bush here. I just, I'm gonna just say that I, I'd like to have some conversation about this overall plan. Cause there are a lot of efforts going on and I appreciate the work that's being done, but I also, I uh, think, you know, before we go that much more deeply in this and begin to, you know, become very committed to whatever it is we're going to do, uh, to have, you know, have a really good idea about what those projections are, what the folks are saying, and then obviously we, we're hearing comments from others who, uh, you, know, may, you know, may see it differently, but I think still it falls in the realm of this board to make those decisions. So, and be, you know, fiscally responsible, but also obviously prudent about the way we spend our dollars. Uh, and again, this is such a big general fund hit. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of uh, staff on CIP? Okay, I know that uh, Supervisor Peters needs to um, delicately manage the, the vote here. So um, I'll give the floor to her to explain uh, She's going to I would move to adopt the capital improvement plan minus the projects identified in the slide uh, that just came up, which would be excluded. Need a second. second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, Supervisor Pauly. Yeah, just a question on the motion. So, and Jeff just noted, you know, uh, one modification. And if there, if, if we wanted to remove a project from the CIP, I guess what, what would be the process for that? For example, the flood wall. I, I mean, I don't see any necessity to pursue that and to keep carrying twenty-three million, twenty-four million dollar expenditure on the on the books. No, so we are going to remove that project. You, you will. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, okay, that's good. No, I'm fine okay. with that. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Please vote. Unanimous vote. Then we need a motion on the excluded items. So moved. Okay. It's been moved by Supervisor Frost and seconded by Supervisor Kennedy. Please vote. And the motion carries with Supervisor Peters recusing for a potential conflict of interest. All right. Thank you. Okay. And now you're back as also the Board of Supervisors for the uh, budget. This is the public hearing and consideration, well, excuse me, you closed the public hearing last night. Uh, this is consideration of possible revisions to the fiscal year 2020-21 approved recommended budget. You, you ready? Do we need a break or are you ready? You ready? Okay. Uh, Supervisor Turner, members of the board, um, Britt's going to walk us through. There's various questions we received last night, and what we plan on doing is go by the questions we received, see what input the board has, and then after that, uh, see how the board wants to deliber deliberate. Um, what we will plan on doing is that as each item you want to add, we will see what the monetary value is, and then tabulate where we are, and see what the board wants to do at that point. So with Britt, with that one. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gill, um, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. So we identified uh, essentially 16 questions or issues that were asked by the board or, um, or uh, where the board raised an issue. And so um, we'll start with the issue of the renter's helpline and Leanne Moffitt, uh, the county planning director, will be uh, addressing that issue. And she's going to be addressing the climate action plan too, both those items. Leanne's going to take care of it. Good morning, members of the board. Um, I will start off with the uh, renter's helpline item. We did have a report before you uh, dated July 14th of 2020 um, that I did identify funding uh, for a part-time individual for the renter's uh, helpline um, through the end of the year uh, related to the COVID uh, emergency. So. 
supervised public. Yes, so the $15,000 just funds that through December 30th through COVID monies or? Um, and actually the source of the funds um, ended up being from Elk Grove, Citrus Heights, and Rancho Cordova. They stepped up and funded that position that was requested. So it is fully funded and that has been done. Okay, but well what about from January 1st through the rest of the fiscal Well, they year? were essentially asking for um, the CARES funding through the end of the year, so that was what they were asked, asked for, and that was what was funded. But it serves the entire county, unincorporated area folks. Uh, it does. You know, take advantage of So if we wanted to fund it through the remaining fiscal year, part of fiscal year, irrespective of what this, again, thank you to the cities, obviously they participated in this as well. Right. If we wanted to fund that position, uh, assuming there was the need, I, I'm, I'm going to make some assumption <coughs> here, there's going to continue to be a need, uh, then it would be another $15,000? Um, well, their request was essentially for a six-month part-time position through December, and that was what was funded um, from the other jurisdictions. And that request was from Self-Help Housing? Yes. You know, have we had any feedback about whether they foresee the need going forward? Uh, we beyond? haven't, but we could check and we could see okay. whether they're... Uh, is an opportunity. It's not a large event. amount, and again, I appreciate it's the city participation, amount. but I yes. just, again, I think, you know, I bring it back to current I, economic situation. I'm a little confused. Is did did the cities uh, use their share of CARES Act funding to to fund this? Yes, it was a relatively small amount, so they just stepped in and funded it. So given given the way that I I I, I, he, I hear the CEO. Um, generally reference how we would uh, manage the balance of CARES Act funding going forward. Um, this is a question for you, Nav. Is there, is there a possibility that we can um, rope off some uh, funding if it's the will of the board? I don't know if it's 15000 I I don't know what the, the monthly pro rata would be, but um, assuming that there would be an ongoing need past the beginning of the year, is there a possibility we can do that? Yeah, we, we'll discuss as Leanne said and see if there's a what the need is, we can roll that off and bring it back to the board. I think it's a, I think it's one of those items where you get um, a lot for a relatively uh, small amount. So um, I would certainly be supportive of uh, leaving this uh, to the executive team to find out how we can continue to fund this past January one. Got it. All right. Okay. Good. Good. All right. The climate next item plan. is on the climate action plan, and um, your board in the past has uh, emphasized the importance of completing that climate action plan. Um, your staff heard you, um, and that has been funded. Uh, the staff costs were actually already funded in planning's budget. Uh, the issue was the consultant funding, and so we did approach the five pending master plans um, who are all, all stepping forward um, and funding the consultant component of the costs, uh, which is estimated at a maximum of three hundred thousand uh, dollars, divided over the uh, over the five master plans. We are up and running on that. I understand there was a lot of interest last night. We do have planning has a web page, so I'll put in a plug for that, and people can subscribe uh, to our email blast. And we also have an inbox a climate action plan at sackcounty.net. Um, so those are all up and running and we would welcome uh, participation in that. And this again is something that uh, I in part was inspired by um, the consideration of Mather South and yes. some of the comments that were expressed about uh, the need for a, uh, a cap uh, moving forward relative to the, the balance of the uh, uh, board's consideration of a master plan. So I appreciate the explanation. Supervisor Kennedy. Yeah, I just want to be clear. We said the five uh, that includes uh, projects that have already been approved that are funding. Um, it includes Grand Park, Upper West Side, West Jackson, Dax Jackson Township, and Newbridge. Those so are not, the. So not Mather South? Does not include Mather South. Why, were, why did we not go to Mather South when. Mr. They were Rod already approved. I know, but Mr. Rodriguez stood right where you're standing now and said that. Right. You know, I'm willing to abide by whatever the board says in the future, even though we didn't put it in a DA at the time, which was a mistake. But, but you know, he did agree to that. So I think, out of fairness, we should approach him. Okay. The county still owns the land. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we were probably on the hook too. I know that's what we, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a fairness issue for the others. And that was really the spirit of the comments that I made uh, at the time, Mather South south was being considered by the board is that 
without the cap in place, this very issue was bound to uh, come up where you had some inequities in terms of the timing and who's paying for what. So I think it's a, it's a good suggestion. Uh, okay, any further questions on the cap for Leanne? Are, are they funding it entirely then? They're funding the consultant component and the staff costs were covered already by our other sources of funds, our building permit surcharge and other existing funding sources. And what's the total and, estimate and, cost? Let's um, say I don't have it. You have to remember the county has already funded the phase one, right. uh, the phase 2A. So this is a narrow component on this last tranche of consultant work. So it is a contribution to the overall effort uh, so the three hundred thousand dollars is this chunk of consultant funding. Is there an environmental document that has to be done? Regan? Yes. And that's that's concurrent with this. Yes. With the plan development. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. The next uh, item on our list is the issue of WIC funding, and uh, Peter Bielinson, director of health services, will uh, address that issue. Hello, board. Good morning. Um, as we talked about last night, we are actually serving about 98.5% of our caseload, um, which has been heavier during um, kind of the pandemic. We have 21,000 people that are being served compared to 16,000 being served prior to that, and where we only are covering 76% of our caseload. So we've actually been able to, because of telehealth, as you may remember from last night, been able to be much more efficacious with how we're providing our services. Well, you'll recall from last, uh, one of the speakers last night made some reference to the telehealth component and had some concerns uh, even about that. So how would you respond to The to one those? thing that's not served by telehealth is lactation, um, that you have to come in for that, that activity. Okay. But that's being covered by our staff right now. Like again, 98% of our caseload in, in, during the pandemic when it is higher because of the layoffs and because of um, additional um, issues we're actually serving more people now than we were before so in your opinion there's there's no d deficiency as has been you know explained by uh, the children's coalition and their their letter to the board not right not right now we're serving again we're serving almost 100 percent of our what about load. what about going forward going forward it depends if the pandemic gets better we i would argue that we would actually have a less of a caseload okay it, it, yeah, and I understood you last night, but so you had the positions that have been vacant since January, just, um, the, the three positions, I guess, that were going to be um, reduced because of the reduction in you know, the uh, categorical, but you're covering it with existing staff. Obviously, folks are pedaling pretty hard in a lot of respects in your you know department right. and so forth. But and I, again, I think that's great if you can you know 98 percent. I mean, I guess if you get to 100 percent, you're doing better than that. But um, is there a need for one position? Do you think? Or and this was this was reducing three. Yes. Um, and you know, and I think it's commendable that you're serving, you know, a higher caseload, and you know, and a percentage of serving all those that need. So, I mean, again, I because you know, if we do it in this context, then you have it available, you can fill it. But if we eliminate, then you've got to come through, obviously, with another request, and it requires board action and, and position authorization and so forth. Because there's you know, concurrent elimination of those positions, you can't you can't just fill them or hire somebody, I guess. So. I guess I'm just curious, Dr. Bielison. Uh, we, we um, without di disclosing HIPAA type things, we do have several um, pregnancies in our, in our, um, not our caseload, in our staff. So I suppose, you know, one additional one would be potentially helpful. I'd just like to point out too that um, there have been some um, cuts at the first five level too um, recently in terms of the WIC program. And so, yeah, I would, I would, I would actually be, supportive of more than one but because um, I you know I, I think um, for us to predict that things are gonna get better sooner rather than later is a little too optimistic for me when it comes to an important service like this in the course of a pandemic um, so so one but you just do the simple math three into 190 and 65. back back out 65,000 know, for a position 
Well, I'd certainly be supportive of the one, and if there was need for more, again, I just think that WIC program is so important. And again, I commend folks for their efforts, but I would, uh, you know, be supportive. And again, if the, if the need because either of, you know, some, you know, uh, staff, you know, time off, uh, you know, due to, you know, pregnancies and so forth, that if, you know, if you're having trouble keeping up with it, I mean, that percentage is good. 98% is, is good. Um, but I'd be supportive of at least doing, restoring one of those positions. Yeah. Two? Authorized to. I mean, if you don't fill them, you get salary savings anyway, so. Right. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Thank you. So the next issue on our list is the uh, Children's Coalition uh, uh, comments regarding the foster care program, and Michelle Caios, uh, Director of uh, Child Development and Adult Services, will address that issue. Did I shrink? <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> there we go. Good morning, Michelle Callejas, uh, Child, Family, and Adult Services. Uh, so the Children's Coalition was referencing foster parent recruitment, retention, and support dollars, or FIPPERS. Those were added by the state in 2015-16 in efforts to increase capacity of foster homes in preparation for continuum of care reform. The funding has gone down over the last several years. The state assumed that all counties would be there. Um, and have sufficient capacity. Um, and then for fiscal year 2021, 20, uh, uh, they eliminated the funding completely. Um, so it's $300,000. Over the year, we invested in various strategies, media, PSAs. We um, had contracts with providers to increase the number of foster homes that are able to meet the needs of young people with higher level needs. Um, it was, it's been, a, it's, it's been kind of hit and miss. We've increased overall homes, but we still have continued need for homes willing to take our teenagers um, with higher level mental health needs and behavioral issues. So that's the funding. So I'm hearing no funding, but continued demand. Uh, correct. Correct. So our teams continue. We continue to do <coughs> outreach. We work with our foster family agencies. They do outreach of their own to try to get foster parents <coughs> with their agencies. So it's a, you know, it's a collaborative effort. I think our main efforts right now are trying to keep kids out of care because then we have a reduced need mm -hmm. for foster homes. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Peters. Thank you. Um, I, I've talked to you uh, quite a bit about the foster parents and the uh, foster families and the um, group homes being uh, defunded by the state and uh, and those kinds of things. I, when you've, I know you've done advertising or getting the word out in ver various places. What has been the most successful way of bringing in new foster parents? So um, probably the, the recruitment, um, a lot of recruitment efforts, but I think what's more important is the retention of them. And yeah. so we had funded some positions, um, mm -hmm. which we were able to restore with General Fund a couple of years ago, where they were responding quickly to resource parents. So when they have a need, if a child's in crisis, instead of giving like a 14-day notice that I just can't keep this child anymore, we were able to be responsive. Um, so I think it is just, um, you know, right now our recruitment efforts have kind of come to a lull because of COVID. We're not able to do all the community fairs and that kind of stuff. Um, but our, our, we continue to do outreach via, you know, uh, social media. Um, so it's hard to say what's been effective. We've had an overall increase, but more for the littles. Uh, we've been a little bit successful for sibling sets because we want to keep them together. It's just our, our wonderful teens who sometimes have challenging behaviors that where we struggle to find homes for. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Supervisor Tully. <laughs> so uh, again, you're very gentle and certainly straightforward in your um, presentation on this, but I guess, Michelle, uh, the $300,000, it's a reduction. It sounds like there may have been more money in earlier years, but with the challenges we, we face uh, in, 
uh, finding you know uh, proper placements for for young people and trying to keep them out of the system obviously and I know your your efforts and that of your team of folks uh, certainly are you know proving uh, uh, to bring some good results but you know it's still a challenge as you said for some of the older children so um, is this all contracted out or does it cover any of our um, you know county staff time uh, working in cooperation with partner agencies and, and those that we would ask to help to do us outreach um, yeah, so as the money's gone down, we haven't been contracting out. One of the challenges also is the state hasn't been releasing the money until February, typically, of the fiscal year. So we had to hurry up and spend it before June 30. So what we invested in the last two years were gift cards. And those have proven successful in, like if we have a sibling set of two that we need to place immediately and avoid going to the shelter, we can give them gift cards so they can run out for infants, get formula, clothing, if the kids aren't don't have clothing on them. So they're able to meet immediate needs. That's been successful in avoiding shelter care placements or taking them to our placement unit um, so you know that's how it's been spent we don't have any contracts with agencies right. and then yeah. any additional we offset the resource family approval costs. so this goes so if we were to backfill this again because you know this this one seems to be very very important in my my thinking um, you know whether three hundred thousand dollars is the right number more or less um, I'm going to ask you that question in a moment, so be prepared. But um, if if this is for family support, for support of the young people, um, you know, some in crisis. Uh, again, I, I, it just seems to me this is an important aspect of what we're trying to do for permanency, for um, you know, uh, responding to children who are in you know dire situations in a lot of cases, uh, and then the folks that we're asking to provide either the foster support or our, our workers who are trying to help them get situated, at least with some bare necessities of clothing and, and, and otherwise. Um, and I trust there's an accounting for the gift card, so you keep some Absolutely. tracking of that so we know that it's being used properly. Um, so if you had to pick a number, uh, is this, you know, you said you scrambled to, to, you know, because the allocation came late in the, in the in this past fiscal year, uh, but I trust you had the ability to spend three hundred thousand dollars, and you did that in four months with, I guess, those efforts. So, is this a, a good number for uh, going forward for nine months? Uh, you, is, you know, is it more or less? And again, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I'm just trying to get some sense about this because I think familial support and what we're doing to keep folks out of the foster system as much as possible when when they do enter uh, to stabilize their situation and hopefully you know eliminate the trauma and you know allow them to you know, retain some stability and normalcy in their lives, uh, which I think is, is so important. Um, so I'm gonna ask you that question. So what do you, in order to sustain an effort like that over the next nine months, what do you think it would take? If you're, you know, just recognizing what the need's been and um, over the last, you know, up to the fiscal year from February through June. I would say 300000 for nine months is sufficient. And what it, it's hard because strategies work differently yes. depending on the need. So we keep trying different efforts in order to get our, our children and young people into appropriate placements that can meet their needs. Um, we would continue those efforts. Um, and then hopefully at, at some point we'll be able to do more extensive outreach and, and work within our How many community. folks do you serve? I guess that's you know, not so much a performance measure, but just to know. So what would be a, a if you had to take a, 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 a good guess at it, uh, how many families or young people would be served uh, through these dollars? Like the number in, uh, oh, oh, gosh, I don't have that number off Hundreds? the top of my head. Is it, yeah, is it, yeah, yeah, over the years. Yeah, I would say Over the because years. we've been able to get like immediate placements because we're able to meet some needs right away. And I think the the staff that were funded those efforts helped extensively. We were out at community fairs, evenings, weekends, and and successfully recruiting more families. Okay, one last question. So this would go for not just the gift cards, but would provide some additional staff resources. Um, does do you have? Is it built in to cover any of the staff? Say if you had overtime working on weekends or what? Well, I mean, how does this get a portion? I just well, right now it's strictly for for gift cards. We did have we were okay. using it to fund positions, and we shifted those over the years because we knew the funding was going to be eliminated. So if you buy the gift cards, you still got to have somebody do the work to to make those Correct. connections. So I, again, I 
and because uh, I wouldn't want to make this too limiting. Now, certainly, again, the discretion of you and working with obviously mm -hmm. staff. But again, if you think that this is a proper amount of money, I, I, I for one, Mr. Chair, I'm supportive of trying to find a way to do this in the budget. Yeah, Thanks. I am. I am too. That's why I asked last night that uh, we hear from you this morning about uh, the, the the need and and what our options are. Supervisor Peters. Thank you. Um, Michelle, as long as you're there, I thought maybe we'd take a second and, and review the children's receiving home issue that we've been working on for two or three years now. Yeah. Uh, last week, I think, if I remember correctly, last week, the new group home uh, that moves the older uh, kids out of children receiving home opened on the Bradshaw campus. Is is that correct? Uh, so our centralized placement unit that uh -huh. was co-located at the children's home, we we got a new location for that. So the placement unit moved. The shelter is still. We still utilize the shelter, and we utilize the uh, group home still at the children's receiving home. But our census has been low. We've had like between two and three kids in the shelter on any given day. And I think we have currently two kids in the group home. I don't know how many they have from other counties, but from our county's perspective, we have significantly uh, you know, reduced the use of shelter care, which is good for kids, as well as group home care. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, any further questions for Michelle? Thank you. So the next issue we have on our list is the CARES Plus program, and um, I will be uh, giving that presentation uh, at least initially because it crosses departments, but uh, both Ms. Gallegos and Dr. Quist are here who, who can also speak to elements of the program. This, as your board is aware, was a uh, growth request that was not recommended for funding. It was a growth request for $203,000, 168000 of it would have been net county cost and it would have been to add two FDE human services social workers in the public guardian, public conservator, public administrator program to broaden the Care Plus program to serve an additional uh, 20 conservatives. And the growth re request indicated that there could uh, potentially expect cost avoidance of $440,000. I need to emphasize that's not cost reduction, it's cost avoidance. A little background about the program, and again, uh, others can speak to it in more detail. Um, uh, currently, there are about 22 conservatives who are uh, mental health clients uh, being served by two Care Plus social workers, and a third social worker is in the hiring process, so that will allow the program to serve approximately 30 conservatives. The program is designed to provide intensive case management to mental health clients, and caseloads are kept around 10 conservatives per social worker. Uh, to date, the program has served a total of 80 conservatives, um, and since its inception in early 2014, uh, when it was in behavioral health services, not in uh, 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 child and family services, an average of 13 per year uh, conservatives were, ser were, serves, were served. Um, the actual number fluctuates depending on staffing and a variety of factors. Um, if not for the CARES Plus program, most of these persons would be in locked settings funded by mental health. The intense services provided by behavioral Rural Health, coupled with the Public Guardian's Office, helps keep these people stable in board and care facilities within the community. Um, uh, there was an analysis done last year in behavioral health where ident they identified um, that obviously it was a lot uh, less costly uh, to keep these people in the community uh, than in locked facilities, although the, uh, uh, um, there were significant increases in community-based treatment costs when this, pr this program was implemented. The program is funded about 85% um, or so with local funds, could be realignment or uh, net county costs, and then the rest with uh, Title IX, federal uh, uh, Title 19 funds. Um, the, uh, the issue here to keep in mind, and of course the reason we, uh, when we made decisions on what growth request to fund, our criteria were essentially legal mandate or other extremely critical need, and that was all we funded because of the, circum the fiscal circumstances we found ourselves in. So there were a variety of growth requests that um, you know, certainly had some merit, but um, in this, these times we, si we simply didn't, uh, we didn't recommend funding. The, uh, the important point from our standpoint here is um, 
uh, the request is not saying that we would able to be saved four hundred forty thousand dollars if we do this. There would still be the four hundred forty thousand dollars in costs to serve clients over on the mental health side. This would essentially, basically allow them to expand the number of people served by uh, taking some people out of the locked facilities, but it would add additional cost. And so when we, in this fiscal year, as we were looking at that, we, again, along with many other growth requests, we, uh, we chose not to recommend funding for this program. All right, thank you. Supervisor Tully? Yeah. Well, thanks, Britt. I appreciate the you know, additional background. Um, and certainly, I know, obviously, that you're putting in a budget, so you're looking at a number of considerations. But so, you, you say you're still spending. You, you say it's cost avoidance, but you're still spending the money on the other side. I want to. I want to get to the quality of the care, but I want to just make sure I'm clear on that. Is that you said when it was in mental health, it moved over to child, um, you know, family, adult services. Um, so if you avoid costs, ones that we would incur, then we, you know you can say it's not a reduction, but there's. You know, the, the, well, I, think, I, guess, I, I see transfer. I, I, think, I think the way to think about it is you could reduce costs by 440000 in mental health and reduce the number of people receiving services in locked facilities. Uh, I think what mental health was uh, looking for in this program was the ability to essentially serve more people in those facilities who, who, who would have the need by basically using this program to <coughs> augment funding and provide some of those people who could be served outside of the facility outside the facility. Which so, is far preferable. I mean, I've done a ride along so, in, in years but, past with our public guard. But, they're not, but, but they're not saying that, there's, that there, would, there would then be less demand for beds. And so they're basically saying this would be, I mean, you could do that, but again, the result would be um, a, uh, a reduction in the number of people who were uh, served in facilities, which is not what, the, what, uh, what mental health services is recommending. So you're really not cost avoidance. You're still maintaining beds for those who would need those in the yeah, facilities. Yeah, really, even cost avoidance, you're right, is probably not the right word. That's the word they used in the, in the growth request. But really what they're saying is this, this augmented funding would allow more people to be served. Right. And, and, and it allows you to serve more people who might otherwise, right at this very moment, be in an institution uh, who, with the proper level of support, uh, could... Uh, you be you know quasi independent or independent in the community with the support services and and having done that ride along, I can tell you how critically important that is. And granted, you know we always have a lot of demands, um, but if we have the ability to move people, uh, just you know, I use the example of IHHS. When you think about the number of folks we serve, and I asked that question earlier this morning, but a lot of those folks previously would have you know been in you know a higher level of at least uh, nursing uh, and or, or, or medical facilities and are able to stay in their home uh, to maintain that independence. And I just think it's, it's, it's really key. Now, obviously, it comes at a cost, and you're making a budget recommendation. But if we're able to, if we know we have folks out there that if we had program in place, that we could actually help them either to stay out or to get out and to be able to live independently for uh, you know <clears throat> a portion of a remainder of their lives, to me, that's just key. And you know, I would. You know, suggest to anybody if you have any idea about how that program works, do, go do a ride along and get a chance to visit some of the care assisted living facilities, but also to visit those folks in their homes. And I can just tell you that, you know, <clears throat> I, I know what I would choose for me and my family. Um, and so I, I guess I, I would just say I think that, and there's a cost associated. I mean, obviously, we looked at two workers. I guess if you had a one, you could, you know, you could do more. So uh, I'm not trying to s split it here. I, I, I think this is important. It kind of gets buried down the budget is one of those things that we do, we don't have to do, uh, but I think we should do. And uh, and I think there's some imperative here, and so I would be supportive of, uh, you know, putting a Care Plus program and putting some more uh, dedicated dollars to, to doing that. And I just think it, it it really serves people well. That's my thought. Supervisor Kenny? I agree with Supervisor Natoli. Um, the $455,000 of cost avoidance is, first of all, let's take the human component out of it and realize that this isn't all about dollars and cents, but we are here talking about budget. Um, and it's, it's a vitally important, needed program. Um, and I, I tend to think that, you know, and I'd like to really delve into it at some point, but that that $455,000 number, $440,000, thousand dollar number is low um, and doesn't take into account so many other costs the this population is some of our most expensive population to serve uh, and it goes across you know more than just 
uh, Ryan's group and Michelle's group. It goes into our jails. It goes into so you know I I think that there should be money allocated. You know perhaps you know from the sheriff's budget because it does save you know those costs. Um, and uh, as I said, this is a difficult population to serve. I can't believe that $440,000 is the complete avoided cost. <clears throat> if, I, if I could, so the, the number is 230000 to put the... The number is, the requested number is 203000 of which 100, basically 169000 would be net county cost. Okay. <clears throat> I, I, that would be the number I'd be supportive of. I'm not su suggesting where it has to come from. I think I'm going to leave that to the executive's office. But I, I think this program is important enough. And, and that, that's, a, that's a full year number or that's a nine month number, Britt? That's 170000 Sorry? It's a full year number. A full year. So for this year, we wouldn't incur all that cost. And I mean, yeah. Okay. It depends on them. I mean, if they have authority under 69, our expectation is they'll spend that 169. Well, it's, it, it, it's two positions, staff positions. So, okay. But I would, I would be interested in the 169. Yeah. I'd yeah. likewise be uh, supportive along with uh, Supervisors Kennedy and Natoli on that. Any other questions, comments on CARES? <coughs> So uh, the next item on our list is the Senior Safe House and uh, Bruce uh, Wagstaff, Deputy County Executive for Social Services will address, address that issue. Good morning. Good morning, Bruce. So uh, as Supervisor Natoli knows, we've discussed the Senior Safe House a uh, number of times. It falls within the general priority that we have for senior housing. Uh, it's one of the methods that we look at for senior housing. The safe house is primarily uh, directed towards those who have been in our adult uh, um, protective services program, adult protective services, APS program. Uh, it currently serves uh, about eight persons. Sometimes they can fit more in there, but it's roughly around eight persons. Yeah. Initially, it was donated uh, through Mercy Housing, uh, and it has an operating cost of about 500000 per year, um, half of which, as I understand it, supervisors, they achieve through donations. And that, so we cover the other half, about 250. So it's, it's um, with respect to that, so with respect to that safe house, the current one, they are at capacity. So it's really not a question of being able to add more people there. If, as we've looked at this before, if we were to consider a second one, then of course we'd have to find that location, we'd have startup costs, which could vary depending on what we actually had to do. Uh, staff have given me numbers in the range of 800,000 to up to a million, depending on what we'd have to do to find a second one. And then you'd have the operating costs if you use the current model as your standard of about 500,000 a year to serve about eight people. But as I noted, uh, this falls within the general category that we have as a priority for senior housing. And I just wanted to highlight very quickly some of the things we've done for that. Um, in particular, for those who are uh, referrals from our APS program. Um, first of all, our scattered site housing programs that are run through Department of Human Assistance. We have placed a priority on seniors, frankly, for those locations. And about half of the folks in our scattered site uh, housing are over 55. Um, we're just not that old. Um, over <laughs> had to throw that in there. Uh, over 55, but about 32 percent or so over age 60, which is not that old. Um, <laughs> you would be correct there. Uh, I got off the tangent there. Sorry. Um, so, in addition to the scattered site housing, though, also uh, Supervisor Antoli mentioned last night the Home Safe program. This is a program that we have in connection with the state. Uh, that provides APS clients with rent payments, utilities, connection to other services. We've served about 105 folks through that program in the first year of operation. And then the other thing I wanted to mention that you might recall is that when um, our planning staff have been here in conjunction with us related to the SB2 housing program, uh, that we have reserved 300000 per year for years two through six for senior housing. Uh, and we expect to hear awards announced. HCD has changed this time frame a few times, but at, at the current moment, we're expecting um, 
those awards to be announced in October. So different things going on with respect to uh, senior housing, but excuse me, I think that responds to your questions on the safe house. And I'm happy to take questions. Supervisor Frost? I'm wondering what services you provide in this home that s serves eight seniors. It seems like the ages are not that old and the, the cost is a lot higher than than what what it, it seems like it should be. It, so, um, with, so with Michelle's help, let me try to answer that. Okay. Uh, the ages that I mentioned, supervisor, were for our scatter site housing programs. It wasn't for the senior safe house per se. The senior safe house is for anybody referred from the APS program, as well as other providers throughout the county, largely through our APS program, but not exclusively. Uh, and then Michelle, the services they provide, could you provide some clarification on that? But you, but you said each house, there's a house that houses eight seniors. That's and a current the senior safe house. The cost per house is 500,000 per and, year. Correct. To maintain that business model. To maintain that facility, yes. Okay, yes. I'm curious to know what costs 500,000. So it is a 24 sorry 24 7 shelter so they are also feeding our elders uh, some of them have unique needs where they're transporting them to hospital appointments they only have if i understand correctly two 1.5 fte the rest is volunteers um, and so it's really to keep the property updated it's a beautiful property if you've not seen it specifically designed for seniors um, and and so the costs go toward serving our seniors and also helping them transition to longer term housing. And a lot of seniors have social security or disability. Or do they pay into it or is this um, fully funded by the county? Is there insurance uh, component to it? No, they're funded by 250 from our department, and then 200, or the rest, they estimate it's about 500,000. The rest comes through donations. But they don't charge folks there. I would just okay. point out that this, this is a facility inside of a neighborhood. A house was purchased by a nonprofit organization, right. mm -hmm. and the BIA and uh, others uh, uh, made all the did all the work mm -hmm. to transition it to so it's wheelchair friendly and uh, has a garden for people mm -hmm. to have some peace in and that kind of thing so um, we didn't have any startup costs in that point at, at That's right. Right. So what did it open about 15 no 10 years ago yeah something like yeah that. and it there so they have an organization that collects donations also probably the medical costs really exponent makes it exponentially higher. I know there's a lot of care homes um, that have been very successful. Um, it didn't seem like the cost was that high. So, but I, I get it. If they don't have insurance and they have no resources and the, the care for seniors gets more complicated as they get older, so. Right, right. It's, it's not, there's no funding stream that like based on how many days shelter they that yeah. then, then we can pay so okay thanks mm -hmm. supervisor Tully yeah in 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 certainly uh, supervisor Peters was a real leader in making sure that that happened uh, with the first senior safe house and compliments to her uh, it is a beautiful facility but I think it's important to note that the folks that come there are victims of abuse and neglect sometimes very serious uh, situations and, and exploitation too. Uh, exploitation, yeah, absolutely. Yep. And um, so, and they come into our system either by law enforcement referrals, medical referrals, and or our social workers, adult protective services workers, and, and and others. And the report we had going back two years ago was is that on any given day, on average, we turn away one or two referrals because we only have six or eight beds. That's right. And that hasn't really changed. Now we're doing other things, and I, again, I appreciate Bruce has participated in some meetings, and so with Michelle talking around this issue about some strategies. Uh, and these folks are literally homeless. When they are taken from wherever they're at, and whether it's in, you know, in, in their own home or in the home of a relative or a supposed caretaker, or whatever it is, and we put a lot of money towards homeless. We've talked about this as we've gotten some of these state dollars. 
And it would seem to me that having a facility uh, that um, has the, the, you know, the, the residential setting that fits well in a neighborhood, that's safe, that has the proper you know, uh, supervision uh, you know, for the care of the folks that are there, having another six beds in this county of that type makes a lot of sense. We put a lot of money towards it. And, and again, we're still going to have a need. And, I, and again, I don't discount some of the work that you, know, you referenced, Bruce, again, certainly the, the home safe. But again, that's temporary housing. And, and uh, you updated the number because of the number we had in the budget report was 29. You said 105 or, or something thereabouts. But I, I think we, ha we have the opportunity with some of the housing monies, with some of the potentially COVID monies, uh, maybe not, but at least we've had some capital monies, the SB2, we could help find and fund. And then, you know, Volunteers of America is the one who provides the services at the current uh, location. Again, we obviously have to find a partner. And I think the fact that you can pull down half of what you need to operate that facility in a given year through donations, uh, you know, is, is pretty substantive. And then, you know, again, that's, uh, and that's commendable. Obviously, our support's critical to, to maintaining that operation as well. And, and uh, so, again, the, the needs there, it, it's been there, it'll continue to be there. And I think with emergency situations, with an, as we've talked about, the aging population, uh, and, I, and I appreciate it as you ratchet up, 55 not so old, 60 not so old, 65 not so old. Um, but we have a, you know, a growing senior population, but people, adults, some of them are dependent. And uh, these situations that we're finding people in are much you know, they're, they're despicable in some cases. And I just think that having a place beyond the hospital or, you know, if it's not as serious, putting them to, you know, vouching them to a hotel or motel, which is, it may be safer, but you don't have that surrounding service and the understanding of that situation, the, the empathy goes with it. I, I, again, I just like to see us find a way to, to, you know, put the pieces together and, you know, and, 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 and not get so stuck on, well, yeah, you know, it's gonna cost this. Yeah, it's gonna cost. But I think there's there, there's there's the ability in the in the time we live right now, and with some of the funds that have been made available, if if there's a willingness to do it, there's a I think there's a way to accomplish this and to you know find community partners and to you know use the model because this model has been successful you know for well over a decade, and uh, again I'm I would like to see us you know move forward and and, and not spend so much more time talking about it to figure out a way to do it. I you know we've met several times over the past year. And we've had some interruptions, obviously, because of the the lockdown. But I, I just this is not just a a uh, you know senior residence. It's you know it's a it, it's a safe place in in emergency situations. So. Supervisor Kenny, thank you, Bruce. Um, you talked about the SB two uh, application for the three hundred thousand dollars. Just so we're on the same page, this is the. I've coined the phrase, but it's just me. The senior homeless avoidance program is that what we're talking about? I mean, well, I think it. it I think we have some flexibility on how we use those dollars, supervisor. Uh, if we assume we get the amount that we've been awarded, our plan would be through Michelle's department to work with the aging commission and figure out the best way to put it to use. But I do think we have some flexibility on how that could be put into effect. Um, you can use rental assistance, for example. That, that's, or, or, that's my point. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, me if memory serves, the actual application made reference to rental assistance as an example of how it might be used. Yeah. Uh, but I just wanted to say, I think we have some flexibility. Well, flexibility is great. I mean, this is an, an, a situation in which government has an opportunity to spend some money and save a lot of money. Um, I mean, for small amounts of money, I've heard stories of people, they just need a little gap, the seniors in particular, many of whom are on SSI, but it's tough to make it on SSI. And even as low as a couple hundred bucks a month could keep them from becoming homeless, which I think we all know that, you know, it would cost a lot more if they become homeless to the county uh, than this program. So I want to thank you for pursuing it. Thank you. Uh, before we leave the topic of the senior care, uh, safe house, since Supervisor Tully uh, kind of raised this, this issue, is there, a, is there a dollar figure that you're keyed on? The, and again, you know, there would be some work around it, but if we identified some, some dollars, and again, I think there's some potential matches out there to, 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 to work on this. Um, I guess I'd like to start with 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 three hundred thousand uh, dollars to uh, appropriate to allow us to advance and maybe use that as 
a stand up uh, to see if we can seek out some matches. I mean, it, as, as Supervisor Peters said, there was cooperation from the you know, building industry and others uh, on the uh, other facility, and you know, obviously you have the site identification, and then you have some ongoing costs, which would still be in the realm of this board's uh, authority for consideration. But if we had that as a, a start, I think it allows us, as we've had a conversation with Area 4 and, uh, and other parties, I know there's a, there actually is a, uh, a nonprofit that, um, uh, you know, uh, Maxine Krugman and others are involved with, and, and uh, you know, to really begin the, the conversation and talking with, you know, some of the folks who are actually providing those services now and maybe using some of the dollars that are available through other sources. Obviously, I don't think we have all those answers this morning, the, today, but um, I think this is, you know, worthwhile. And if we, once we do it, then I think we're going to find out that there's folks that are willing to step up and be our partners in this. So that's what I'd like to start with. 300,000. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. The next item on our list is a question regarding CRF funds, how much was allocated, contracted, spent, um, and I, I think we have the ability to do an overhead, uh, and so I know it's an archaic technology, but <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Let's see if we can avoid the runaway zoom. <laughs> so we, uh, my office uh, worked uh, yeah. very uh, quickly with the departments to try and summarize where we are and there's a lot of stuff on here so let me try and give you a general idea of what you're seeing here. So this does not include the 45 million that you allocated and I will address that in the interest of transparency but it does include the 32.9 million that was in the original uh, revised recommended budget either from the coronavirus relief fund itself, funded directly from that money, or from net county costs that was made available because of the money that was freed up um, and so used to fund that. So you see there's a total of 32.9 million, 15.5 million of that is essentially net, is net county costs, is funded with net county costs, and 17.5 million is funded directly with CRF revenue. And you can see uh, which departments, the largest allocation of course is to health services, 23.4 million, uh, DCFAS with 6.9 million um, and then uh, human assistance with 2.3 million and then some really quite small amounts for some of the other departments. So um, what we've identified here if you go over to the fifth column uh, you will see uh, is the amount that has been contracted or encumbered and out, so out of the 32.9 million um, 25.7 million has been uh, contracted or encumbered not necessarily spent uh, and uh, and uh, so the most significant amount is obviously in health services, uh, 19.8 million. Then in again in uh, DCFAS uh, with 3.5 uh, 3.5 million, um, uh, uh, and then in uh, human assistance uh, with uh, 2.3 million dollars. Uh, and so that leaves about $7.2 million that has not yet been contracted. Uh, again, the largest, amount, the largest amount that's not been contracted is in DCFAS. They basically entered into a contract for uh, half of the amount of the Dine in Home Sacramento program that they've been allocated. They are preparing another contract to come back for approval to, uh, to uh, continue that program, but that contract has not yet been approved. And then the, the remaining, most of the remaining amount is in health services, again, where they've entered into contracts uh, for a number of things, but there's still about 3.5 million that is not yet contracted for or encumbered in health services in a variety of areas, including contract tracing um, uh, and a variety of other uh, areas. And then the final, the next to final column is the amount that's actually been spent. So spent as of yesterday as uh, $13 million. Um, that includes uh, uh, 11 million dollars in health services, 2 million in uh, DCFAS, and smaller amounts in other areas. With the remaining amount that's actually not spent, and I need to uh, need to be careful about this because the departments wanted me to emphasize here that that's not that they haven't received the bills yet. But that doesn't mean some of this may not actually have been incurred because the bills obviously come in monthly or whenever they come in. So some of this may not actually be unspent, but literally not out the door as of yesterday was $19.9 million. 
By far the largest part is in health services where they've about 12.3 million that literally hasn't been spent out the door yet, uh, about um, 4.9 million in DCFAS and the full 2.3 million in human assistance um, and then some fairly small amounts in other areas. Um, and then just, uh, just for transparency purposes, the, there is the $45 million that your board has allocated. Um, about, uh, of that amount, about $17.2 million has been uh, either, con you know, a, uh, there's a contract encumbrance for, uh, but only about $1.6 million has literally been spent. So there's still uh, about $43 million, or there's still a substantial amount of um, uh, about $43 million in money that hasn't yet actually been spent there. Basically it, since, the, since the 19th. When we yeah, were, basically yeah. right, which you would expect, right? Yeah. So. Um, that's in summary where that's the answer to that question. Okay, before we get to a uh, question or comment by Supervisor Kennedy, I just want to make sure I understand that um, of the universe of the 32.9 million, the, um, the answer to the question how much of that is uh, currently um, left at the discretion of the board to reprogram if we so choose is 7.2? No, I would say it's really closer to 19 million okay. because you can always cancel the contract. I mean, really, until it's actually spent, you have the ability okay. not to spend it. But yes, I think in a way, if, you're, if, you, if you don't want to get into canceling contracts, yes, then it would be about 7.2 million. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Kenny? Yeah, thank you so much for this. This is extremely helpful. Um, just as a clarification, because I hear different things from different people. We talk about being spent. Um, does that mean, I mean, I've also heard that uh, services have to be delivered by them. Which one? So this, this simply means that we've received an invoice and paid them. Okay. That's what spent But do means. We, we don't risk, if, if we've received an invoice and paid it, but we haven't provided the services, do we risk losing that money? If we, I mean, we, we wouldn't treasury, pay them if we didn't receive yeah. the services. I mean, unless we, it, I, there may be some advances in this, I don't know, but so, typically we wouldn't so pay them. So your definition we, of being invoiced and then paid is they received the services? Um, well, I, I mean, I, it is possible there could be advances uh, in here. No, there's no, it has to be spent. So when we get them, there has to be an invoice that shows what was the money spent on, then we write the check for it. Okay, right. so just wanted that clarification. Yeah. Right. Okay, any further questions for Britt on this? No, this is helpful. Uh, Supervisor Frost. I just w wanna make sure that I understand that we're still gonna come to the question of economic recovery. That's, that's the next question. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Peters. I'm, I'm wondering if the clerk could get us a paper copy of this. Yeah. I, have, I have paper copies, sorry. Oh, wow. good for you. That's really archaic. <laughs> well, I'm assuming this they're, is going to not disappear in a though. moment. <laughs> not handwritten. <sighs> Thanks, Brad. Okay. Thank um, so uh, then, as uh, as Mr. Gill indicated, the next item on our list is uh, economic recovery, environmental management, and economic development. Uh, and uh, Troy Div Givens, director of economic development, uh, will be uh, addressing the board <laughs> on this issue. Thank you, Britt. Good morning. Morning. Yes, still morning. Um, before I start, I want to uh, just give an indication that I'm here as the economic development representative, but w this represents work from multiple different departments, including in the Public Works Agency, as well as a heavy lift from the Environmental Management Department and other departments as well. As it relates to small business support, we've done a variety of different things at the county, including a uh, building permit and planning department uh, permit extensions, business license payment extensions, uh, fee deferrals and rent deferrals for small businesses located at the airport, uh, temporary use permits. We were the first jurisdiction within the county to um, allow for restaurants to move outdoor dining as well as other uh, traditional indoor businesses to move outdoors as well. Uh, we've distributed personal protective equipment through the Office of Emergency Services to both jurisdictions as well as uh, individual businesses throughout the county as well. Uh, and we've recently started the Business Navigator Program 
um, which provides direct assistance uh, in complying with the public health order focused on underserved communities um, throughout the unincorporated area of Sacramento County. As you're aware, the Environmental Management Department covers uh, both environmental health, which includes restaurants, mobile food trucks, commissaries, farmers markets, grocery stores, uh, and an environmental compliance division, which covers manufacturing operations, dry cleaners, auto repair, gas stations, chemical storages, and retail facilities as well. So it covers a broad spectrum throughout the county in both the unincorporated areas and within the cities as well. So they've been primarily focused on providing businesses with COVID-19 guidance, uh, offering assistance with complying with the public health order, as well as identifying business sectors that might require additional hands-on uh, assistance as well. So through this efforts and through the $45 million that uh, was allocated from your board a couple of weeks ago, $3 million of that has been allocated to EMD to continue these efforts along with other county departments in support of that, including my department and others, um, where we have, will be conducting a series of webinars. They have started those already. Um, be doing social media outreach as well as individual business assistance and compliance. As we move through this, a lot of this information has been translated into multiple different um, languages as well, recognizing that that might be of assistance to small business. Um, so I'd like to give a big shout out to Marie's group for doing that as well. Um, and there's a recognition, obviously, that this may not stop at the end of the year, so we'll be continuing to flex and figure out how we do this. Going forward, when you tally all that up, it will be uh, in excess of three and a half million, between three and a half million and four million dollars. Okay, any questions for Troy, Supervisor Frost? I'm not sure if this is a question. It might be a, a comment or a request. Um, I first wanted to focus on um, the small businesses and the, the letter that we received from, you know, the outlying uh, cities, the mayors, and also we received this morning a letter from Metro Chamber that kind of summarized what some of the other counties are doing to assist with economic recovery, and it's. Uh, Sue, so before you hurry, could I ask, put your presentation on the overhead so we can. I don't have specific notes uh, as far as a number. I'm not okay. sure. Would have been good to have okay. it. Okay, so sorry, I didn't, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to see it. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I, I think. It's hard to know where to start, but uh, here's what I um, what I'm bringing uh, bringing out. Uh, I have experienced with the small business. The small businesses represent the engine that um, creates revenues that um, flow not only to the community, creates jobs, creates tax revenues, sales tax revenues. It, it's uh, part of that chain that kind of got. Um, stopped when the wheel of the economy got stopped and they're um, they're out there in the streets and they're suffering with unique challenges I got a, a call from one of my constituents who owns a hair salon and she's trying to get her her um, hairstylists to come back to work and they're not sure they should come back to work because they don't know if the governor is going to shut it back down again and so her challenge is she needs them to come back to work so that she can pay her rent. And um, a lot of the property owners have, during this time, basically just said, don't worry about your rent. Don't worry about it. We'll just close it down and we'll figure it out later. Um, there are people who have negotiated themselves out of an existing lease after spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to Capital improve for capital improvement to get a restaurant or something started, and they've paid to get out. And I think the point that I'm making is that the business community now is trying to hang on, um, and they represent something unique. Um, first of all, this budget we're balancing with a, a boatload of one-time money, and so um, while our focus is to um, maintain. Um, programs and not lay off county employees. 
I think that by investing in the small business community and economic recovery with some of the CARES Act money would be a way to prop up uh, potential or, or, or reduce potential losses in the future to the county by way of property taxes, sales tax, you know, all of that. It's a way to, to help us come back faster. And obviously there are other counties who, who see that. Um, I know that all the, all, all, all the other areas are vital. I mean, they're, the public health is vital. There, there are a lot of people suffering right now, but the, the businesses are vital to the community. The community can't wait to get out and go to a restaurant. But the businesses had to change their whole business model. Some of them are now doing food so they can serve their, you know, their beer. Uh, you know, and some of them have moved outdoors and spent a lot of money to re repurpose their parking lot. And I, so I, I guess I would like to see us redirect some of the CARES Act money, a, a good chunk of it. And I think a, a good way to direct that money would be to economic recovery by way of rent and um, a, um, mortgage assistance for small business owners who um, to just uh, give them a leg up to help them, you know, help them with the uh, hang on longer or help them come back, um, help them to restart. Some of them are in bankruptcy now and they can't get the loan to restart their business. <laughs> so now they're, they've lost everything and they can't get going again. But I think a good place, I think we need to invest, uh, you know, I'm, I'm asking for 20 million. I think we should redirect some of the money uh, to economic development throughout the county that will help small the small business community hang on and uh, come back and, and potentiate uh, economic recovery and shore up our future revenues that we'll be thinking about in the coming year or two. Supervisor Tully. <clears throat> yeah, well thanks Troy for presentation and I think that certainly, you know, the outline that you, you know, spoke to, again, we led the way in some respects and obviously you have um, done <clears throat> complimentary work to what the cities have done, but with the communication we received both from the, you know, the uh, six mayors and then obviously we had a second letter from city of Ranch Cordova, um, there is this focus, uh, certainly uh, uh, Supervisor Frost spoke to it, um, on recovery. And it would seem to me that we might be, um, in a in good position to sit down with our uh, representatives from our you know our our cities. Uh, there are six of them assigned here. Obviously, even the you know there are seven cities in this county, and to talk about you know maybe a coordinated approach. Recognize obviously the unincorporated area uh, is you know where we have businesses that you know depend upon uh, you know county. Uh, for permitting and in entitlements and, and, and oversight, but obviously EMD has that for all the cities. But it, again, there, you know, there's not unlimited dollars here, uh, but there, I think there are there are a range of possibilities, and some of them are suggested uh, by colleagues here. Um, I don't know what all those are, and I think you know, recovery um, can be, you know months if not years if if ever in some cases i think that's obviously some of the fears here is that some of the folks are now getting so deep that they're you know going to be unable to to recover um, at least in their current uh you know business uh, model and so i don't know if you've got any thought to that or you've had conversations i know you talk with brethren and, and colleagues in, in in other cities and we've been strategizing on that and we we will be reaching out to our counterparts in the cities within the county because I, I think knowing the approaches and having some ability to you know obviously you have a committee that, you know, and you know nav and others uh, participate in but i think here um and again you know hearing from some of our chambers with business groups but certainly the city representatives who've you know written to us as as colleagues uh to have you know beyond you know the benefit you have of you know having those discussions have some conversation and you know i'm not settled on any particular amount of money uh again recognizes unlimited but there may be a way to help at least some of these folks uh, in some of the areas where they have greatest need, and and uh, it may be you know it, it may be some uh, assistance uh, in the form of some uh, 
uh, monetary assistance or maybe other things uh, that you already alluded to. And I don't know how, how widely known that is. I think when people are struggling day to day just to you know, make sure the key still works in the, in the lock in the door <clears throat> if they're a tenant and so forth, they may not be thinking about some of the other things that you know well, could provide benefit, but they're not even turning a dollar right now in order to, to cover any of the costs or very little of those costs. So, you know, I, I'm very interested in this, and I and again I appreciate the appeal from our colleagues, uh, and I think we're all kind of grappling with the same thing. And certainly, this is not unique to Sacramento County or to this region, uh, states throughout the nation, and probably the world in some cases. But I just um, I think that you know if we're prudent about the way we apply our Resources uh, and and uh, you know, come up with a plan that maybe is coordinated. Maybe different different jurisdictions. You know, we but we have some resources I think available to us to make those decisions. Uh, again, I'm not prepared necessarily to settle on a dollar amount today, but I I'd l like us to you know maybe move post haste on this to see what we can do to. Um, again, some of these have limitations. We have the ability to reprogram in them, so maybe we could do something to even when we do come out of lockdown or get into a different tier as it relates to the, some of the. Uh, uh, orders that are in place that don't even allow business to even consider opening right now. Thanks. Thank you. Supervisor Kennedy. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Troy. Um, as Supervisor Peters said, since we don't have it in front of us, I was trying to take notes and all that. But bottom lining, um, did you say that we've done 3.5 to 4 million dollars in small business assistance we will do three and a half to four million dollars worth of small business assistance all combined with the emd dollars that have been programmed through uh the last 45 million tranche right. that the board took action on as well as the navigator program and some of the other activities right. okay and um that doesn't include the dine at home sacramento which also has an economic development component to it that's correct I emd mean, has been very involved in that Correct. So, so you could actually right. add that, add some of that in there. And That's six, six, and then a six point nine there. Yeah, yeah six point nine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Supervisor Frost. I just want to reiterate uh, and say that when we feed economic recovery, we are feeding revenues that are going to pay for these programs on, on an ongoing basis. The fact that we are balancing our budget with one-time money means at some point, if the money doesn't come someone's going to be cut and we don't want to make those decisions i think our priority right now for this budget should be to feed economic recovery it's like um, we can give them a fish or we can teach them how to fish uh, we need to build strength in the community and prop them up prop up the businesses thanks thank you okay thank you um so I think everyone will recall that I, I was the one that asked for this breakdown in terms of the, the balance of um, CRF and uh, again very helpful um, I also mentioned last night that there may not be, may be some non monetary adjustments to the activities that especially EMD might be able to uh, take on in terms of reducing the cost uh, associated with um, you know what what they do especially relative to to restaurants um, and I don't know if that's already been um, implemented or not but it's I think it's something that should be uh, I know Marie be, has deferred fees, be but I'll let her speak to that she has a program surprise her but she can give more details okay and even augmenting on that that's what she, she can augment more on that okay great thank you Hello, Morning. Chair Serna and board members. Marie Wooden with Environmental Management Department. Yes, um, we have been dealing with this pandemic and we are very sympathetic to the businesses that we oversee and regulate. We've been providing assistance with guidance on how to comply with the state health officer's order and to avoid penalties from the state strike force that has been in our community checking on businesses. They were in downtown Midtown and our restaurants did pass their inspection checks without penalty. So we feel we're being successful at least providing them with guidance. Regarding their fees, what we've done is we've modified the inspection in that we are focusing on more high risk type of violations. And the violations that are more minor or can be delayed in correction, we are 
Im Im Imposing those, which is like, for example, if you have to replace flooring or equipment, we can delay those type of corrections. We are not a general fund department, so we cannot just waive their fees. The ones that are struggling, um, and we, right now our count is about, I would say about 300, either out of business or they're temporarily closed, and that number is changing. Our inspectors are telling us that the PPP loans that they have received, when they run out, they're probably gonna close their doors. The smoke right now is not helping their situation because people do not wanna go out to dine out and eat ash. So I have heard that an assembly member is talking to the governor's office to try to get a variance for this smoke type situation so they can go inside. I was gonna have a conversation with the California Restaurant Association to see if they're working on that. What we're also doing is trying to put work with them and put them on a payment plan and waive the penalty for a late fee. The other thing we're doing is if they're d temporarily closed, for instance, like the movie theaters have been closed since March, that we will extend their payment based on the date that they've been temporarily shut down. So those are things that we can do for them. I don't have any grant money to give them. We're just trying to work with them the best that we can and answer their questions. We're trying to work with even the agritourism in Supervisor Natoli's district, he had Fog Willow Farms. There is no state guidance for a pumpkin patch. So we had to wrestle with that. We were able to find some guidance in some other states, the state of Washington, even New York. So we applied those, those COVID mitigation principles to agritourism and successfully helped him open his farm back up. So we're trying the best we can um, we work closely with public health, and as Troy said, we are working with Economic Development, their Business Environmental Resource Center, to try to get messaging out, to try to answer the questions in the other outlying cities. So Rancher Cordova is always calling us, can this facility remain open? We try to work with them based on the state guidance and try to make it work. So thank you for that. Um, you mentioned that you don't have a, a grant to offer. Um, Hypothetically, if you did have a source of funding, and I don't know if it would be couched as a grant necessarily, but if you had something to actually provide some direct uh, financial assistance, <coughs> where, how would that be, a, be applied in the world at EMD? I guess it would be like case by case, um, maybe how long they've been shut down, because the different phases or these now are into tiers. So there's different sectors that have been impacted. Like let's say body art, they've been shut down and I think they were allowed to open maybe a week or two weeks and they were shut down again. Restaurants, unfortunately, they have been like a yo-yo. Um, they were allowed to go in, they ramped up, they hired all their employees, bought their food only to be shut down by the state health officer. I guess Oregon. what I'm asking is, would, mm -hmm. would you take, would you take uh, the, the funding and apply it towards buying down the cost of fees, buying down the cost of penalties, what would you, how would you actually use it? For us, we would probably use it to subsidize fees. Okay. That's all I can do. Okay, all right, thank you. A question. Sup Supervisor Frost and then Supervisor Peters. Well, I just wanted to say, I, I know restaurants are at, at, on our mind, but I, I have other people on my mind, um, retail, uh, hairdressers, there's all kinds of businesses that are struggling um, because they can't pay their rent and, and more. I, I just hope we're not, I, I will hope we're going to fund uh, economic recovery across the board. Supervisor Peters. A, a, a question for you that is not in your jurisdiction, so you may not know what the parameters are, but I've been reading that. Um, the state of New York is, or, or maybe it's just Manhattan, I don't know, is reopening their uh, restaurants soon at 25% capacity, indoor dining, I assume because the weather's about, to, hopefully, going to change. Is What conditions allow them to be able to do that? When we go to the red tier, we're in the purple tier right now, so they're not allowed, 
they can't go inside. That's the state, state of New York is what I'm... Oh, so. New York, probably because of their caseloads, they were able to get their numbers down. Um, so it's whatever their state agency, public health department is allowing them to do, probably based on their numbers and their caseload of COVID and death rate. Okay, well, maybe it's a question for Dr. Bielenson to right. compare the two. Thank you. Okay, any further question or comment for EMD? Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Troy. Thank So the next uh, issue on uh, our list is the uh, mental health crisis center expansion issue, uh, law enforcement drop-off that was raised. And uh, Ryan Quist, uh, the Deputy Director of Health Services for Behavioral Health, will address that issue. But before we have Dr. Quist come up, you did send out an email detailing how much the extra cost will be for expansion in the hours. I'm sorry? You did send out an email that showed if you were to expand what the hours, what the monetary cost is. You want to go over that? I don't, I'm not aware of that. Mm -hmm. I can, I can. Yeah, okay. I'll have uh, Ryan do it. The mobile unit? Yeah, he, it's a question that Supervisor not Candy. Not last night anyway. No, Supervisor Candy had asked a question and we sent out just as background that we, if we were to expand the hours, how much would that end up costing? But I thought Britt had done it, but Dr. Quist can do it. Okay. <clears throat> All right, good afternoon, morning. Almost. Um, Almost. Ryan Quist, Behavioral Health. Uh, so. I had it, do you want to go to mobile crisis support teams first? I had it in a slightly different order. Um, Supervisor Kennedy asked for some information um, regarding our number of beds uh, within within the county. So I, I was going to start there. Is that OK? All right. Um, and, and let me just say that this was in direct response to a, a caller who seemed to think that we have no services for homeless people. <laughs> So, and I mean, I mean, for mental mental uh, health people. Yeah, yes. there, there was feedback around not having enough beds because at, at one point the county reduced the number of beds at right. the treatment center, and right. there was concern about that. And we at that point we did reduce beds. Um, it was we, but we still have 50 beds there. Um, since then, we have also uh, we have county controlled beds in our psychiatric hospital facilities. We have two psychiatric hospital facilities um, that are already open with another 32 beds. Then we have another psychiatric hospital facility that's opening, knock on wood, hopefully in January. So that would be another 16 beds. Um, and then here in the uh, county of Riverside, we have three large freestanding psychiatric- You, you mean Sacramento. Sacramento. What did I say? Riverside. Riverside. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I haven't night. slipped on that for a long Better time. Two years. <laughs> I'm so sorry. But he's good at community. there's a hint right there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I haven't slipped on that for a while. Sorry about that. It's okay. Here in Sacramento County, we have three large free you, you, you can use free lack, lack of sleep, Ryan, for as an excuse. Everybody can, so you're good. <laughs> so sorry. Three large freestanding psychiatric hospitals with a total of see now I can't even see. Three hundred and three hundred and sixty. 66 beds. So we have lots of beds here in Sacramento County. Um, we have one more psychiatric hospital that's coming on board uh, maybe around January-ish with another approximately 120 beds. So lots of beds. Um, one of the, well, I do commonly hear the feedback that we heard both from the sheriff yesterday as well from the caller that um, there's concerns because they don't have some place to take uh, you know, uh, in real time, they don't have an alternative to not calling 911 in order to call law enforcement or emergency services. Um, my, my redirection on that one is that we did um, invest here in Sacramento County, we didn't reinvest in uh, urgent care center uh, funded by MHSA innovation funds. Um, the the accurate feedback on that that we've received over the time is that it's a really great service it helps folks a lot but it's only open from 10 a.m to 10 p.m so it has limited um uh, limited hours we did include in the growth request um, some expansion to the urgent care clinic in order to provide uh, additional uh, capacity at that at that site so did, 
were those the main topics that you wanted me to cover? Uh, yeah, um, just some, for some clarification, those larger numbers, the 366 and the 120, are those um, private insurance, or is that, or is there a mix? It's a mix. Okay. And they'll be they'll be county Sacramento County as well as other county. Right. And does did in those numbers did it include what we're what we've done with dignity up at uh, San Juan? That that is not a psychiatric hospital, but we do have a CSU there. It's CSU, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I mean, so my point is, is that you know I, I take umbrage when people call in and say we're not doing anything to help people with mental health issues. So yeah, thank you. Could I could I just follow up on that, Patrick? Um, what we've found in the past is that the information for if a person is being picked up for transport and they don't know where to take them is that there's not a good connection between let's say a deputy and uh, a lo you know a phone number of a, where can I take this person they may take it to a place that's already full uh, take a person not a, it uh, take a person uh, oh, so that connection of where they can be taken is missing and uh, I, I you might look into that in we do have as common conception um, yeah, that was one of your other questions yeah. was to reference that we have our um, law enforcement hotline that's available through the treatment center where law enforcement can call and get a consult when we're not in COVID, um, they... Is that 24-7? It's 24-7. Okay. Well, maybe you need to get the word out again. Uh, we, we try to. We try to. Every time this well. um, concern comes up, we remind them. So, definitely. Um, uh, so, the, d before COVID, they would be able to actually link them directly into, into our county-operated uh, intake stabilization unit. Um, with COVID, we did have to make some modifications to that, as all congregate living situations have. Um, just like skilled nursing homes, it's a very dangerous place in terms of the spread of COVID. And so they are now requiring uh, COVID-positive tests, which they can obtain by going to an emergency department. That was my presentation on that part of it. President Tolley? Yeah, just Ron, I want to follow up on it just a little bit. So <clears throat> the protocol in the last six months has been that <clears throat> if they have, <clears throat> if they're transporting someone, they, they have to take, they Excuse are now required. Me. Supervisor Tolley, I've been uh, informed that we're off the air again. Oh, okay. So we'll go ahead and take a 10-minute uh, recess. Well, maybe we try and resolve the issue. Why don't we go to lunch? It's 12 o'clock. All right, uh, why don't we uh, break for lunch then for an hour. We'll uh, resume. Uh, hopefully the technical problems will be uh, solved by one o'clock. Sorry about that, Ryan. <laughs> okay, I'd like to call back to order this meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors for Thursday, September 10th, 2020. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll and establish the form? Yes, good afternoon. Supervisors Frost? Here. Kennedy? Here. Natoli? Here. Peters? Here. Cerna? Here. You have a quorum. Great, thanks. And again, apologize to those that were uh, watching. We had some technical difficulties, but we're back online. So we're going to resume where we left off. Uh, I believe we were on the subject of mental health. All right, good afternoon. This is Ryan Quist, Behavioral Health. And then did Supervisor Natoli, did you have a question? <clears throat> I did. Um, <clears throat> I also have Supervisor Peters in the queue, too. So. Yeah. Right. Let me move my notes here. I'm not so sure what I was going to ask at the time. So. Let me go to Supervisor yeah. no, well, no, Peters. Like, yeah. so, you know, that's right. That's a good imagine. Supervisor Peters. Uh, Ryan, I, um, we went off the air just as I was evidently, just as I was asking you a question about where the deputies should take uh, homeless individuals that they pick up. and. Um, I thought our exchange was a little garbled, so I want to make sure. Uh, I want you to tell us again how many beds are available. And then um, I also want to discuss uh, getting a memorandum out to, or whatever order you call it, um, to the sheriff's department and, the de and the, all the chiefs so they can explain it to their um, uh, patrol officers because my understanding is that right now the individuals they pick up are delivered to Kaiser Morse 
Kaiser has uh, two, at least two deputy sheriffs that have been hired to handle the situation there that can get heated sometimes. And then they discharge them into the parking lot where the uh, deputies have to follow up. So, uh, but they seem to think that's their only place. So I, I think there isn't uh, good communication there as I s was talked about. And, uh, I, I, the phone number is fine, but I think uh, it's kind of a regular thing that you all ought to do uh, and communicate in writing because there's always new people in these large departments. So um, I just think that's very important to do because you've got beds scattered all over the county. So uh, why don't you run through the number of beds again and their locations if you've still got your notes with you and then uh, plan to put them in a memorandum uh, you know, within the next week or so. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that recommendation on the memorandum. Um, so the county uh, operates 50 beds at the treatment center. <clears throat> we have uh, two psychiatric hospital facilities that are county controlled with 16 beds each. We have another psychiatric hospital facility coming online hopefully in January with another 16 beds. Is that the one on Auburn Boulevard? Um, no, no. Okay. I'm not sure. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. And then, uh, and then we have we also have three crisis residential programs, which I don't think I mentioned last time, with 15 to 16 beds each. And we have two more crisis residential programs coming online um, relatively soon, um, before the end of the year, I'm hoping. Uh, and then, in terms of our large freestanding psychiatric hospitals, there's three of them, with a grand total of 366 beds. And then we have another psychiatric hospital that's coming on board. This one, I do know where it's at. It's by near Expo. Um, it's bringing on approximately 120 beds. So uh, a, a deputy who picks up a homeless individual could take those individuals to any one of those locations? Um, right now, in COVID era, probably not. I think they need uh, well, let's a health screening. Hopefully, COVID isn't going to be with us forever. But so I want to separate those two. Mm -hmm. uh, th they typically need a health clearance. So typically, it would need to go to an emergency department first. So it, and is it just one hospital, one emergency? No, any emergency department. Okay. Um, we also have our urgent care, which we're, we're, we're talking about the unincorporated area here because that's who the deputy sheriffs where mm -hmm. they work. So is it just one hospital in the unincorporated area? Um, where are the other hospitals? Um, I'm trying to think. Well, there's Mercy San Juan, there's yeah. uh, Kaiser, there's down south, there's used to be called Methodist. That's I'm a, not, yeah, yeah. Dignity, dignity That's Methodist. A, yeah. Um, and then Dignity has, is that one in the city? That one's in the city, I think. So well, it's. I think the procedures need to be laid out in this memo. You okay. Know, and, and, and where the deputies can deliver people. And then what happens when they get out of the hospital? Does the hospital put them in a taxi to go to a psychiatric facility or does somebody pick them up or what's, how does so that work? If they go into an emergency room, they get assessed for whatever's going on. Some of them, they may just need to sleep off whatever substance they're on. Um, in those instances, they might be released. If they, need, if they need a psychiatric bed, then they would be coordinating with any of these facilities that we're talking about. What's the difference between those two th issues? Most emergency rooms are attached to a general acute hospital, with, and for some reason, they don't have psychiatric beds, which is something that I advocate that we, we want to get our hospitals to have psychiatric beds so that I can bill, bill Medi-Cal so that I don't have to spend our inpatient budget twice as fast. So that's something constantly okay. talking so, to hospitals so about. So somebody comes in and they need to sleep, they're looked at, they, they need to sleep it off versus someone who's got serious psychiatric issues. How can you tell if someone's out of it on drugs and alcohol? A medical professional would do that assessment. They can tell the difference? Yeah. Okay. If I can follow up, don't, don't all the emergency rooms now have uh, navigators for this purpose? Yes, we have, uh, we have county funded positions at a, uh, a lot of our, okay, almost so all then our. Let's get back to how do they get from the emergency room to a psychiatric hospital if they fall into that category? Through a medical transport. Okay, so the hospital puts them in medical transport and they go to a psychiatric hospital. Okay. Correct. I don't suppose you have any idea what percentage 
are uh, told to sleep it off, uh, quote unquote, um, compared to those who go to a psychiatric hospital. I don't. I don't have access to the emergency room data, so it's not something we fund, and so consequently, I I don't get that data. I get the data on the ones that end up at the psychiatric hospitals. Okay. All right. Well, I think it's very important to get this information out, and that it ought to be on some, you know, once a year you send it out update. <clears throat> Thank you. That's a good you know, recommendation. People get contract. Our companies get contracts and lose contracts, it's, uh, and new beds come on, et cetera. Thank, Thank you. you. Supervisor Frost. <clears throat> Ryan, I was just uh, asking before, I, right after the internet went down, I was asking for a list of the facilities and the, all the hospital beds, mental health hospital beds we have, and I'm wondering if you can also um, indicate how many beds for seriously mentally ill versus because some of those are not seriously mentally ill, right? If they're in a psychiatric emergency, then they are in a psychiatric emergency, regardless of whether or not they have a chronic uh, serious mental illness or not. So they would still be able to utilize our psychiatric hospitals. But they're not, it's, it's for short-term stays or long-term stay? Hopefully short-term stays. Or whatever's uh, necessary? Whatever's necessary. Okay. So all of them could be seriously mentally ill. All of them. Uh, there are people who will have a, a panic attack of some kind that might go to the emergency room, um, might have uh, um, an episode of having anxiety that might need to go to a psychiatric hospital, but then might not be in the category of a serious mental illness, which would be oh, more okay. of a chronic condition. OK, great. I'll look forward to that. Thank you. I was just having trouble wrapping my head around all the numbers that you threw out. So thank you. Thank you. And I'll put the, phone, the, the hotline number for our law enforcement hotline is 916-875-1170. That should be on your memo. Yep. <clears throat> gotcha. <laughs> There's a memo involved here in case you right. didn't get that. I got it. Right. Supervisor Natoli. <clears throat> and I think it's important, we, you know, we certainly heard from folks uh, who identify with the Sheriff's Department, but to, to the point there are seven cities in this county and, and a couple are served by the Sheriff's Department uh, under contract, but the remainder have their own police. And so it's important, again, there's change in personnel with their chiefs, with their lead folks, and not all the folks come from the unincorporated area of the county. And so I think uh, Ryan is going to you know, require um, us beyond putting together a memo that might go to the sheriff's command staff, but make sure and we have the proper contacts with those cities, and that needs to be kept current. I mean, I think it's so very important, and the question I was going to ask you before the break, I, Supervisor Peters covered most of it, was just kind of this um, more indirect approach to actually, you know, making sure that the, the folks are, one, properly evaluated, but that upon discharge that they're not just, you know, set loose in the parking lot or if we don't have enough beds, you know, what happens? And then obviously it certainly has its impact upon the, uh, the hospital facilities, but I think the frustration that obviously uh, law enforcement, maybe social workers and others as well, and trying to get, you know, making, you know, the uh, proper connections. <clears throat> and when we had central intake, and I was going to ask you also that with you said we had to change our protocols so that uh, our intake was now requiring somebody to go to the emergency room before you would actually admit them to the to the mental health center, the beds that we do have there. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, they're they're asking for a, a negative COVID test right now. And and and, and they can get that immediately. Or they got to wait 14 days? No. Um, and I'm being facetious. This is a recent thing that we did, and as a part yeah. of um, the uh, $13.5 million that you approved for testing, Dr. Bielinson, uh was extremely supportive of behavioral health and included uh, um, a, a pool of tests that are specifically for behavioral health purposes. And um, one of the pools of money within that is specifically for rapid tests to facilitate any transitions um, from one facility to another. In including initial admittance to including a facility. Including initial admittance. So, but they could be at the hospital for a couple days? I mean, we don't get, you know, some tests, I guess, are almost on demand. Or can you get a, do you get a test within hours? What, what does it require? If you get somebody who's in, the, you know, in this transitional state, uh, 
and they're trying to figure that out, they're at the hospital emergency room, how long does it take, and, and who authorizes that test being done? Um, a lot of, most of the emergency rooms currently have a rapid test. Um, we hear that typically they're able to get done in two to six hours. Okay. Um, that's what we're hearing. Uh, sometimes there's shortages of those rapid tests though, and so this additional pool of rapid tests will be able to help um, supplement. We don't want to replace their existing testing out there, but we do want to supplement when it's necessary to facilitate movement between facilities. And if you could just, and you ran through it pretty quickly, what was the, the, the bed count? You talked about this unit, that unit 15 here, 20 there. I thought you said 100 somewhere, but. Um. Um, the, the freestanding psychiatric hospitals have a grand total of 366. That's where we're buying thousands of bed, bed days every year? Those 366 um, aren't all ours. Those are shared with private pay as well as other counties in the area. Yeah, but we're paying $25, $30 million a year for, we are. for occupying those beds there. Yeah, and so our focus there has been on um, front door, back door, uh, back door options for placement. So we've uh, increased our access. We have a contract now for adult residential treatment, which would be a step down. Where it, goes, it goes psychiatric hospital down to a mental health rehabilitation center, and that's all we had before. And there's a shortage of mental health rehabilitation center beds. So now we have another level of adult residential treatment and another level of augmented boarding care. <clears throat> and this is where you have somebody that actually brings them to be admitted or to be evaluated or both. But, and again, I know you're going to be reporting back on the mobile crisis support teams. We talked quite a bit about that last night, and, and I don't want to get ahead of anybody's responses here. But um, if you're able to triage the situation in the field uh, and negate having to actually transport, let alone admit, and then maybe transport to another location. Um, you certainly want to have a proper evaluation and, and, and not leave people stranded without services. But I mean, it would seem to me there's a compliment, and, and, and I get a picture as you've described it, of kind of how the system works out there. There's points of connection, but there's also a lot of, and I kind of take this from a couple of other comments by my colleagues here, there's a lot of potential for disconnecting too uh, if you're you know if you're the law enforcement officer maybe even you're a, you know a, you know a, you know a social worker whatever you may have certain resources available and knowledge to you but um, I don't know how everybody plugs into all that and while you're dealing with you know these situations probably in a very constant pace um, is, is there any kind of, is there any central you said there's a hotline number for for law enforcement but is that available to others I mean when, is it just it's a law enforcement, so all the police departments have that. They all know that. Uh, CHP knows that. I mean, the agencies all. And, and, and who's the person that you have a live operator 24-7 that, that answers that? Who is it? It's uh, staff at the Mental Health Treatment Center. Okay, so it is 24-7 and 365. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I, enough questions for now. Thanks. Okay, any other questions or comments for Ryan? We want to segue to mobile crisis support teams and I uh, so we'll give the context and I think that a couple of you had questions or discussion around it so for the public our mobile crisis support teams are teams uh, where we have a county uh, clinician that's paired up with a law enforcement officer and doing a ride-along model where they go out into the field and dispatch sends them to uh, situations where they believe that somebody with a mental health challenge is involved with that. We have really great outcomes around um, avoiding psychiatric hospitalizations and around avoiding um, possible jail bookings. So uh, this is something that we have had here in Sacramento County for a little while. Uh, last year, you approved uh, expansion of mobile crisis support team from six teams up to t up to five teams. And one note I would have is that oh, up to eleven. Yeah, you just right. said six, six to teams five. up to eleven teams. Um, we added so we five. added five. Riverside County. <laughs> um, you're not. You're not. We're not gonna forget that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm gonna beat myself up worse. I promise. Um, uh, so we, we've, we did approve that expansion last year. Um, what 
here in the state of California, we have an extreme shortage on the number of licensed clinicians in the field. And then in the region itself, we have an even greater sh shortage of clinicians. And, and then within that, you need specialized folks that are b both trained and have experience that would be appropriate for doing these types of uh, ride-along models. And so it, it is uh, a, a task to do recruitment, and we're working very hard at doing that. Thank you. Supervisor Kenny. Uh, th thanks, Ryan. I'm actually um, going to read a lengthier can, statement. Can you I bring the microphone? Sorry. I'm not supposed to pass the <laughs> tape. Um, I'm actually going to you know, read, which I hardly ever do uh, in this circumstances, but I want to make sure that I capture all of my thoughts. Um, you know, what, what I would like to see, I spoke about it yesterday, uh, is, you know, I'd like to see us develop a more robust mobile mental health crisis team system, providing more appropriate and timelier care. The goals of this would be provide appropriate care for individuals in crisis, taking a public health view on public safety to meet the needs of people where they are and address those needs outside the criminal justice system. Alleviate the needs for deputies who, as the sheriff pointed out, are very expensive, to spend time in areas that they are not adequately trained. To reduce the jail population, which has multiple benefits of addressing our desires to see a reduction in the population, will ultimately decrease the number of personnel at the jail and help satisfy the spirit of the May's consent decree and doesn't criminalize mental illness. Uh, what's it look like? I'm not going to develop a program from the dais as we have far more qualified people to do that and I do understand that you and Dr. Bielinson have been looking at this already. Uh, but I'll use Denver as a quick example. Uh, Denver adopted the Support Team Assistance Response, or STAR, program, which sends a mental health professional and a paramedic to mental health-related 911 calls instead of law enforcement. Denver's a good example, as they have had a crisis mobilization team very similar to Sacramento County's existing program since 2016, and using the STAR pilot program to augment and provide more services geographically and during expanded hours. <clears throat> As was stated last night, we have the experience and data to show where calls are coming from and when. We're not starting from scratch, and there are other entities in the county performing similar work that we could actually leverage, like the Mental Health First organization, just to name one. Now, budget, since it's where we're essentially here. Um, let me start by prefacing this by saying that I don't use the phrase decarcerate. Um, I don't use the, the phrase defund in particular. I think the phrase defund is um, misleading. Uh, and if you ask 10 people what it means, you'd have 10 different answers. So I don't want to get hung up on, on something that's a lightning rod, politically charged phrase. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, but it is appropriate, I do believe, to fund this out of the sheriff's budget as there's a direct nexus between providing better services for our residents while freeing up law enforcement services in time. I will <clears throat> it will alleviate the current situation of deputies acting as frontline social workers, which I think we all agree is not the best situation and results in less desirable outcomes for the county and more importantly for those that we serve. I suggest we spend $1.5 million from the sheriff's budget to get the program started. This should be enough to get it off the ground and it falls within the amount actually of what the sheriff has repeatedly told us that he returns to the county every year. Um, I don't see why this should be controversial. Uh, we, it is, as I said, there's a direct nexus. The sheriff himself said that that's one of the areas that he thinks that we could uh, work closer together on. So uh, I would like to pursue that as an option. Again, I'm not going to micromanage and say how it's set up, but I would like to, since we cannot direct the sheriff how to spend his budget dollars, I would like to sequester a million and a half dollars from his budget uh, for this purpose. I have a question about that. Um, so uh, I don't necessarily disagree with it at all. Uh, I think it's um, a good idea on its face. I just want to know the extent. Is this also apply to any adjustments that would be made to our to the hot teams as well? No, this is separate of the hot teams. Total, totally separate from yeah. hot. Okay, because yeah. I, I what I heard the it would serve some of the same population, obviously. Right, 
and that's why I asked the question is because I heard um, uh, Sheriff Jones clearly say that um, he wasn't opposed either to um, some adjustment into uh, in terms of the composition of personnel that are, are currently um, you know what we call the hot teams which are our, our sheriff deputies that are going out in response to uh, the plight of homelessness ar around the county and that's something that certainly uh, interests me because I think he he opened that he opened that door quite frankly and said that um, that he's not opposed to maybe a, a different um, set of uh, people besides just uh, sworn uh, deputies that are that are doing that work so I'd be interested in understanding if this couldn't also include some of some of the, some consideration of that because I agree we're not going to design programs up here um, and as the sheriff mentioned yesterday um, and I tend to agree that uh, just simply by budgeting uh, and saying that you want to change the the composition of hot teams doesn't necessarily mean uh, mean that it's going to be more effective off the bat so I think I think we should kind of maybe even broaden broaden this a bit to, to explore how the hot teams might actually incorporate more uh, mental health focused uh, personnel and, and, and clinicians. And I would fully expect that the hot teams would interface with this group or program. <clears throat> okay. Any other questions, comments, suggestions on this subject? Uh, Supervisor Peters. Patrick, I, I know you don't want to go into detail, but um, are you a, a million and a half dollars? So uh, does that mean you want to add five, four or five deputies to no, learn, no. Not, not adding to the number they already have, but take four or five deputies out for special training in this area? And because we've got people in the social services that we already have on board, so that wouldn't be an expense. I'm trying to figure out what the million and a half is not, for. But first of all, um, you would need, you know, just support of like vehicular support. I mean, you would need a van of some kind. Um, but uh, this would be more of your, this would not be training more deputies. This would be actually helping us to recruit. We're having problems, as Ryan said, to recruit the, uh, the, the social services, uh, social worker uh, clinicians. Uh, so it would help us go out and get those personnel. So this would not be, uh, the whole key of this is to free up law enforcement and not make it law enforcement driven, just a complement to, to law enforcement. <clears throat> and the million and a half, I didn't just pull out of my uh, head. I mean, I, it sounds like that's available, but um, it was also uh, kind of similar to what other communities have spent to get this thing up, um, up and running. So it's for equipment? Not yeah. just equipment, also personnel. We, we need the, the, the clinicians to hire the clinicians to go out and do this. This wouldn't be. But that's in this, a different this, budget line. That's why I'm saying take it out of the budget line. That's, that's exactly what I said when I said sequester. I mean, take it out of the sheriff's budget, park it someplace else, <clears throat> and have a program that is complementary of what we're doing with the hot teams and, and other efforts. Hmm. Supervisor Frost. Um, I, I just want to make sure I understand it. Uh, Patrick, it, it seems like um, previously we had talked about the success of the mobile su crisis support teams and and what you're asking for is to add to what we have mm -hmm. but while adding to what the sheriff is already doing you want to take money out of his budget to reduce his budget for what he's already doing to add no this more. isn't at all, this isn't this isn't at all what he's doing this is what the mobile crisis teams are doing more so, but on steroids. We need to add personnel because what I hear out in the community, including from law enforcement, and the sheriff said so standing right there yesterday, that the two problems with the current uh, mobile crisis teams are, one, there's not enough of them for geographical coverage, and the other is that they don't have the hours that are necessary. So I want to really hit those areas. This would not be law enforcement going out. This would be relieving law enforcement from going out. And that's are, you, are you saying so we would have the same number of mobile crisis support teams, but we would have that, that, uh, those the are, counseling those are, those staff Those are details that call? I would leave to these guys. Those are details that, I mean, as, as far as exactly what the program looks like, I'm just trying to allocate the resources with a policy direction. I think what we're wrestling with is, it's our, my understanding that a deputy and a 
mental health professional go out together right. so typically what, what happens is a deputy goes out and that's still going to be necessary in certain circumstances to make sure that the that there's de-escalation going on and that that, that, the, right. that it's secure for the clinicians when they get out there and it's they're not putting themselves at any harm so what happens is the deputy goes out once the deputy has identified and and at the same time either the deputy or the dispatcher simultaneously rolls out the clinicians they're in separate cars, they do separate work. Once it's been seen that the, the, the situation's safe, the clinicians have taken over. There's a lot of, in some communities, what they're doing is they're kind of bypassing some of that when it's clear, and, and you said yesterday, and you're absolutely right, that it's incumbent upon you know the right training of dispatchers in programs like this, but we're already doing that, and well, I think. Um, but you know the, it's, the dispatcher determines uh, through protocols whether or not you send out a deputy, a deputy and the team, or just the team. Um, and that's what they've done in other communities. So in, in this, they, they don't necessarily go out together, they just go out at the same time. I mean, they're, they're not in the same car, they're not, you know, it's, it's deputy makes sure everything's safe, deputy backs off, clinicians go in. That's how it currently works. Well, wouldn't it be more logical to train the police dispatchers who also have to triage the situation as far as level of um, oh. danger. I mean, so would someone have to call two dispatchers to no, 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 no. for these, one these are, these are situation? Our these are our dispatchers, which, by the way, we just added a whole bunch or are talking about it. Um, no, this, this would go same. The dispatch side of it, in the way I envision it, again, I don't want to design it up here, but the way I envision it is that th these would be dispatched just the same way as, as the crisis teams are dispatched now. That, that would seem seamless to most people. Now, would they require maybe a little more training? Perhaps, but they've been doing this for three years. Um, so it seems just, like, I mean, it seemed like the sheriff was amenable to um, these types of changes, and he he basically even said, if this is something we should, he'd be happy to explore. It seems like rather than making it a, I mean, it would be good to make it a, you know, let's work on this and, and figure the program out before we allocate, you know, take money out of his budget for Supervisor it. Supervisor Frost, you cannot start a program with no resources. Well, he's not in the conversation, though, and it involves well, that's his department. That's because we're the one to set the budget. But that's the responsibility. He's of the, the five operations, of us. so shouldn't he, he even be part said of the he conversation? He returned two million dollars last year, so I don't see this as a great hardship. And he returned money the year before that. Well, I hear that, but I'm just thinking, shouldn't he be part of the conversation? Is is all? Well, he would be part of the conversation as we develop the program, obviously. But he doesn't need to be part of the budgeting conversation. That's our job. Supervisor Natoli. Yeah, just with, I think, you know, certainly the idea about having uh, a, a team to respond to, you know, the um, crisis situations and the, the calls for services is, is you know, is, is worthwhile and, you know, I'm, I'm supportive of that effort. I guess I would maybe draw um, NAV into the conversation here. It seems to me that, and again, we've, you know, been for the last 24 hours, you know, again, I think deluge with, uh, you know, a lot of the back and forth about, you know, where it comes from, so, you know, where the money comes from and whose budget is from. I would agree we can certainly rope off the funds. It would seem to me that in this budget that we have the ability, and I think to, I think with the, you know, certainly not just the willingness of the sheriff, I think certainly leadership, Mr. Kennedy showing on the issue, I think with Mr. Quist at the dais there, we ought to be able to come up with a program. Uh, we can set aside the funding. I don't think it needs to come from anybody's budget in particular. This budget is, is our, you know, is, is is the county's budget, and uh, and if we just and I guess I would ask you now if we tasked you with this to you know bring the parties together to get this up and running. Um, again, you know, obviously it'll have to fall into some budget unit, and you know, and and uh, the dollars, in my view, as I was kind of run down through this, obviously, uh, you know, we're gonna. You know, be looking at something probably different next year, but for I think getting this up and going, it's been spoken to the need, and so I guess I would offer the suggestion rather than take from here, give to there, give from here, and take it and take it over to there, is that if we desire to do this, let's you know let's say you know, and again you've given a number, I trust that that's a, a number, I, if that's an annualized number, and there may be some 
hardware training, you know, where those positions would fall, how they align with, you know, departmental budgets and so forth. Um, I, don't, I, I don't feel compelled to have to do that here today. I think that if we want to say we want to set aside the funding to do that. And so I guess now, I guess my question to you is that, um, you know, if, if we gave you that task and just said, you know, we wanted to, to, to fund this, you identify the funding, whether it's through salary savings or through other sources. Again, you know, this budget obviously is a very fluid situation. You need to have some ability to show that it's balanced. But um, I, I'd like to have you weigh on this rather than getting I, I can hear it back and forth kind of going here. And I think it's a good idea. We should probably fund it, but let's not necessarily get hung up on that here today. Yeah. So. Part of the question, no issue with uh, our office leading an effort between the sheriff and behavioral health, what this needs to look like. Uh, part two on that is that once we identify what that's going to look like, we can be back to the board if adjustments need to be made, whichever budget that they identified. So that's doable for us. Okay. So if I may, Don, I guess part of the concern I have is that, I mean, you know, the, the, and, and, and believe me, this is separate of everything that's going on out there right now. It's something I've been thinking about long before March, um, is that, you know, looking at the largest part of our budget makes sense. I mean, it's just, you can't look at budget decisions without looking at the biggest chunk. If it was your household budget, you'd do the same thing. Um, but once we allocate that money to the sheriff's budget, we lose it. I mean, we lose control over that money. And that, that's what I'm concerned about. <clears throat> well, again, but, but we have the ability, because there are salary savings in a given year that accrue, and um, any department doesn't have the authority to just respend those things, right? Uh, they have to come back through. So that, that's, what, that's what I was pointing to, is that, you know, whether it's sheriff's department or behavioral health, in particular their general fund dollars, we, you know, again, we've allocated them and they can be expended for the positions and or for the, uh, you know, the, the authorities that are given to those departments. Uh, but we have the ability to, and I trust they're probably already salary savings because we're three three months into the fiscal year, you know, and there, but there have been expenses that we probably incurred as well that we didn't anticipate. Um, and I think the amount of money that you put forward is not, you know, it's, it's not unreasonable in the size of this budget and if it helps us, you know, be better at, you know, serving people, then it, it makes sense to me. And again, that's, I trust you could be back now meeting with the department heads, figuring out where, you know, whether it's allocated, but if we gave direction that we wanted to, you know, fund the program, uh, and, uh, you know, and you're tasked with, you know, working with behavioral health and, and, uh, uh, and, and the sheriff and whoever else might be involved to, to figure that out, I trust you could be back to us fairly soon with that. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Okay. Again, I know I, I I understand your point, but I get you know, I'm, um, you know, it, it, all that money, whatever is in people's budgets, they're not going to spend all their money between now and when this would be back to us in any department. Obviously, it's supposed to carry through the departments for 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 the full year. It's a it's an annualized budget, so I guess I'd be comfortable in giving direction if that's the number we pick, and then say back to the county executive and and uh, working with our elected sheriff and working with, you know, Ryan and, and Dr. Bielinson and others to figure out, you know, how we get this up and running and do it quickly. I think it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's needed. I think it'll be a good supplement. And I, if it's, you know, uh, and another element of what we do in responding to calls for service and, you know, and, and, and if it does begin to decrease calls and so forth, I think that's part of the conversation. Maybe, maybe should be some measurements behind this too, because I think that may help us in this board in future discussions about, you know, allocation of resources going forward in order to, uh, you know, continue to support, maybe even to build upon it. So uh, I guess I would just offer that as a suggestion. It seems to me that that's, you know, in, in, in light of where we are with budget, if we could do that today and, and give that direction and not have to be so concerned about exactly where it comes from. So I, I, I appreciate that. And the, the reason I appreciate what you Excuse said as far me. as the do it quickly, because what I'm afraid of is we don't allocate money that we're looking at the next budget cycle. And I don't want to wait another year to do this. Yeah. I'm with you. I think we could. Do, that's what I guess my question to you, Nav, would be just while I still at the floor here is that we could give that task to you today and say we wanted to set aside and you would figure that out from where you the sources and bring that back to us. And again, if a million and a half is the right number or if it's more, a little, you know, a little more, a little less, you would come back to us about how to, how to stand that up and, and do that. Is that within the context we could do that today? Yeah, yes, you could. Okay. Yeah, I'd, can, yeah. Uh, sure. I'll get I'm, to I'm, Supervisor Froster who's been waiting patiently, but. What I'm hearing over the last five minutes of conversation is that uh, the idea that Supervisor Kennedy has suggested um, by design in terms of the general vision would 
reduce or minimize the amount of law enforcement resources necessary to hopefully have a greater efficacy in terms of responding to um, mental health crises um, out in the community. And so I'm kind of now listening to the back and forth, I kind of view it as a two stage process. Certainly appreciate Supervisor Kennedy's um, need and, and sense of urgency to have it funded this budget cycle. I totally agree with that. Um, maybe we look at it two stages is funding it uh, from whatever sources that we task the CEO to <coughs> go find those sources for for the million and a half. Um, but if the design of the program ultimately <coughs> concludes that yes, in fact, that would mean a reduction in the number of, of FTEs in the sheriff's <coughs> department that would be, uh, you know, party to this new model then I think there's no doubt about it that by definition it's going to be it's going to amount to a reduction in the, the sheriff's de department and again from what I heard from the sheriff last night I don't know that he would necessarily object to that I kind of heard that he wanted to get out of the business of <coughs> of being you know his department being mental health de facto mental health clinicians so I, I would I would kind of hope that we can view it in those um, in that framework is kind of this two-stage process and I don't know how long it, it would take to develop design this new model but I don't know that there's anything necessarily that would actually keep us from uh, revisiting um, and understanding what it means for the shifting of especially personnel resources between departments to to set this new model in motion and that's, that's why I think our CEO could be very helpful in that regard. I think, you know, bridging that and figuring that out and whatever measurements for either shift of work and or, re, you know, that again, I think, you know, makes, makes sense, Mr. Chair. Supervisor Frost. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to ask, because it's, it, I don't think the Denver study is over, completed yet. And so there might be information that comes out of that that, um, a better understanding or you know that would be useful and so I think it's good I, I like I like the idea of um, moving in that direction of creating better efficiencies but we don't know for sure how that plays out yet because they're still in the middle of that right they're, they haven't completed their they're still in the pilot phase yes that's true yeah so they uh, might learn something from it that um, would inform us and change the way we would set it up so I'm not sure rushing and I think that was one of the things that the sheriff I agree I don't think the sheriff has any um, angst over he doesn't want to be in that I mean he's happy to work or work around this but I'm just saying I wonder if we should let them finish their pilot watch it and begin planning ours while that while they're still working through it and rather than you know reallocating funds yet then find a way to to have it make sense between the two budgets and I don't think it's going to be a problem at all so mr. chair I apologize for the back and forth no, no but I mean debate is kind of what elected officials yeah. are paid to do part of it um, and the only reason I strenuously disagree with that approach is that it's they're called crisis teams for a reason and um, I'm not interested in waiting until another jurisdiction finishes their pilot so we can learn everything we could do that forever because um, that's not the only one in the country um, I'd rather see us lead and uh, meet the needs that are on the street today I'm with uh, you know I, I support the idea of setting money aside um, I prefer to not take from someone's budget to you know from the sheriff's budget to do that um, I like the way Don I liked what Don was alluding to which was you know let's let's um, explore you know putting together a program see what it looks like and and see where that money can come from funded as appropriately. we're working. yeah funded appropriately and then in, and then maybe we can include the sheriff in the conversation of because he may inform us on things we didn't know um, that would help us put together something better so okay I'll end it with I just seem to see a level of urgency here that I'm not hearing from everybody you're hearing it from me <laughs> <clears throat> 
the advisor, uh, Natoli? Yeah, well, I would just say that I, I understand the urgency and I would agree with the urgency and I think we have the ability, that's why I asked Mr. Gill that we can direct it as a part of our motions today, set funding aside at least for the estimated amount uh, and uh, say go forth and be back to us. You give you a reasonable amount of time, Nav, and, and uh, be back to us in 30 days or whatever with, you know, the, you know, Whatever comes out of those discussions and formation and working with you know Supervisor Kennedy and other uh, folks that have expertise in the field and but we can fund we, we can fund it today at least uh, you know uh, with an allocation and then let you figure you know bring that back to us in the whole is thirty days reasonable now I mean is that something Ryan and we're going to have to look at Ryan on that one <laughs> um, we we have begun some of the work with Bruce's group so I. <clears throat> Let's shift for 30. If we can get 30, we'll come back early in the winter. Okay, all right. Can but, but we can approach, well, we, again, we, we can set the money aside and, and uh, say, the, figure it out. I, you know, what would you prefer? I think what I would prefer is that if that's what the charge is, is for us to work with behavioral health, I mean, health services and the sheriff and bring a proposal back to you and say, this is how this is going to be done. Okay, so, let me just ask I don't think they're going to spend any money next. No. And whatever money they need, we have enough budget authority to get them through, but I understand okay. the urgency is that we need to get something up and running, and let's get that up and running and get the two parties in the same room. Not that they're disagreeing, we just need to get them in the room, hammer this thing out, and come back to you. And I just would ask, because I think it's, it's, an, it's, it's relevant to the budget context that you know, while we're in session on budget, you know, any three of us can take an action on something. If you get outside of that context, if we haven't allocated the money, then it requires at least four of us to, to concur on that. I, I, I hear pretty much I, agreement across the board about the, the programmatic element. I just want to be sure about, so yeah, I think it's comfortable, so. It, I think if the desire of what I'm hearing is we need to have these teams. That's what our interest is. Yeah. What the funding's going to look like, um, surprise candy is right, there will be salary savings and at the end of the year, any general fund department that has yeah. savings, they come back central to be reallocated. So whatever money's left, we have the money in there. In the meantime, for the work that needs to be done, I do believe if, once you approve this budget, we have enough authority to get it going. But if you want to specifically say we're using 1.5 from the sheriff, then that's a decision the board needs to make. But if it's more generic, come back, get these things running, and then show us um, where the funding is, but more importantly, how to manage the crisis. That's how I kind of view. We, but we can give you budget authority. We don't have to say where it comes from. We're going to tell you to go figure that out. But we say we, yeah. want, we, we want to make sure you give you the budget authority. I so that you Yeah, I don't need anything allocated for me to go do that. I just need okay. to come back to you, okay. show you okay. what the program is and how that's going to be funded. Not dissimilar from a lot of programs we've started in the middle of the year. Then we come back and tell you this is where it's going to come from and we move on. And, it, yeah. and if there needs to be a transfer of money between the sheriff and uh, health services in any case we have to bring that back because we can't transfer between salary objects that's back and right, forth yeah, sure. that authority lies with the board and that, that's what I was going to touch on is that you, let's say you go away for 30 60 days you come back with a designed new model and it concludes it spits out in addition to how this is going to be much more effective and who's involved but if it also spits out at the end of the, the design discussion that it means less Resource uh, resources necessary from the sheriff's department to make this model work as intended, then it, but almost by definition that means a budget adjustment for that department, does it not? Correct. Yeah. So the way that would look hypothetically, again, let's just go to 1.5 million. Let's say end of the exercise, it's 1.5 million. That's identified by the team. That's not needed. Let's just send the sheriff. So when we bring you the program, ask you to approve the program. We will also have an adjustment at the same time, moving 1.5 out of that sheriff's budget unit to the appropriate budget unit in health services. So that's how that money gets moved over. Well, that's all in the spirit of what I would recommend. Right. Yeah, I think we're all in agreement. It, we need more of those. So if this creates efficiencies, it's it's a good thing. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, did you? Was that your comment? Okay. All right. <clears throat> <clears throat> so the next issue on our list is the issue of using asset forfeiture fund uh, monies to uh, 
purchase uh, body cameras. Um, and I'm going to be uh, presenting that item, but um, Anita Pedden, who is the Chief of Finance and Administration for the Sheriff's Department, is here. Um, and she is uh, really the expert in that program. But uh, I've had some extensive discussions with Ms. Pedden and with, uh, and with Under Sheriff uh, Manis. And so uh, I can sort of convey the gist of what we've learned. So first of all, uh, just to remind the board, the uh, cost of body cameras that is included in the fiscal year 2021 budget is about uh, 2.1 million dollars, a little less than 2.1 million dollars, and that would include 675 thousand dollars for uh, personnel in the sheriff's department to uh, manage the uh, all of the various ap uh, activities related to body cameras, such as making them available, reviewing them, all that sort of stuff, uh, uh, maintaining them, and then about 1.4 million dollars. Uh, in equipment and connectivity charges and things like that. Um, so, uh, and, and that distinction is important when you get to the issue of using asset forfeiture funds because one of the prohibitions against you, uh, on use of asset forfeiture funds is for personnel. So any personnel costs could not, uh, clearly under the rules, under the law, could not be used um, for uh, personnel costs for asset forfeiture funds. Um, the county gets, at the, it, the, in the sheriff's, uh, there is, a, there is a, a budget unit, a restricted fund that contains asset forfeiture funds. Um, it, and uh, we get really asset forfeiture funds uh, from two sources. We get federal asset forfeiture funds and we get state asset forfeiture funds. And both of them have um, categories. And some of those categories are very restrictive, like they can only be used for RICO uh, activities or only be used for certain activities and some of them while they can only be used th there's still a lot of rules that apply they can be used more broadly to for example purchase equipment and so um, and that's both from the federal and the state asset forfeiture funds the asset forfeiture m fund money that we get every year is in the area of around you know 500,000 to 700,000 or so a year we do not budget that revenue typically at the start of the fiscal year for two reasons one because the amount is variable and there's really no way to predict how much it's going to be in any particular year and secondly because on the advice of the federal and state government there are um, uh, very strong anti-supplanting rules and I think the sheriff was alluding to this with regard to the use of these funds and so um, they uh, pr to avoid audit issues with the use of these funds they recommend that you actually appropriate them during the year and that's what happens every year you may recall you get uh, th during most years you get the sheriff coming in with a, a, a proposal to uh, appropriate these funds and purchase equipment and that's usually what they're used for um, in summary uh, so uh, basically, uh, we, th uh, there's not revenue coming in, but we do have money in reserve in the asset forfeiture funds. And uh, it, it, we have in reserve in the amount that is less restricted, where you could use it for the sort of thing we're talking about in terms of equipment. We have about $3 million in reserve. Some of that the sheriff has plans for, uh, and we'll have other plans for for various things, but that's about $3 million. Uh, and and uh, body cameras would be a, uh, and the related equipment would be an eligible expenditure of those funds. Uh, but what the sheriff indicated, and I've actually spent quite a bit of time looking at this now, and, and the sheriff's office main concern here is the very strong anti-supplanting provisions in, the, in both the federal and state laws and rules that relate to this money. And basically, um, they make it very clear that, it, uh, in fact, they use as an examples. If there's any situation where, for example, a uh, budget for a law enforcement agency is being reduced, and then this money is brought in, you could potentially run afoul of the supplanting provisions. And of course, in our case, there are two areas where we've got concerns here. One is because um, in the recommended budget, we're recommending funding these, not using this money. And more significantly, because that's not the adopted budget, but still it might raise audit questions, because we are proposing reductions in programs in the sheriff's budget, although not programs related to this. I think it's a gray area looking at the rules. Um, I think the sheriff's department is a little more concerned that it's not allowable. Um, uh, there is a provision. Uh, it, the other rule is you, you can't use it for ongoing costs, so you would use it for you know just the cost for this year. There is a provision and that in the rules that allows, and I, I understand from Ms. Pedden that law enforcement agencies take advantage of this all the time, prior to making these decisions to uh, actually ask for guidance uh, from the federal government on this issue. And so that is, uh, I think, the most prudent course here if this is a direction the board wants to take, uh, to use this money for this purpose, which would be, again, for uh, the about 1.391,000, uh, 1 basically, of the, of, of the cost, uh, minus the part for the, um, 
for the rangers, which would not be eligible, uh, because you're not allowed to use it for other agencies under the under the rules. But that's only about 30 uh, body-worn cameras. The most prudent course of action would be to not include funding for this in the budget uh, for now. R take the money and put it back into the general reserve so it's available in the case the answer is that th this is not an eligible expense. And approach the federal government and ask the question. And if the answer to the question is, yes, this is an allowable use, we're not, it doesn't uh, trigger any issues around uh, supplanting, non-supplanting, then uh, go back and uh, go forward with that, come back with a supplemental adjustment, and use this money for that purpose, as, as well as part of the money in the reserve for the, for the positions. If the answer is, no, we th there's, this crosses the line, then, um, then we would have the money in reserve and be able to take that money and use it uh, to, to go ahead and do, again, a, a budget adjustment and fund, the, and, fund the, uh, and fund the body cameras. That would be the most, the safest way to approach this. Uh, Ms. Pedden can speak to this further, but uh, again, I, I, I think it's a gray area just reading the rules, but there is a legitimate question there, particularly given the examples. Um, apparently, they do regularly audit this, and this, they, 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 this non-supplanting thing is, uh, they're very aggressive about the whole non-supplanting issue. So um, I don't know uh, if, again, Ms. Pedden has anything to add to that at this point, but, um, but that, that's what, that's what we know about it. Britt, so, Britt, before we get to Supervisors Natalia and Kennedy, um, let me just make sure I understood you um, accurately here. So uh, you're saying that one option would be not to put it in the budget and wait to get guidance. But knowing that, I think it's fair to say that there's a fair amount of interest, everyone from the sheriff on down, in body cameras this year, that it is a priority. Why wouldn't we budget it and then come back with a, a with, an, a, with a, a mid year adjustment if we had to, if the guidance is not affirmative, and that and that way with the no no harm no foul. The, well, the only the only reason would be because it would just would, would just potentially uh, make more obvious that this might potentially be a supplantation issue. Yeah, but meanwhile so. you delay. You delay the, the outfitting of our deputies with body cameras, which sure. I don't know that there's interest in that. Sure. And Supervisor, I think it's just a risk. I mean, that's what Brett That's the risk. It's just the risk. risk. Yeah. Supervisor Tully? Yeah. Well, kind of along the same lines. I appreciate the, the information, Brett. I know you scrambled over the last less than 24 hours, and thank you for uh, Ms. Pettit to be here as well. Um, I, and, I, and I think that, again, kind of parsing it down to what might be available. And you know, I'm appreciative of folks audit you know the uh, the, the dollars that are dispersed to uh, local entities. Uh, I think that's right and proper. Now we haven't approved anything. You put forward that we're going to buy body cameras. So we're talking about how we might fund those body cameras. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it, it just seems to me that supplantation. I mean, one thing if we had already you know approved a budget that had those dollars in it. I mean, this is what you know. This is. There's no action taken on this budget until we act. You obviously brought it forward. Um, you know, we've talked today about different sources of funding for different things, including categorical programs that we might backfill. Um, you know, it's general fund realignment, all the things that you know far better than than certainly me. Um, but I guess, you know, I I don't know why we'd be in, in a very bad position there because again, we we are talking about purchasing body cameras to you know uh, provide to our uh, sheriff's officers and it would seem to me that if we even wanted to expand the complement uh, beyond what uh, was you know was even suggested uh, because again we were going to do the first phase for patrol in, in, in a number of different divisions uh, uh, but not not all of the sheriff's uh, officers positions so I, I guess I, I, I gather risk, and, I, and I'm glad we looked into this, but you've seen to me from the standpoint of equipment, uh, we're going to provide all the personnel behind it. Obviously, we'll have to cover their equipment replacement, so that becomes a responsibility of the county. But um, So I guess I'm just having a, a, a struggle just a little bit about how they can make a finding of supplantation. Again, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not the auditor, and I don't know what all the rules are. I see Ms. I think, surprisingly, yeah. totally, rather than us trying to figure out a way how this becomes yeah, supplement, yeah. I think that's just... The nature was to let you know what the risk okay. is. Okay. So okay. that's the risk. If knowing going into it, whichever decision the board makes, that there could be cause A and cause B. Okay. I, that's we want to make sure we disclose all that to the board before you make that call. Okay. And and and, and last comment I would just make is that I th think if we are able to use 
those funds, uh, I think appropriately so, then I think some of the other things we've talked about today uh, would, you know, where we don't have the ability to maybe, you know, draw upon a funding source like that, but it's still important to either to law enforcement efforts or to some of the things we've talked about relative to health, mental health, and so forth, uh, gives us a little more capacity within the budget framework to do that as well. So, okay. Thanks. Supervisor Peters. Thank you. We need the body cameras. We need them now. I think it's worth the risk. <laughs> Could you be can, more can you be more clear? <laughs> All right. I think for the record, what you meant is we need the body cameras. That's what we yeah. should go yeah. forth and do. Yes. That's what you meant. Yeah, that's what I meant. <laughs> Supervisor Frost. Oh, can't we budget it with this, that funding and subject to approval that that funding can work? Supervisor Frost, I could just say, yeah. just it's if that's what the board wants, let's dollars. move forward and do it. And then yeah. if we get a favorable, we will come back and make adjustments. What do yeah, we yeah, need yeah. to do? Yeah. I agree. Okay. All right. Okay. So the next issue is the uh, uh, the position in the sheriff's department, the the, the categorical reduction um, of the uh, sexual assault uh, felony enforcement uh, deputy position that uh, was being uh, 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 reduced. Uh, uh, due to reduction in state funding, and this is uh, this is one deputy part of the sexual assault felony enforcement team or safe team, two hundred sixty-two thousand, two hundred sixty-two thousand seven hundred eighty-four dollars. Um, this um, this is a program that is a, a joint program between the um, between the sheriff's department, um, uh, the probation department, uh, state parole, and certain other agencies, uh, and uh, the program is uh, sort of directed to. Uh, reduced violent sexual assault offenses in the county through proactive surveillance and arrest of habitual sexual offenders um, and strict enforcement of registration requirements uh, for sexual offenders. Um, the, the, the team uh, is responsible for monitoring, arresting, assisting in the prosecution of habitual sexual offenders who violate the terms and conditions of their probation or parole or fail to comply with registration requirements. Um, they also provide community education by providing information to the public about ways to protect themselves um, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, currently, the the uh, the county contributes a sergeant and two deputies to that team, um, and this would be one of those deputies that would be eliminated. Um, the department indicates that the impact uh, would be uh, a reduction in the team's obviously ability to. Um, uh, to respond, um, uh, to investigate, because it's a, uh, uh, you know, that's a reasonably significant co component of the team. Um, reduction in their ability to investigate uh, uh, in, uh, offenders relocating from the levees to residential areas of the county. Reduction in the team's ability to assist probation and parole and enforcement activities, compliance sweeps, um, and surveillance. Um, again, the reason that we did not recommend funding the, the department, uh, the, I, we also, when we were looking at this, asked the department, would they be willing to move, you know, basically move, move funding from elsewhere to um, fund this, and their answer was no, they would not. Um, so um, again, the issue here was it was a categorical reduction. Um, and it was tight uh, financial times, not that it's not a good and useful program, but um, again, we, um, we were just not, for the most part, other than in a few very critical situations, we were not adding back um, uh, programs where uh, state or federal funding was reduced. Supervisor Mottola. Yeah, thanks, Britt, and I appreciate the you know, further information behind it, but it sounds to me beyond just investigating uh, uh, crimes uh, that, you know, holding people accountable, uh, registrants and, uh, Making sure that uh, they're, uh, you know, a bit, you know, uh, adhering to their terms of probation and so forth. Um, and I can tell you that I, don't, I might trust maybe other offices too, but I do get an, any number of inquiries uh, about, you know, they can go to certain websites and see who's in their neighborhood and so forth, uh, unincorporated area or, or otherwise. And I think having, you know, certainly a, a team that can, you know, a small team, it sounds like it's supplemented with other, other officers and so forth. I guess I'm, I'm, I'm curious, um, looking at that, that if we only have, we have one sergeant and one officer, 
that are assigned for the entirety of the county and i and is it just unincorporated area or is it for um you know i didn't ask that question but it's a partnership it's not they're not the only members of the team they're the only members from the sheriff's office there's right. probation parole others on the team but for a population of six hundred seventy-five thousand, with the geography that cover the communities that we represent we only have two people assigned uh, under this current proposal to investigate one crimes, I guess, that are of those natures, which can be very serious, may require a lot of detailed investigation. But then I think doing some of the uh, additional uh, oversight and enforcement, uh, you know, again, the sheriff isn't here and I don't expect you to speak for him, but I mean, I, you know, last night when I asked the question, it me, again, you know, you can eliminate different positions, they all have impacts. And we're funding new positions, but it, it, you know, it just seems to me, from, if, if we're that thin for a county our size with the unincorporated population nearly 700,000 people, you know, stretching from the Antioch Bridge all the way to you know, Orangeville and you know, Alberta, um, that's just a lot of coverage. And, you know, and, and, and let alone investigating, I think the number was there was 191 crimes that were you know, investigated last year or something that effect, so close to 200. You know, these are sexual assaults on, I assume, on minors, on, on women, on people of, of all ages, uh, and then also keeping track of, of, of registrants. Um, and I don't know how many we have in the county. Uh, and I don't know, I guess I'm just concerned that, not, not because it's categorical, I get that, but as to how in the rank priority, that doesn't rank pretty high, because that's playing some defense too, as it relates to, and being able to respond to our community concerns that we all get in our neighborhoods about, you know, well, who's there, who's where. Um, and, but but you yeah, made clear, the, the, the sheriff said they were not willing to, to move any positions, anything from the jails or any other unit to to this well i don't i don't think under given what we're dealing with the consent decree i don't think moving from the jails would probably be an option for them but um but basically are, they're they, they're if, if i could yeah, just jump yeah. in um when it came to the sheriff's budget when we were looking at what kind of cuts were coming you had some items like hot team and some other items that we funded right. back in um if it's the bill of the board we could go back to the sheriff and his executive team and ask, is there any anything else they can move around to accommodate that? Well, again, it's not for that, me. That was part of the budget negotiation. I don't mean that in a okay. bad way, no, but I know. I, when we were discussing stuff with department heads, they have priorities and cuts, and we ended up landing at a certain spot where we were willing to go to. This was a little bit too far for us given the financial condition we're in. Right, right. And um, this could be a conversation with the sheriff again, see if there's some latitude they hmm. have or not. Well, again, I, I'll just say for myself, I think that it would be wise maybe to have that conversation. I don't know if there are other vacant positions that, you know, uh, you know, and there may all be mission critical, but I do think that, you know, after hearing the explanation, again, I appreciate the detail both from the sheriff as well as from Britt today, that uh, it would seem to me that, you know, again, we talk about, um, you know, just some of the exposure, and I think this, you know, this is really, it's an important aspect of, of public safety. So uh, again, if you're willing to go back and have that conversation, I yeah. I will be, go back and we'll okay, talk to that's, that's fine, okay. Thanks, that's all I have. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, the next <clears throat> item on uh, our list is the forensic behavioral health uh, uh, issue, uh, the $1.6 million issue, and uh, uh, Dr. Quist will again be uh, addressing that issue. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Ryan Quist, Behavioral Health. Um, as a part of the uh, original um, growth request that was done pre-COVID when we thought we were gonna have more funds coming in, we put together a proposal for a forensic behavioral health program. I will, uh, I do need to clarify that the language in there appears to, the language appears to have come from an earlier version. Um, the the $3.2 million that would that was put into there would, would be able to pay for in one program instead of two for a total of 500 people. So I do need to clarify that. So that 3.2 million was only for one program? Wasn't one it? program for 500 people. Okay. Oh, I did have a chance, Mr. Chair, if I could just real quickly, I, I had a chance to talk with you just a bit and talk with uh, Britt and Nav, uh, as well as Chief Seal. And I know that uh, as we were talking about other items uh, yesterday, 
and some of the work that's being done, um, you know, working with probation and, and other partners, I guess my question was if there could be a component of what, this was a federally matched program, uh, and I think what's being contemplated uh, in the conversion of the uh, um, in 711 G Street is gonna be largely state funded, maybe with some local funds, obviously, that we might be able to look to a component that could be complementary to that, and it might be much smaller, but I mean, it seems like you're gonna have some, some similar makeup, and we'd be working with folks who, uh, you know, were formerly incarcerated, but also um, folks that may have challenges, certainly in the behavioral health aspect of it, and um, obviously it doesn't, you know, it comes with a 50-50 match, and so is that something you think we could explore with the chief probation officer uh, and maybe have another component to to have a service component. Um, currently, the model that we're looking at with probation is an assessment, screening and assessment model, where they would be screened for mental health and substance use disorder services, and then they would be um, basically referred or assigned to a, a program when appropriate. And if you had a program like you just talked about, you would assign to this pro to that program potentially. If if you if we had funded, okay. So, but what if you had it as a component? If you had that, then if that was appropriate. Referral, could you have that as complimentary or, or no? Is that, is that mixing would, too many things? Are you asking if it could be complimentary? Yeah, yeah, yeah complimentary, Absolutely. maybe even housed you know, uh, together, or maybe a smaller component than what's been envisioned here for 500 people at $3.2 million. So is there a way to, is there a way to scale it to size? Mm -hmm. It could definitely be complimentary. And you could scale it to size so you could, you know, you could draw upon federal dollars, but you wouldn't need, what, $1.6 I mean, you could, does it have to be, a certain size in order to be successful. Can you? Could you serve? Oh, we could scale it. Uh, yeah, a hundred people at you know at X. We could scale it. Okay. Well, it sounds like it's be a year or so before they're going to be up and running. But I would, I guess, maybe as a part of this, just having spent a little time talking about this, that if we could look at that as maybe being a component and maybe for a smaller funding piece, uh, recognize obviously we we'll have to find the match funding to do that. But so if I, if I could uh, offer yeah. as this program starts up. And with Ryan mentioned that we can scale it, let us look at that, what scalability, how much can we get federal, how much is local match, and we can bring that program back when we get the federal match money and make a complimentary to that program. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Brett. <clears throat> Uh, the next item on our list is a report on uh, the Exodus Project, and uh, Ann Edwards, uh, Director of Human Assistance, will address that issue. Good afternoon, Ann Edwards, Department of Human Assistance. Um, before I talk about the Exodus program, I just want to say briefly about the Senior Safe House. I want to talk a moment about what we're doing in the Scattered Site Shelter Program at DHA already. I know uh, Mr. Wagstaff talked about the number of seniors that we're serving, and really the lion's share of the folks that we're serving in that program are seniors. And that program costs $110,000 a year for five people. So it's really cost effective and we might be able to do something more with that, with the um, money that, the 300,000 that you allocated plus the SB2, 300,000, we might be able to patch something together, not for a senior safe house, but a different sort of model for something similar. So I just wanted to toss that out there. Um, regarding the Exodus program, um, Ms. Kavanaugh and I had a meeting with the rabbi about the program, and we are um, enthusiastic about the program. I think it is something that is really needed in this community. Folks are getting released from jail. They're getting released from prison. Uh, many of them are homeless. They don't have a place to go. Um, we are in continued discussions with the rabbi about this program, and we're looking at possible ways of funding it. We do not have um, a strategy for funding it at this time. There's some additional um, CDBG um, CARES money that's coming. We don't know what the allocation is yet. We would certainly have to work with SHRA if we were to use it for this program, but that is a possibility. Um, but we just don't have enough information to say, yes, we can do it right now. Would this be CARES, CARES allocation to SHRA? Well, it's CDBG money that comes through SHRA, but it's it's county money so we can um, decide how we spend it. Well, you, uh, you said CARES, so I'm just the, trying the, to... 
SHRA also has CARES right, money. Right, that's why I asked the question. So it could be, as we're looking at, it could be CDBG uh -huh. or CARES SHRA. Well, and I'm sorry, it's, it's CDBG, the feds are calling it CDBG CARES. Oh, but CDBG it's CARES. CDBG money. Okay. Just to keep it clear. Right. It's really, yeah, it's complicated. There's ESG. I right. know. We didn't touch that one, though. <laughs> Um, and so this is one of many needs that we have around addressing COVID for the homeless. Um, you know, we've got Project Room Key going. We would like to extend those motels and not um, end them. Well, they're scheduled to end in <clears throat> September. We're working towards ending them in December, which is not a good time to end them in, in the dead of winter. Um, so we are still trying to look at some of those funding sources to extend that program as well. So. There's a lot of moving parts here. And can you can you elaborate a little bit um, relative to the spreadsheet that um, that we asked uh, Britt to prepare, which I think has been quite quite enlightening in terms of the CARES uh, CARES Act balance and the different kind of categories of uh, where certain funding lies, whether it's been restricted because of contractual obligations or is completely uh, unencumbered. But help us understand some of the. COVID-related uh, responses, especially as it relates to um, addressing the needs of those that are unsheltered that uh, is coming from uh, this appropriation. Yes, so the, the DHA funding on that chart indicates that it is unspent. Um, and that is true at this moment. That means we haven't paid all the bills. But every dime of that is contracted, or I actually got word this morning that one of the contracts is being routed today for signature. And so that money is all allocated for Project Room Key and for rehousing the folks that are in Project Room Key. One of my biggest fears with Project Room Key all along is that we would house all of these folks in motels through COVID, and then when it ended, we would just kick them back all out on the street and so we have um, allocated a lot of that money to rehouse folks out of the motels as we transition away from project room key so that's the more or less that's the 2.3 million out of the 19 yes change. okay yes all right okay um, supervisor Kennedy just on the exodus program so primarily it's the question of funding or is there programmatic stuff that still needs to be worked out? No, the programmatic stuff is, I think, really solid. I mean, we've had a good conversation. Um, we agreed to talk again uh, very soon, and it's just a funding issue. Okay. 650000 Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Could I just, just ask on that? Uh, it occurred to me, though, that um, if we wanted to you know, we've talked about how we convert dollars if we wanted to allocate enough for the three months under which we get the coverage. But, you know, if there were some unspent funds, we'd have the ability to, to fund that for the remainder portion of the year. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't, I'm not sure I'm understanding your question. Well, we could use CARES money if, if, if we, to fund the startup. And then, you know, assuming we may have some leftover dollars we could appropriate for housing. Again, recognizing that, you know, we obviously have the public health, we have the housing components and so forth. but. I mean, you know, you know, NAV's assured us several times on the record that, you know, we're not going to allow those dollars to slip away. So we have the ability to we maintain that flexibility from the public health realm, but obviously some of the things that are emerging needs as it, as it relates to the pandemic and, you know, housing you're speaking to. And it would seem to me that this is probably a, a similar part of the population that you're serving. Yes, and I do think, yes, you could use CARES money for a startup, but it would be very hard, I believe, I could be yeah. wrong, but I think it'd be very difficult for a provider to enter into a short-term contract for a startup on a program. I think that they would want at least a commitment of a year's contract, so we would have to identify the funding post-December 31st in order to get a viable contract. I think the yeah. supervisor will tell you what you're getting at is that if that's where recommendation comes in, and we realize it's going to go past December. We do have a mechanism. We have expenditures that we can identify and t satisfy the Treasury and free up the money right. if that's where Ann ends up going with it. And that's an action we'll bring to the board if we were to do it. So what are you looking at in, in way of time? I mean, they, you know, this has been a fairly recent submittal, but obviously they must have worked on it for a while. They've been talking with you and Cindy. When would you think that you could have it figured out that either you're going to bring it to us 
I won't say not, just you're going to bring it to us. It depends yeah. upon the, the only funding option I have potentially available to me is the CDBG new money that we don't know how much it is. We haven't received confirmation from the feds. I've been working very closely with Ms. Dozier on this so that we can you know, make sure it lines up, but I don't know the answer to that question. I think we could start it up pretty quickly once we got the funding um, because it's modeled at, it's, the provider is Sacramento Self-Help um, Housing in, in partnership, and so I think that could happen pretty quickly, but we can't start it up without confirmation of funds. But if I just, again, back to the conversation here, is that there's another choice, it may have a little more risk and or consider other considerations, is that you could use CARES money through December 30th, assuming you could identify that, and then if, it looked as, because we're getting, as the days come off here, maybe everything gets spent down to the last penny, but that if there was some other available, then the conversion of that could be, I mean, there may be others clamoring for, but what's, what, what maybe dollars it would carry through the rest of the year. Obviously, public health is going to have a big element of that. I think, Supervisor Tully, yeah. on that, I was more reacting to, I think what Ann's saying is that she has, all that money is basically allocated and she has contracts behind them. For so, Mike, yes. So For DHA. Yeah, for Ann, yeah. Yeah, right, right. So the, my spirit of what I said is that if we come close to November and we find out that a lot of her expenditures are going to go past December, we can get that money in, but she has expenditures that she's identified. So then it gets into the SHRA discussion we're having is that how that money comes in. So is DHA locked in because of the way it came down from it, or is that choice has been made by the county as to how much DHA got of the overall portion? Correct. So because of the pro project room key, so she has the authority to spend all that money. Right. And I'm understanding is that they are going to end up spending right, I that heard money. That, yeah. okay. But if something happens, she doesn't need all of it, then we can free up the money to do something else. And recommendation most likely at that point will be to use it for projects like this. But that's a decision we'll bring back to the board if other folks want to reallocate it somewhere else. Okay. Thanks. Supervisor Kenny. But the SHRA money, should that be, the, it doesn't have to be spent by the end of the year. It's like a two-year, yeah. Because of the CDBG component. Right. Correct. Right. And I just want to reiterate that this project, 650000 is one piece of several things we need to continue project room key past September 30th. When, and do you think that you would have some definitive answer on the, the disposition of the, the CDBG CARES SHRA funding? I actually don't know. I'm hoping next week. I was hoping to have it by today. Right. Um, but I'm hoping. if it was the will of the board to um, make a commitment to this today as part of our budgeting, couldn't we um, draw on the 7.2 uh, million that's not obligated in the Balance of CARES Act funding, um, at least to hold us until there's some determination of perhaps using the, the other part of, uh, of CARES Act funding, just so that we know that it's gonna be funded one way or another, at least to get it started and have it commence. I very quick answer, I think we can. Okay. Depending on the conversation with SHRA, if that doesn't seem to work out, we'll be back to you on how to. Okay. But let me make sure before I answer that, and there's no contracts. Is every dollar you got, is there a contract behind it? There's a, we're, except for security, we're a little underspending in the security contract, which is probably less than $100,000, but the big bulk of it is yes. I'm not anticipating having much more than $100,000 unspent in my allocation. Let's do this then. What we will do is identify that this is going to be funded with the CARES that you mentioned. Let's see what happens with SHRA, CDBG money. And if it turns out that's not a viable option, we'll be back to you see what to do with it. That, that's kind of where I'm going with the yeah. belt and suspenders approach here. So. Yeah. Okay. And then one more thing, just because it just popped into my brain, is I also, I'm not intimately familiar with all of the eligible uses for CDBG money, so we would also have to validate with SHRA that this, eval this is a eligible use. I suspect it is, but 
we need to make sure. No, we, we'll make sure on that. Okay, any other questions for him? Okay, hey, Brett. thank you. Brett. Uh, the next item on our list is the uh, homeless encampment issues that were raised, and uh, Mr. Wagstaff will be presenting on that issue. So this builds off of what Ann was just talking about. The uh, encampment strategy is a key part of our overall homeless plan for COVID. Um, we currently uh, working with Dr. Bielinson, we currently have our encampment strategy covered through the end of December, and that includes um, services for water, meals, private trash, and sanitation stations at the encampments that have been identified by Sacramento Steps Forward. You'll recall they did a survey of the county at the beginning when I first brought the homeless plan to you guys. Um, and to your question, Supervisor, from last night, if we were going to extend the effort for encampments throughout the rest of the fiscal year, estimates I'm getting are about $2 million for that purpose. Um, bear in mind that, as Ann was just saying, we are looking at the whole homeless effort here as the pandemic continues. When I first came to the board to present the homeless plan, we were actually thinking, this was in April, we were actually thinking the motels would be open until June, end of June. And as the pandem pandemic has extended, we, the team has worked very hard, collaboratively to figure out what we're going to do, and that's where we still are. So, what then, Bruce, would you tell uh, this board are some prospective options if there's interest in extending uh, the services you just mentioned past uh, the beginning of the year? I'm not sure I have a, a, a funding source identified for that supervisor. I mean, it would have to go into the mix of things we'd have to look at. Um, the whole discussion you just had with Ann might contribute to this as well. You know, I mean, as, as I said, we're really trying to figure out how we're going to keep this homeless effort going mm -hmm. as long as the pandemic lasts. And I don't think we have all the answers to that as we sit here today. Yeah, I mean, let me state the obvious of it, it you know, the, 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 the end of the calendar year deadline for um, the use of CARES Act funding for something like this um, it well, couldn't, co couldn't come at a worse time though right because this I mean you're, you're gonna have people that are middle winter un yeah un yeah unsheltered in the cold uh, you know the medical community is telling us that the effects of COVID are ex you know, expected sure. to be much more acute in uh, those types of conditions so I would offer this supervisor um, if, as Nav was saying, if we are assessing how we're expending things around end of October into November, we could continue, and if we had CARES money that we might bring back to the board for this purpose, mm -hmm. we could continue the effort with the encampments. I mean, we've got it ongoing, so it wouldn't take, uh, you wouldn't have any difficulty uh, continuing what we've been doing. Okay. All right, any questions, any other questions for Bruce? All right, thank you. Okay. I think as Britt's coming up, the last one we had was the probation body cameras. Okay. That's correct. So the last item was just to uh, uh, go over the proposal to um, uh, uh, utilize or uh, provide body cameras to probation. The proposal that um, has been put together in response to the uh, request of Supervisor Cerna would be 200 body-worn cameras, which would provide cameras for all of the armed uh, uh, probation officers, and uh, uh, that would involve uh, both um, uh, uh, equipment purchase costs, which would be about $439,784, and, and then the uh, staffing in the probation department to uh, manage and monitor that similar to the staffing that the sheriff would have for their cut for their cameras and that would be about five hundred and seventeen thousand six hundred and sixty two dollars so the total amount would be nine hundred and fifty seven thousand four hundred and forty six dollars uh, just as with the sheriff's department we would recommend that the if the board's decision is to uh, make a revision to the revo uh, revised recommended budget and add this uh, funding that they would add the 
equipment to the um, non-departmental cost budget, so that would increase that appropriation by $439,784, and then add the staff to the probation department, which would increase that appropriation by $517,662, and that we would recommend that if you do that, that you fund that by uh, canceling $957,446 in general reserves. That would bring the general reserve level down to 11,775,000. Thank you. Supervisor Natoli? Yeah, Britt, again, I, maybe a detail that we don't have an answer for today, but is there any uh, chance or opportunity that, you, you know, um, we're going to fund a similar expenditure for personnel to back it up in, in Sheriff's Department? We're doing that in, in probation. May have to be a similar effort for parks. I don't know. But is that you could have. Uh, some shared assignments, obviously there may be discrete things that go with department personnel, department missions, uh, what folks are called upon to do, but I'm just wondering if there's, you know, you know, and I assume the DA may have a role in some of this, um, that if that's the case, is there a way to maybe have, and I don't say centralized, but to get some economy of the scale of folks who may know how to handle certain uh, video material and then you know others you know departments may be responsible for their own you know obviously right uh, and I, I guess I'm just looking to this is new to us and so I don't necessarily expect to answer but I'm just wondering is that you know not that everybody has to replicate and certainly don't want to make it cumbersome or right. uh, inefficient or um, you know have any missteps but I'm just I, I, I'm now it piques my curiosity maybe like right. we do with some of our IT things that you have an ability to have some shared functions that uh, Retain the control authority uh, in the respective departments, uh, but also. So, that, so that's a good question. We asked that question ourselves okay. of both well, the sheriff's department and the probation department, um, and and the short answer is that, uh, they both indicated no that they felt that the uh, it was important that each department uh, have uh, certain positions and be responsible for managing their own um, their own uh, uh, body worn camera. Uh, uh, programs the sheriff is going to be doing the uh, doing all that for uh, the Rangers um, there's only 30 cameras involved it's a fairly small number and they are going to do that within there um, because it wouldn't be cost-effective for that small a number to for the uh, regional Parks Department to set up its own whole own system but um, they both felt very strongly that they needed to have their own uh, their own staff and their own um, uh, control of their own I think uh, surprisingly totally I mean that's uh, we've uh, debated this point back and forth since it's so new there's um, I don't folks actually know where the lines are going to end up becoming as this program rolls and we get into phase two there could be synergies that we could move stuff around and do some cost reduction but I think um, that's a pretty valid question we've debated it and we're going to continue to keep an eye on it and see if it's more central there's certain things absolutely respect what probation has, what sheriff has, what rangers have, but if there's something that could be done centrally, we will facilitate that. Again, I just, a thought occurs there might be some technical aspects to this that you know would be multifunctional that you know again would still have the fallback for respective departments. But okay, that's my question. Any other questions on probation body cameras? Okay, I'll just, uh, thank you, Britt. I'll just uh, add, I don't think I mentioned yesterday, but uh, in addition to um, consulting with uh, our chief of probation on the, um, the prospect of cameras for probation officers, uh, I also had a similar conversation with uh, Greg Stuber, president of the Probation Association, who also concurred that um, he thought this was a, a good, uh, bold move for Sacramento County probation and it agrees that there certainly can be developed uh, pro you know, processes and protocols to uh, make sure that uh, confidential information is, is uh, kept confidential and that um, you know, uh, POs are trained adequately to turn cameras on, on and off as appropriate. So, okay. Um, is that it then? That, that's the list. Okay. Um, so as you requested, you wanted uh, five, five to 10 minutes so that uh, your staff can kind of go back and double check the numbers. I'll just tell you, um, I have a total of so far of th about 3.3 million in restoration. Um, and then on top of that, 650 uh, in CARES Act. So you can double check those numbers. I know Supervisor Natoli, maybe others have been do you know, doing the same. 
Mm -hmm. um, one outstanding issue, and I, I'm going to look to Supervisor Frost on this, is we really didn't have any conclusive um, remarks, especially from supervisors representing the, um, the areas that have the outlined cities on COVID-19 uh, economic assistance. I was hoping that um, we could allocate some of the CARES Act money toward uh, economic recovery. And um, I know that there are, there are some um, challenges with the number that I asked, the 20 million. Uh, I'm, I guess, you know, it looks like we, based on the numbers that Britt gave us, we've invested around eight million into let's see eight or around eight million into economic recovery i think we could benefit by investing more into economic recovery and um, wanted to see if staff can find a way to help out our small businesses and find some money for our small businesses if I could offer on that one, as you know, the CARES Act the allocation is there, but I think the comments we heard today work with EMD and economic development. Supervisor Natoli mentioned is getting those economic development directors in, where the areas that they need, and look at more targeted approaches with those cities, what needs to be done, and then come back to the board saying, this is sort of the package we need to have. I think we need to work with them. And not just the cities, the unincorporated, I mean, is also included in that. Good. We could do that. Supervisor Tully? Yeah, just you posed the question, and, and I appreciated Supervisor Frost's point, uh, as well as uh, you have your response. So uh, recognizing that if we took the, the path that you had just uh, iterated, would we would it be wise to set aside maybe a, at least a, a number, target a number, a couple million dollars to, you know, again, to at least notate it so that before all that seven million gets spent down um that we at least ha yeah. have that i think what i'm taking out of that is that seven million until there's a contract behind it we're going to start pumping the brakes on it okay i'm sorry we're not going to we're not going to put contracts against it you're going to okay. you're going to keep it fluid Just but there's other fluid. there's other cares act money that's been allocated that we won't know until maybe october or november if we're able able to spend it soon enough and there might be some potential cares act money that frees up that no one can utilize that could be um like targeted toward economic well, recovery well, at million, that time we could yeah. set yeah. two million we could set some money aside now with what's available and then pending other uh, possible opportunities that come up have that in mind as a priority um I, you I know think I, without a number but yeah you know. without a number i think we we know there's seven million right now there's not a contract behind it so that's in there not just for economic but could be for other things as we're monitoring what's not going to be spent that could come back into the mix too but i think right now what we want to do is have the discussion what is it that these cities want? All these cities have pretty good fund balances, which we don't, and they're making a lot of, they have a lot more liberty in putting money out than we do. Our situation, as you know, is what we've presented to you, but if there's technical assistance, and if maybe, maybe non-monetary, but even if it's monetary, what would that look like? Have that conversation with them, um, see what, what is it that they're interested in. And then with the unincorporated, uh, have the discussions with uh, the different businesses that Troy and um, EMD, they keep an eye on it, see what kind of assistance they need and how can we help them with it. Well, I mean, are you talking about coming back tomorrow with this or? No, this could take some time. About? I mean, this is not something that I can do tomorrow. Well, what, what are you, I'm not sure I understand. I'm trying to fight for some kind of assistance for small businesses who aren't getting any any money any help at all what i'm trying to ascertain is what is this help that they need do they need help in paying their mortgage well Are my just my my suggestion was uh rent assistant rent or mortgage assistance or some kind of grant program that uh you know that could give them a leg up 
um, to give us a stimulated economy, to help them hang on longer or bring people back? Well, we need to determine with them what is it that they're looking at, what is the need that they have. And part of the equation that we got to go through is if we make this money available, and I'm going to absolute negative, if something happens that the money doesn't get used the way it was supposed to be used, there's a liability right back to the county. Right. I and think we should. it should go towards something that's going to also help the county recover. Yeah, but we are <coughs> down to about $10 million in fund balance that we have. If something goes wrong with the audit, that's the first call. Second one is beyond what we can provide, what other assistance have they gotten? Can we help them with that? There's monetary, non-monetary, but we need to have those discussions with these groups. And I think Supervisor Kennedy has suggested that after we got done with the budget, we're going to go with you into your district and talk to folks, what is it that you're looking for? And what, how can we match our programs up? And then come back to you and say, this is what can be done with it. Yep. And so you're suggesting doing that with all of us? Yep. Okay. I mean, you guys, I mean, that's, um, I get the city piece, but they did get CARES Act money. They do have fund balance. I'm not trying to do poor house, but that's, they have, they're in a very different financial situation that we're in. Our unincorporated is what we are in. With the cities, if there is something that they need, they need us to give loans to their small businesses. I want to hear what's the rationale for I was us. told they didn't. I thought they didn't get CARES Act money. Uh, most cities, I understand, got some portion directly this, allocated from the state. It wasn't us. And maybe not all of them got it. But I think some, the smaller cities under 500,000 population, I thought they did not receive CARES Act. There was another allocation made, and there's another portion of 300 and below 300. Let's just say it wasn't CARES Act money. But they do have fund balances. Everyone they got assistance from the state, is that what you're saying? They might have gotten assistance. I don't know the number behind it, but I do understand. I, I didn't watch it that closely. I've been watching our budget. But whether they did or not, the question with them is, what is it that you're looking for in the county to do in your jurisdiction? And okay. what's the rationale behind it? Just because we got CARES Act money, what's the justification for that to go to a business in city ABC and that's what we need to understand and then we need to understand the unincorporated what's happening there I think the rationale that that I heard was that some of the smaller cities that are under a certain population did not get the same support. so the conversation we've had with them and this has gotten a little, a little bit tense I think is when the money was coming to us and we can argue the point The cities had what they have, the condition they have. So if now the ask is for us to help their small businesses, we don't have enough money to help every business in Sacramento County. We just don't have that kind of money. The comparison with other counties, their budget situation is not what we just presented to you. Trust me, and if our situation was our budget was balanced and we had excess money, it will be a very different conversation. So we will have the conversation with them. We will figure out what is it that they want. But I do want to go into me and Troy, the team, individually with each supervisor and find out what are the issues in the district that you guys are hearing. What about the unincorporated? That's because, what I'm talking about. Yeah, because, I mean, they're not, they don't have a city to go to. Correct. So they're So it's two there's paths. No... There's a city component that I want Troy to talk to them. What is it asked? Yeah. The second path is to work individually with a team for us to go with you find out what are the issues that we're running into in the unincorporated and what, what kind of assistance can we give. Okay. That, I don't, I don't have a clear picture of what that is. Okay. Um, is it just writing a check to a business? Is that what we're doing? But if we're doing that, then how do we account for that? How do we account back to Treasury if, God forbid, if the money does not get used the right way? We only have $10 million as a backfall on our fund balance. That's what we got to go pay back to the feds. Again, I'm not saying that's going to happen. I'm just telling you what's in my mind that I want to work through this and then come back in a process with the board, say this is the options that you have and this is what you can do about it. Okay. Monetary and non-monetary. 
and comments have been made about Supervisor Mazzoli has mentioned this in the past, Supervisor Cerna has mentioned it, business licenses or EMD fees. There are other things that we can do rather than just write somebody a check and say, here you go on that. There, there could be right. other things in the financial situation we're in. So that's what I'm contemplating on that. Okay. Um, that sounds good. Uh, I, you know, I think if 30 or 40 percent of our businesses collapse, it's going to impact our future revenues. And so if there's a way we can support the small business community to help them hang on longer or come back, it, it would be to our advantage, to theirs and ours advantage. Understood. Thanks, Nav. How long do you think that'll take? It's going to take us a couple of weeks. I need to set this up. Okay. So, I really appreciate <clears throat> should you looking into it. I'm just throwing this out, but should we uh, have a report back, just an informational item, very brief, at a, f a forthcoming board meeting? Mm -hmm. I what I can do yeah. is dovetail that when Peter does his. Okay. We already have a COVID-19 update. I can put in there where we are, and then what when kind of progress we've made. And then when you figure that out, you, you just do a budget amendment? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, we'll come back to you and discuss about how we're going to move the money where things are, so we'll okay. get that. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Yes. I just want, wanted to finish up here. Um, there's, uh, I think, a, a bigger exclamation point to all this, though, and that is, and it's, you know, money we've devoted in recent weeks to, you know, helping us get out of this lockdown situation, recognizing the state rules. I mean, this multi-tiered system that, you know, is the latest uh, approach uh, at the state level, and that's you know, again, we can only do so much, um, and I think getting, because that's where part of, you know, when, if I reread these letters, uh, just as you were responding here now, you know, I think that's some of the underlying frustration, you know, some of this is, you know, um, certainly, um, I think, uh, you know, directed at, you know, what we might do for recovery, but I think we all benefit, again, to what the health department and others are doing is getting, some normalcy back, certainly protecting the public health and safety, but getting us, you know, moved out of these tiers. And again, we're, we're now we're locked in. Obviously, we're you know we're tied economically to the state, uh, but uh, you know, hanging on is relative to how long the lockdown and certain businesses are prohibited from reopening uh, in a fashion that would allow their businesses to you know to to start up again or to you know to to regenerate and. Um, I just, you know, if, if I read these letters, that's, that's part of the underlying. It's not, you know, necessarily directed us to supervisors or as the county staff, but um, you know, we've got other counties doing other things, uh, and you know, we've worked very hard. And I, you know, again, I'd say thank you to all the folks that have, um, you know, worked thus far. But that's that's part of what it is here: is that you know, doing everything we can to. When those metrics that we're having to, in, including numbers of cases uh, as well as hospitalizations and and the number of deaths, and to be able to move through those tiers so we can reopen Sacramento County in a way that comports with you know safe health practices. And I just, um, you know, if, if we're into this for months and months, I don't care how many millions of dollars to put aside to it. I, to your point, Ms. Frost, that you know if businesses fail, some of those are not going to come back, and and. It, it, We've just got to keep pushing, and again, I, that's why it's so important what we did a couple of weeks ago. Now, I, mean, I just again I want to emphasize no, absolutely. that. Yeah, I, yeah. Also, if I could, yeah. just uh, I'm just getting a note. Alton got fifty thousand of CARES Act money. Citrusites one one million eight. Folsom one million. Elk Grove two point two million one hundred seventy five thousand, and Galt has three hundred twenty thousand, and Rancho Cordova is at nine hundred sixty eight thousand. So part of our conversation with them is you guys got CARES Act money, you're using it. Our situation is different with your fund balance. What's the partnership? Is it non-monetary? We don't have the money, but let's have that conversation. And is the monetary more of a conversation for the unincorporated since they got money? Okay. And I will send this sheet so you guys have how much they've received and what they have gotten on it. Oh, well, all due respect, they're looking at our amount we got and the amount they got, and they're thinking, yeah. Wow, uh, but and I get that our budget is a lot bigger and our problems are way bigger, um, but maybe there's something we can do to help out. Correct, both monetary and non-monetary. Right. I mean, scale it absolutely. Yep. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, and again, if others have punched up, want to talk about this topic, I had a couple of other questions before we go to break. If I could. Yes. Um, 
No, no, no problem. I know Mr. Kennedy, I, if he wanted to speak to this, I certainly would yield, but um, I, had a, I wanted to ask. Mine's uh, going to take three seconds. Okay, go ahead. Can, as you're doing the consultation with the other jurisdictions, can you please include the Metro Chamber? Sure. Thank yeah, you. Good idea. And, um, <clears throat> a couple of things have come up in very quickly here. It was a little longer than three seconds, but um, the Fireworks Task Force, we've received some feedback. The Fireworks Task Force and our participation in that or lack thereof, and um, I think it's in, you know, we've gotten some correspondence, I imagine other members of the board, and we've spoken to it. I think that at a minimum, our participation uh, in that group and um, actively trying to address some of the issues that you know maybe bigger than obviously even our jurisdictional authorities. But um, yeah, but, you know, we participated two year, a year and a half ago at you know twenty five thousand plus some staff time, and then we you know worked with the industry, but we didn't have that commitment this past year. So I don't know how we get to that, but I you know I, I want to echo what some of my colleagues have said already. Yeah, I think surprising that's yeah. only on that what I've been thinking a lot. I mean, besides getting this budget, yeah. is I've been thinking about all the Fourth of July stuff leading up to it. <laughs> And what I would like to do, and this just preliminary thought I'm having is to work with SAC Metro, is what kind of task force are they gonna stand up again? And what kind of effort are they putting out? And then what is the monetary value that they need from us? Because that's what it boils down to, is that they need money to get this thing going. Yes. And then come to you in January, either say we have it or here's a budget mm -hmm. amendment for it. But I think that's the way I want to approach that. But we need to get that going in January to yes. get the 4th of July um, going. Because some of the other stuff they want us to ban illegal, we can do all that. But it really comes down to is what is the PSA is going out, mm -hmm. how are we getting the word out, who's doing what. And if that's where we got to make the investment, then let's look at that piece. Yeah, because it's a fairly nominal amount. But I, okay, so um, two final questions on budget. One is, uh, Mr. Hartwig has gotten off and had any questions, but he's going to get one. So transportation. Uh, one part of the question is, do we have a million dollars general fund in our transportation this year to help on roads? It's seven fifty, and then Brett. Seven fifty divided by five. Transportation. I'd have to go back and look. I'd have to. Go. I'd have to go back and look. Because we it, cut it down 750 last year from a million, but it's either a million or 750. Okay, so we do have still have a general fund to help us with road repairs. And uh, I have, understand, since we weren't able to do any paving in my district this year, uh, that we are going to make sure that next year we're going to catch up for what wasn't done last year, what wasn't done this year, and whatever might be contemplated for next year. Either That's correct, but I'm still holding out hope that there might okay. be some paving this year. You, you, if you get them out there tomorrow, I'll be out there <laughs> applauding them. Um, <laughs> you know going to help us? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. To be impressed. That's, that's right. I'm, I'm ready to go. I'll tell you what. I'll stay, I'm going to get out of the way and let them do their work, because I tell you, there's a lot of folks that, would, uh, that are waiting for that. Last and final question. Um, we have, I don't know if it's funded or not, and I was looking at water uh, resources budget, but we have, we've had an unfilled uh, slot or position for our Delta, you know, kind of expert, and uh, uh, you know, the, the, the state has not given up an idea of conveyance and tunnels, and again, Natasha staffs the county coalition, but we haven't had any dedicated staff we have good qualified folks and uh, we, we you know we funded that not out of general fund but out of other funds in the past so how are we doing there so it's unfunded and that's another one pending item not unfunded unfilled <laughs> okay now that we're done with the budget hopefully next couple minutes here that's our next is to pick that up and okay stand get, that up. Get, get somebody in there because again you know the state they're, they're moving you know uh, aggressively to try to you know build a project and uh, I think we need to be able to evaluate to weigh in with our other four county partners and, and certainly my colleague Mr. Kennedy but this whole board has been very supportive of our efforts to make sure that this county is well represented when it comes to the impacts of any proposal so I want to be sure we have staff persons to support us in that. Okay that's all I have. Thanks Mr. Chair. Thank you. Su uh, Supervisor Frost. I just wanted to know if you could also include the PBIDs in the economic recovery conversation because they have unique challenges at this time. Got it. And uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Ntoli, for bringing up the um, fireworks task force issue. Um, even though I have a small amount of unincorporated area in the south part of uh, District One, 
I did have a, um, an opportunity to have a lengthy conversation with Lee Miller, who's one of the individuals involved with the task force recently. And I know that there's still a lot of um, frustration and obviously uh, concern that uh, with each passing year that the illegal fireworks uh, impacts can continue to grow. So uh, I think staying focused on that within a budget context, outside of a budget context is something that is uh, very important. Okay. Mr. President, before we take the break, I just want to run through what we think Let's do it. Uh, there's interest on the board. Okay. One position for WIC. I have two positions for WIC. Two for position. Okay. <laughs> At 126, that was a prorated uh, amount. Okay. Two positions. Foster care for 300. Yep. Care plus is 203 total package. 169 is the net county cost. Yes. Yeah. I've got, one, got 170, so. 170. Senior safe house at 300. Yep. And uh, then probation body cameras at 957, 446. Mm -hmm. And the homeless, no, the Exodus program is coming out of the CARES Act money, not out of the, right. out of this site. That's so six, the ones that we're looking. At 650. Yeah, 650. So I'm not in including that in what is going to end up being right. the net county cost. Gotcha. So that's on the side. Okay, but, okay, are you finished? Um, I, I got believe one, so. One other big one. <laughs> what I miss? I got I got a million five for the mental health uh, mobile crisis redesign. Oh, I wasn't going to earmark it at this point. Okay, Did I, I not spend enough time talking about it? I, I can start over. D I'm sorry. Mr. Susan would like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I, I want to come back on the million five. I have the million. Come back. I want to come back on that. Okay. No, everything will go as forward. I have enough expenditure authority to keep that going, but I'm going to come back to you on the million five on how we're going to move that out into whatever budget needs to go into. Okay. All right. So we can include a direction in the motion then, so you've got enough. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, okay. All right. So shall we uh, break for 10 If you give us five minutes, five, five let minutes. us just true it up and then. All right. All right. We're in recess for five minutes. Okay, I'd like to call back to order this meeting of the Sacramento County Board of Supervisors for Thursday, September 10th, 2020. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll and reestablish a quorum? Yes, Supervisors Frost, Here. Kennedy, Here. Natoli, Here. Peters, Here. Cerna, Here. and you have a quorum. All right, thank you. So, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, we've gone through and added up all of the uh, increases in appropriations that uh, Mr. Gill just went through with you, and that would uh, result in a total increase in appropriations of $1,886,446.50. Uh, increase in net county cost of $1,853,446 before offsetting the um, use of the uh, asset forfeiture money. If we, once we bring in the asset forfeiture money, and this number is an approximation, so we need you to authorize us to adjust it when we determine the exact amount of the cost when you take out the uh, cameras for the, um, for uh, the regional parks. But roughly speaking, we would bring in $1,391,000 in asset forfeiture money. So the net increase in net county costs would be around $462,000. And we would recommend that we reduce the contingency, or re reduce the general fund reserves by that amount. Again, that's, get, as part of this motion, if it would give us the authority to adjust that for the actual number, but it will be in that rough area. Okay, good. And then just one last point, uh, mostly for the public's benefit. Can you just run down the list of what's included in that one more time? Okay. Yeah. All right. We have two positions in WIC, uh, foster care, 300000 Care Plus, uh, total 203000 net county cost of 170000 senior safe house, uh, funding for 300000 and probation, two body cameras at 957446 that's on the net county cost side. Okay. And on, um, on the asset forfeiture fund side, body cameras for the sheriff, 1.3, approximately 1.3 million. And also on, um, uh, I think that was it. Yeah. That's it. That was it. And then, Project any formal action though on use of the CARES Act funding for Exodus or not? What I would recommend is as we work through that, we come to you every two weeks. Okay. We'll bring you any adjustments we need to make on that. Can we make sure that someone from finance uh, uh, responds to the 
folks that brought that program to our attention so they understand where we are in the process of uh, considering the, the funding for it? We will, we will send a note to the rabbi. Okay. A, a quick question then around the um, uh, policy statement or direction on the, uh, uh, the mental health uh, teams. And so we incorporate that into a motion. Uh, you know, we have the standard resolutions, but so that that's clear that you'll be bringing that back as well. What so. I would suggest is if you just want to direct the county executive to work with the sheriff and all the other appropriate departments to stand up, um, what's the word we're using for it? Surprise, Ken, if you can help me, mobile crisis system, that's what you called it. Stand that up and come back to the board with how to operationalize and the financing behind it. T timeline behind that? You, you're going to say it's going to 45 days at this point? Okay. We'll give you a status report? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> and hopefully that status is we did it. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, um, mm -hmm. do you want to speak uh, lastly to the economic recovery part? Yeah, uh, we are going to be reaching out to each supervisor, find out what needs you have. Uh, we're going to have a reach out into the six out of the seven cities that had asked for money, see what kind of needs they have, and also reach out not only to the metro chamber but to all the ethnic chambers to see what kind of needs, what 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 do they need, and not only is it just recovery, but a system as ever changing. Um, uh, state guidelines, you will, and we have public health help with that too in that process. And PBITs. And PBITs, yes. Chambers. All right. Okay, uh, the members of the board are all clear on that. I know that we, we need to um, have Supervisor Peters start us off with motions because of the, some of the recusals. Um, so, before we do that, though, just so I, I'm clear on my, my record, I just want the record to show I am not supportive, I'm not voting for the expenditure of the uh, Tucker fees for the Bearcat uh, tactical vehicle for the Sheriff's Department. I just am philosophically opposed to outfitting our law enforcement with the military vehicles these days. And I'll be joining you in that. Okay, so Mr. Chair, Supervisor Kennedy, I will note that in the record. And if um, I know that we have to do a motion where we're going to exclude some things and come back. Um, you have three separate recommendations here, so I just recommend that after you do the balance in number one, then you do a separate motion for number two and a separate motion for three. Yeah, just guide us as we go. <laughs> I know it gets complicated. Okay. So we'll start with uh, Supervisor Peters. Okay, thank you. I'd like to move to adopt the budget minus the items that are identified in a slide that's about to appear on the screen. Okay, Chair will second. So that was a motion and a second. Unanimous vote. We need to vote on the excluded items. Okay, now we're going to vote on the excluded uh, excluded items, um, and of course, all of this is with the um, with the adjustments that have been outlined by the county CEO and our uh, right. CFO. Correct. So move. Moved by Supervisor Kennedy, seconded by Supervisor Frost. Please vote. And the motion carries with Supervisor Peters recusing due to potential conflict of interest. And then we'll also need uh, a separate motion for the recommendation number two, which is to direct the Department of Personnel Services to prepare an administrative salary resolution to reflect the positions approved in the fiscal year 2020-21 adopted budget, including any deletion of positions. So moved. Second. We do have uh, one member of the board has oh. wants to speak to this. Yeah, I'm okay on the motion, but I just want to be clear, you're going to go back and, and talk with the sheriff about the felony sexual assault investigator and Correct. how that might, because we're approving positions, deletions, and additions as part of this motion. So I want to be clear that in the event that you were able to figure that one out, you would come back to us with a separate Correct. resolution. Because that's embedded in this, this action right here. So, okay, thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Unanimous vote. And I'm sorry, can you tell me who made the second on that one? It was Supervisor Frost. Thank you. Okay. And then you need one more motion for recommendation number three, which is to direct the Department of Finance to prepare the fiscal year 2021, excuse me, 2020-21 budget resolutions for board consideration. So moved by the chair. Second. Second by Supervisor Peters. Please vote. 
Okay, unanimous vote. Okay. Surprise, sir, and if I can just make a quick comment. Sure. Um, budgets in our county are never an easy thing for us to do. <laughs> and particularly this year, it wasn't the easiest thing for us to do. And um, I wanted to thank all the county employees that helped because this was a seesaw forum. At one point, we were looking at cuts. Then they saw what was happening with the revenue, a lot of uncertainties in their life and um, they came through. They have presented a very good solid budget and I can't thank them enough for the sacrifice middle of this pandemic working on this. So I wanna thank them. I also wanna thank the supervisors because it's uh, for folks that are not used to our government, this might seem that we're going back and forth, but this is a process we recommend. You guys look at it, you make changes. So that's part of our process. I wanna thank you for working through with us on this and that uh, the support that you've shown us through the years with the, with the budget and um, the task that we have in front of us is fairly daunting. And uh, I want you to know that your team is ready, is gonna start tackling this because we're gonna try everything possible next June is to protect our programs and make sure that we can continue to provide the excellent service that we provide out there. Thank you, I think everyone on this board shares your gratitude for um, all your <coughs> staff and um, some of the, you know, understanding a, a lot of the um, sometimes frustration or pressure or, or concern uh, during the last several months. Um, it's never easy and it was, I was just remarking to Supervisor Natalia, this is probably as uh, lengthy a budget hearing we've had in a, in a number of years, uh, but I think for good reason. And that is because I believe strongly that this board is, and in regards of what criticism may be directed towards us from whomever, uh, I think we're very thoughtful about um, you know this this very important exercise that we go through uh, every year, and it uh, was not easy this year. I think everyone should be prepared that next June is likely to be even um, more more challenging, and um, we got to prepare for that. Uh, but I think uh, given the the fact that um, you kind of have uh, a, a, a real team approach to making sure that the priorities of all five of us and certainly all million and a half of us, more importantly, here in the county are understood. Uh, it doesn't go without notice. So I appreciate all the, the work on behalf of your team. And everybody go take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thanks, everybody. I'd like to yeah. offer applause for the staff. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Okay, uh, oh. Chair Cerna, we do have uh, off agenda comments. Oh, do you want to? Well, well okay. Um, I know Mr. Kennedy has a comment, but we'll t he'll take it after the comment, so. Okay. Please start with your comments. Uh, you have three minutes. Yes, hi, my name is Jolene, and I'm a resident of District 4 in Sacramento. I have been trying to make a public comment since yesterday at 5 p.m. I was told the public comments were rescheduled this morning, and then I was told that the public comments about the budget were closed last night. I called back to make a general comment and have been on hold for six hours total today. It is very clear to me that you do not want to hear from the public regarding this budget, as your constituents' demands do not align with your best interests. You are suppressing the voices of the public. I'm demanding that you listen to your constituents and oppose NAVGIL's proposed budget as it neglects human needs, reimagines community safety, and community resources. You must restore the $104 million that was taken from the CARES Act funding and allocated to the sheriff, give it back to housing, health services, and small businesses support that it was intended for. At least 33% of the general fund should go to human needs and health services. We are in the middle of a pandemic. The Sheriff's Department must absorb the entire $17.8 million in budget cuts, period. No cuts should come from health services, human assistance, fair housing services, parks or economic development and small business support. I am asking you to approve the people's budget proposal. The board's response to this public safety and public health crisis should be to prioritize support for health and human services that mitigate the effects of this pandemic. Do better, thank you. Thank you.
caller, please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Mm, my name is Mackenzie Wilson, um, and I am calling for multiple reasons. I'm calling because um, I'm going to tell you guys I've, I've been very disappointed watching the last two days. Um, one of the coolest things that I've heard so far is taking $1.5 million to give it to mental health response teams. But other than that, this has been probably one of the most disappointing things that I've watched, considering that we've tried having really meaningful and beautiful conversations with folks for over a year now. Um, last night, I watched a, a presentation that my nine-year-old could have done a better job of doing on what it looks like to defund law enforcement and what it looked like was a bunch of burning cop cars. Well, first of all, if we defunded law enforcement, I would hope that there was a lot less cop cars on the street. Because the truth is, all of those cars take away from the housing that we don't have. All of those officers and their militarized weaponry takes away from the mental health services that we don't have. Just one or just three officers payroll could pay for an entire year of mental health of MH first. I heard, I, I witnessed all five, and I actually expected two of you not to say anything because you guys are fascists as well, but there are three of you on the board that I really did expect to laugh out loud in the face of Sarah Scott Jones when he put such a disgusting display of what it means to defund law enforcement. What it means to defund law enforcement is not it's not burning cop cars. What it means is that we have a three a deficit in our budget because it used to be $4.4 billion, but now I'm looking at a $3 billion budget. And what it means is that when you look at where all the money is going and we have to talk about reinventing and we have to talk about reinvesting or we have to talk about building new programming, that we do have to take a look at where the money is already being spent. Guess what, Scott Jones? If we need mental health services, the money comes from your budget. If we need housing, the money comes from your budget. Not from SHRA, not from the Department of Human Assistance, not from the Department of Behavioral Health. It comes from the Sheriff's Department's budget. It means that, in, and what he told you yesterday is that instead of stopping, instead of, instead of buying riot gear and militarized vehicles and weaponry, that he would rather fire officers. All of those cities that were on his that were on his um, on his presentation were all cities where there was extreme violence from law enforcement against peaceful protesters that led to the ignition and the activation of riots. Can I get your concluding remarks, please? No, because I haven't had three minutes yet. Your overtime. Thank this you. This isn't okay. None of this Th is okay. Thank you. Hi. Please start with your comments. You have three minutes. Thank you. Um, hi. This is Liz Blum. I'm calling because I, I'm mainly about transparency and process um, that I've witnessed over the past uh, 24 hours and also um, especially this morning regarding item number two. Um, public comment was, the, the line was actually closed um, a few callers in and I don't know why that was. Um, and it's just really, um, really disheartening and really concerning to me um, whose, whose ever decision that was to close the public comment line um, prematurely on item number two this morning. Um, it's just really sad that we have to fight this hard just to be heard um, by the board. Um, I also just want to thank um, Supervisor Kennedy for um, listening and, and speaking up, um, even though you were the minority today. Um, listening that the only power that the board has over the sheriff is the budget. 
um, and, you know, a bit disappointed that others didn't support Kennedy's proposal to fund programs like MH First um, with, with $1.5 million from the Sheriff's Department. I just, I just wonder why you're listening and trusting a CFO to be an expert on how to meet at the consent decree. Um, this, you know, Nav and Brit, unfortunately, are not are not experts in this field, and we just need more community experts at the table um, for decisions around the jails and the consent decree that are going to impact our county's budget for for the next um, decades. Um, so please, you know, let's start a commission. Let's start a way to bring community voices to the table because Brit and Nav are not going to allow our voices to be heard. Please stop trusting them as much as you do. Please start bringing our voices in to the table. Thank you. Thank you. That, that concludes the comments. Great, thank you. Okay, Supervisor Kenny. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to make a suggestion uh, for going forward next year on budget as far as uh, the transparency issue and public participation. Um, a lot of jurisdictions have uh, budget workshops, and by a workshop, I don't mean us sitting up here and the public out there. I mean, you know, the public coming together with the facilitator and not just us sitting here listening to them, um, but genuinely getting together for a two-day process with a facilitator, a professional facilitator, uh, and also bring in our budget folks, our budget experts, and even someone from the outside. Because we all know, as well as anybody, how convoluted and complicated county budgets are. Other jurisdictions do this, but their budget is so much more straightforward than county budgets just by nature of what they are. So I'd like to see that we do a two-day um, uh, workshop facilitated uh, the first day to actually you know, help those that don't understand what our budget process looks like, not just the process, but w the complexities of it. I think it would help a lot of, you know, erase a lot of misconceptions that we frequently hear. And then the second day, an opportunity, uh, once they've had an opportunity to think about it in that lens, uh, for them to bring forward their priorities prior to the CEO developing his budget so that he can consider those priorities uh, and look at it through their eyes as well uh, before he puts together his proposed budget. Okay, thank you. Um, any other, um, or, uh, I assume the CEO is done with his comments. I'm done. Okay. Any other comments by board members? Uh, I just have one um, uh, comment here. Um, there's been a, a large amount of interest across the, across the country, in fact, uh, since, um, since about May, and really being very uh, uh, declaratory and clear in the articulation of the connection between uh, institutional and structural racism and public health. Uh, in fact, in my service as the um, chair of the NACO Health uh, uh, Steering Committee, uh, NACO itself, uh, National Association of Counties, uh, has adopted a resolution um, acknowledging uh, racism as a threat to public health. Uh, in the course of receiving some of the um, correspondence leading up to our budget deliberations in recent weeks, uh, we've been reminded that uh, this is something that uh, some of our local nonprofits, uh, doing all the great work they do, in the, uh, especially in the public health space, uh, are interested in the county um, uh, pursuing in terms of a resolution. So I just wanted to make it clear to uh, my colleagues and to staff in open session that I have reached out to Supervisor Kennedy and that he and I are going to be working on bringing back to the board here uh, in the next few weeks uh, a resolution uh, resolution for Sacramento County and for the board's consideration uh, declaring racism as a public health crisis. And there's certainly a lot of um, resolutions out there to borrow from. Um, and in fact, NACO has uh, got a kind of a running inventory of what other counties across uh, the country are doing in that regard and certainly a number of cities as well so i just wanted to make note of that um, so it's not just left hanging for especially for those 
organizations that have incorporated that into their uh, budget correspondence in recent weeks. Supervisor Tully. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just um, kind of reflecting on um, Supervisor Kennedy's idea, um, I think it's a good one. And again, I don't know if you know, regarding facilitation and all that, depending upon you know lockdown conditions and so forth. I guess something we do virtually, but but I do think uh, uh, yeah, you know could be you know a useful um, element in our budget consideration certainly as we go into the you know into the 21 22 a year or so I would you know be supportive of that thanks I, I too am supportive and I just remind the board too that um, it's not unheard of we used to have budget workshops as I recall especially a lot of workshops right before I uh, landed here in 2010 around uh, the recession because there was a lot of so much scrutiny and rightfully so on uh, unfortunately back then on necessary cuts but uh, I think having um, an opportunity for the public as uh, supervisor kennedy has mentioned to understand better than they do the complexities of uh, what we do each year is uh, a good idea and maybe would uh, help to um, bring us together in terms of a common understanding of what's in play uh, each uh, june and each september so okay if there's no further business before the board we are adjourned